Facebook CEO and founder Mark Zuckerberg is about to testify for the first time ever before Congress. You're looking at a live shot of the hearing room where Zuckerberg will soon be grilled by more than 40 senators about privacy, security and political interference. Welcome to live coverage from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey and I'm joined by Jeffrey Fowler, technology columnist here from the West Coast to join us today. Thank you so much. Also, Karen Demergen, who covers national security on Capitol Hill. Glad to have you with us as well. We expect Mark Zuckerberg to get in the hot seat uh, within the half hour. And more than 40 senators, two committees, will be asking him questions today. Uh, but Jeffrey Fowler, you've covered Facebook for nearly a decade now. How much are you watching this hearing? I have been waiting for this moment for so long. In fact, I actually brought popcorn today um, to, to watch it, as I think many people in Silicon Valley also have their popcorn ready to go. Um, this moment has been coming for a long time. Okay, so we'll get to that perspective in a little bit. First, I want to head to Capitol Hill, where our colleague Jordan Frazier is standing by, watching how this day unfolds. Jordan, how much anticipation is building for today's hearing? Yeah, hey Libby. Uh, Jeffrey talked about the, the anticipation on the West Coast. I can tell you there is equal anticipation here on Capitol Hill. This is one of the most high profile hearings that we've had in months here. So let me kind of set the scene of where we are. We are in the back hallway here. Uh, the hearing room is just to my left and this is kind of where the media is camped out as we expect senators to kind of start walking by to file in and take their seats. On the opposite side of the hearing room here, there are long lines of the public hoping to get in and to hear what Mark Zuckerberg has to say. The line snakes down the hall, down the stairs and all the way down to the first floor. So there's a lot of interest there. Also outside this building, closer to the Capitol, there are groups of demonstrators who have set up over 100 cardboard cutouts of Mark Zuckerberg in sort of a visual protest. I think you're seeing footage of it now. It's their, it's their visual protest to demand answers from Facebook on privacy and transparency and speaking out against news that is of questionable origin. Now, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg will face nearly half the Senate when he takes his seat here in this hearing room. And I caught up with a couple of those senators who will be asking him questions. I talked to them earlier today, including Senator Graham of uh, South Carolina. And he kind of joked with reporters that he'll have, quote, very interesting questions to ask, ask Zuckerberg, but didn't give us any more than that. He promised it will be the most interesting question of the day. So we'll be watching for that. I also talked to Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana, who fl flatly questions whether or not Facebook has the answers that Congress is demanding. Um, so he'll be an interesting one to follow up with after this hearing to see if, if, his an if he got you know, sufficient answers to the problems of privacy and, and political advertising that's such a concern for senators up here. So Libby, we will be watching for senators to start filing in and taking their seats, hopefully try to snag them and ask them some questions. Uh, but for now, we'll send it back to you. All right, fantastic. Jordan Frazier on Capitol Hill. Karen, why these two committees? It's the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee. Why do they get the bite of this apple? And who's on this committee that we should be watching? Well, this is a reminder that this is not just about the Russia probes, right? Because we've been talking about Facebook and Twitter and, and various social media companies in the context of that for a long time. But these are about issues of privacy. These are about issues of sharing information. These are about issues that Congress has been grappling for a very long time, um, both because of the concerns of the population about what's happening to all of my data, and also just because, you know, this has been a national security issue of where can the government reach in and look at this stuff and how private are you when you set your settings to actual privacy, right? And this actually affects, you know, the public commercial space. It affects, you know, judicial issues of that, of that as well. So you have these two committees weighing in in this way, and it's going to be a much broader grilling um, as, as a result of that. Um, it's also interesting, I, it's interesting to know who's going to be in the room, it's interesting to know who's not going to be in the room, because this is not involving the intel committees. Tech experts like Mark Warner who want to have their personal moment to actually grill Mark Zuckerberg about Facebook issues that have to do with info sharing, with, with, with the sales of ads that maybe get into the realm of what Russian influence campaigns were, are not going to have their moment right here. And so this is probably not the last chapter for what Zuckerberg is going to have to do on the Hill in order to satisfy everybody who's on the Hill who has questions for him. So but it's an opening we'll round. Him, it's an opening yeah. round. That's a great way to put it. And tomorrow we'll see him going before a House committee that it's also kind of sprawling and large. So yeah. a lot of House members will get a chance to talk to him there. We've already seen the opening statement that Mark Zuckerberg plans to make for tomorrow's hearing. We can assume that it's uh, the same thing, basically, that he's going to say to senators today. Jeffrey, take us back and break down why this is so significant. Like, not just why the popcorn, why is Silicon Valley watching this so closely with perhaps a little bit of curiosity, schadenfreude, you know, um, concern. Uh, 
but why is this a big deal? Uh, well, let's start with the fact that uh, although Zuckerberg is on the hot seat today, this isn't just about Facebook, right? Okay. This is about an entire industry that has sprouted up with very little regulation over the years that is collecting our data and making billions off of it. And does that industry need regulation? Should it have rules that say that they are, you know, that, that govern how long they hold on to our data or what they can do with it or what kinds of powers we have over it? So um, that's why it's not just Facebook that's watching. It's Google, it's Twitter, it's Amazon, it's even Apple uh, because they all uh, interface with this, with this industry in one way or another. What I would love to see today is some conversation from uh, members of Congress about sort of the fundamentals of the surveillance advertising economy, which is the way that uh, Facebook and Google and a lot of these companies make money. I'm not super hopeful, though, that we're actually going to get that. I think more what we're going to get is they're looking for blood. Mm. They want to see uh, they want to see Mark Zuckerberg pay for a range of failings that we've seen over the last two years. Yes and no. I mean, you had people like Senator Kennedy come out and say, I don't want you to just have him sit there and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We know you're responsible. We know that it's your company and everything else like that. So, I mean, I, I think that they are looking for some sort of the fresh ideas about actually how to proceed with the legislative approach, because the thing is that this has been an argument that's been going on for years. It used to be government versus these social media companies because it was a question of, you know, oh, we're trying to do our due diligence and looking. Now it's a broader question about what's happening with the public when the government isn't even involved. It's foreign countries. It's other, you know, corporate entities that are actually taking this data. That makes it that much harder to have that sort of discussion about what you do legislatively going forward and where the federal government can intervene. And I mean, they, 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 there's a feeling that they need to do something, but the what is is really elusive at this point. We'll talk about options on the table in just a moment. I want to remind you that we're watching this live hearing room where we will see members of the Senate convene shortly to talk to Mark Zuckerberg to ask him questions. He's the only witness. You see that table he's going to be sitting at all alone. Table. It is a small <laughs> table. It has got to be some lonely real estate to occupy. Carlin, just take us to the timeline. The hearing was set for 2.15 Eastern time, but there is a vote. Uh, in the Senate, so they'll right. sh start shortly after that. Right, welcome to Washington. I mean, right. this, is yeah. the, this is the ebb and flow of the congressional schedule, which is that when they call a vote and they have these policy lunches every Tuesday, so 2.15 is a very popular time to call a vote because you've got everybody in one place. So that's what's happening right now, which means that Mark Zuckerberg is going to have to wait, which is probably not something he's used to. So we'll see if that actually you know, affects how he's feeling when he's on the hot seat. Um, I'm sure that, that Chuck Grassley and Diane Feinstein will make an entrance fairly soon after 2.15, and probably you'll just see others trickle in as things go on. But, you know, um, this is the senator's turf. They're going to do this like they normally do, even though this is a much more high-profile affair. And, and Jordan, there's been a bit of frustration because there was a hearing in the fall where we expected to see perhaps the CEOs of not just Facebook, but also Google and Twitter show up, and instead they sent their lawyers. And you really got a sense from members right. of Congress that they were frustrated by that, that they wanted to see the, the big people in the chairs before them. Uh, so do you feel like that heat or that memory is going to be brought into the room today? Absolutely. That will be a very fresh memory, Libby. After that fall hearing, there was a lot of frustration that the that the, the faces of these companies didn't come before uh, the, in these hearings. You know, these are United States senators. They they are used to seeing the principals come before them. Uh, CEOs of a, a wide range of different companies have done that. I'll tell you, we've seen Jeff Flake just make his way into the the holding room here before, behind the behind the dais, um, the first kind of senator to make his way. And we know Jeff Flake. One of the issues most important to him is sort of the divisiveness of our politics. So I would expect him to kind of maybe focus his questioning on that. Uh, you were also talking about the way that this is a different sort of economy, right? It's monetizing information and monetizing data. Uh, that is of particular consume, uh, concern, rather, to Senator Blumenthal. So I, I would expect his questioning to really focus on that. Uh, your guys' conversation, you were also talking about who's in the room. And we are on Capitol Hill, so let's not forget about politics, right? There are several rumored tw 2020 presidential contenders who will be asking Mark Zuckerberg questions in this hearing. And that will have a, a uh, an overarching kind of effect of how they interact with the CEO. Libby? That's a great point, Jordan. Jeffrey, do we expect real answers today? I mean, do you expect to go away from this hearing saying, oh, I, I think I've learned something now? Not really. Uh, I mean, most of the information that we need about uh, the, the specific incidents that have taken place, we, we mostly already have that. So I think what we need now is pressure to bring about some kind of change. I think the other thing that we're looking for today, though, is almost a performance. Uh, 
Mark Zuckerberg is so tightly associated with Facebook, the product. And we all have an image of him largely formed by that movie, The Social Network. Um, and then maybe some of his early appearances where he was the boy genius, you know, who sweated a lot and, you know, really couldn't handle the, the public attention, really didn't know how to, you know, make eye contact and whatnot. Since then, uh, in Silicon Valley, we know that actually Zuckerberg has grown up quite a lot. And now, actually, instead of the boy wonder that he's seen as out here, Silicon Valley sees him as, as kind of a ruthless um, CEO who's out there and you know conquers any would-be competitor. So we're going to see a new Mark Zuckerberg in public today. And that's what's so fascinating. What will he present to the world? What will he present to all of us who are kind of at a moment where we're re with this product? You know, look, we've it's been a part of our lives now for almost 15 years, now we're kind of waking up to the reality of what has it actually cost us. It's free, but what have we been giving up? What are the downsides? What are the, what's the dark side of this technology? So I think as important as what these senators get, get out of Mark Zuckerberg today, it's what everybody at home who's watching and, and reconsidering how do they feel about this product. I think that's going to have a lasting impact on this company. We'll bring you that in, in really just a short amount of time. And you can watch our coverage of this whole hearing without interruptions on our website at WashingtonPost.com. We'll also be on YouTube. You can catch us there. And we'd like to welcome our audience on Twitch joining us for the first time today. So you can also catch us at Twitch. You know, Jeffrey, I, I would love to know if you were a senator, if I vote for Jeffrey Fowler. Thank you. Member Appreciate of the Senate representing California. What would you be asking Mark Zuckerberg today? Here's my question. I really want this to focus on how Facebook the product should change to better align Mark Zuckerberg's interests with our interests as, as the people of the world, the 2.2 binity as he calls it. So here's what I would do. I would say, Mark, get out your phone right now in front of everybody and read out to us the privacy settings that you use on your Facebook and your Instagram accounts. Okay. Why aren't those settings the default for everybody on Earth? Yeah. Because we've had this game, and it's not just Facebook, it's also Google, it's all these companies. We've had this game for years where they are, they say, oh, well, you guys agreed to some terms of service, which we all know we spend about three milliseconds reading before we click OK on. Yeah. You agreed to it. Oh, and we gave you tools. This is, we saw this in Mark's prepared testimony. We give you uh, tools for privacy. We can adjust your settings. It's clear that's not working. Those aren't protecting us. We need a new way to think about how these companies protect us and our interests because clearly what, what we have now doesn't work. Current, there are different agendas members of the Senate are going to bring to this hearing. I mean, there's the privacy concern. There's right. the security concern. There's yes. also interference in the 2016 election. Uh, so do you think one theme will emerge, or do you expect it to be divided in terms of political party? Democrats go after one angle, Republicans another? I would assume that you'll hear more Democrats focus on the questions of the, uh, the, of the influence campaigns, but I think that it's exclusively in the sense of, you know, uh, you may see a few Democrats trying to um, tap on this idea of are there collusion indicators or anything else like that, especially on the Cambridge Analytica front, because that is a really big piece of this because you have Democrats really, really committed to digging into that more. But generally speaking, the idea that Facebook was a platform that was used to potentially nefarious ends by a foreign adversary actor is something that cuts across party lines and is something that you know concerns people on both sides. But you have established members of the Senate that really do care about privacy issues, that really do care about um, uh, about the, the, the data mining and, and, and have for a very long time. And they're going to bring up those things. So everybody gets, what, four minutes, I think, today, which is not a lot of time to ask a lot of questions. So you kind of kind of pick your theme. And the ones that will pick, I would assume that you'll see um, the Blumenthal's of this world and things like that probably cleave a little bit further over towards the Russia focused stuff. Again, remember also one of the committees that's on the dais today is probing those questions and the other one is not. Senate Judiciary is looking into various Russia related things so they have a lot more in their arsenal that they may feel, you know, needs this moment um, to, 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 to have a public airing at least with Zuckerberg because everybody's watching and that's the other thing. Remember they know everybody's watching so if anybody has a hometown industry or a hometown issue that they think is going to play well there'll be a little bit of, you know, showboating there. And we'll see that a lot tomorrow, yeah. especially on the yeah. House side, because House members tend to be very parochial in what they bring to right. their concerns, unless, of course, they have bigger political ambitions and they're looking at uh, what might be next in store for them. You know, I want to hear from you, Jordan, what was learned yesterday, because we did see Mark Zuckerberg walking the halls with so many TV cameras following him. Oh, and I just want to mention there, you can see Code Pink uh, doing a bit of an action there inside the hearing room. Um, they go to a lot of hearings, they make statements about a lot of issues, and now they're bringing up this question of corporate over
Jordan, that being said, what did we learn yesterday from the sit downs that Mark Zuckerberg had? Yeah, and Libby, I think one of the things we learned yesterday, one of the things we learned in the last couple of weeks, and one of the themes that emerged last fall when representatives of these companies came before committees here was this concern over the political advertising, right? And we heard yesterday in one of the prepared testimonies that we were able to read from Zuckerberg was that he has a line in the testimony that says, we're not going to wait for legislative action to start being more transparent on our political ads. I think that's an important point where Facebook is trying to get ahead sort of congressional inreach into their company. And we saw that at the end of last fall, too. Senators like Amy Klobuchar really came out pushing her an, an Honest Ads Act that was trying to put more transparency into political advertising, because that's something Congress knows about, right? Political advertising in traditional legacy media, whether it be TV or print, falls under regulation. That is regulated. And that's something Congress is familiar with. A lot of this other stuff about privacy and how much data they have and who can use it and who can access it, that's new. And there's a learning curve for Congress uh, when it comes to that stuff. So I think if I'm looking for action, I think it will come both from Facebook and Congress on, on this transparency and advertising, because that's sort of a comfortable comfortable topic. Uh, but we'll see what happens, of course. More senators are really filing in here. They're passing us by uh, as the room gets uh, more full and we're getting closer to the hearing. So Libby, I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Jordan. You know, I want to hear from Jeffrey and Karin about actual legislation. So the Honest Ads Act tackles advertisements, as Jordan so well explained. But that's very very different than me sharing my location, my family, my personal pictures on Facebook. Uh, sharing and privacy and security are a whole different area and than advertisements. Third, and there's a third one. <clears throat> there's also uh, data loss. Like Remember, because this wasn't exactly a hack, but is Facebook responsible for allowing this third party to take our data without our permission? Well, it's let's talk about so Cambridge Analytica. That was an <clears throat> issue, but there's, they've also admitted that all the information on Facebook, of perhaps of most of the billions of users, was scraped. It was essentially mined and, yep. and accessed. And, and, and linked to our phone number. So the way that that worked is, so yes, we all have a public profile on Facebook, which is at least our name and our photo, but uh, Facebook used to have a feature where you could type in someone's phone number and it would pull up that person's name. They said, oh, this is just a way to help you connect with friends. You don't know their, maybe how to spell their name. Uh, but it turned out that companies or organizations, <laughs> uh, turns out that organizations were using that to essentially make a, <clears throat> a, a list of phone numbers that are associated with names. So that's also happened. This is just a bucket of sorrows for Facebook. I mean, so many problems have come out, so many different areas that could be regulated in one way or another. The, the part of the problem, though, is that, I mean, it's it's not clear how much they can actually regulate without reaching in too far because you don't want to completely upset the platform of social media. You want to, don't want to have to actually have every single little thing, uh, you know, be, be be regulated by the government because it, it, it puts a damper on the whole innovation and the whole social aspect of it, right? So there's an element of all of this discussion which is just about, you know, the, the public education of it too, the get smarter about how you operate online, about mm. what you put out there. And I think that that's in many ways for a lot of these members a fallback position where at least they'll be able to get that message out there. But yeah, Honest Ads is one thing that you're seeing a lot of, um, I mean, Twitter just endorsed it, right, today? So Facebook has already endorsed it. Right. Twitter has now endorsed it and as the well. And the fact that Twitter endorses it the morning that Mark Zuckerberg is coming to Congress is not an, it's not a coincidence. I mean, it means that what happens with Zuckerberg today is going to be listened to, felt by every other major media company, online company, that is concerned about themselves being in the hot seat next. And so, does that mean that you'll have probably, you know, a, a closing of ranks around things like honest ads? Sure. Does that mean that you'll have the next thing that actually hasn't been written down legislatively miraculously happen? That's a much more difficult. But does Facebook get a free pass if it supports the Honest Ads Act without no. dealing with these other issues of security and privacy and, and how they're going to protect our personal information? Well, one thing, big thing that's on the table is the FTC. So um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, Facebook got caught. Uh, with, with some of these problems, and the FTC um, got into a uh, consent decree with them, which allowed them to fine Facebook for um, what turns out to be a very large amount of money, if they want to, for violating our privacy, essentially. And some past members of the FTC have suggested that that fine could go well above a billion dollars, which would be pretty extraordinary, though um, actually just a drop in the bucket for Facebook. Facebook. Facebook user or whatever. Yeah, you know. it's not, <laughs> not a ton of money per Facebook user. But still, um, still, it would send a message. But 
Here's what I what I think about that. It's like, well, why are we just doing that now? Why why, why wasn't there a financial penalty back when the FTC first um, made that consent decree? Maybe that would have changed Facebook's behavior for the last couple of years as well, and we wouldn't be in this situation. So I think those are the kinds of questions I'm hoping Congress will ask. Yeah. And Jordan, you know, we do see a breakdown by party when it comes to regulation. So Democrats are often in favor of more regulation. Republicans are often in favor of less. That's very simplified. But but do you expect to hear that? A difference come out in the hearing today in terms of next steps for protecting privacy and, and really putting the clamps on Facebook? You know, Libby, your question cut out a little bit there, so I missed part of that. But what I will say is one of the things that I find most interesting in talking to these senators uh, is uh, Chris Coons in particular has been really vocal about this in that this is just the first of many hearings, right? This issue is not leaving Capitol Hill after today. This isn't a one and done. I wouldn't, I don't even consider this a one and done for Mark Zuckerberg, right? I would, con you know, Facebook will probably be up here for months and months and years to come, right? But what I'm watching for is after today, how loud do the calls for Twitter? for Google, for other tech firms that collect data, how how loud will those calls get to bring them up here to the Hill? And that'll be an important thing for us to watch. Uh, you see more people kind of filing behind us here as we get closer to, uh, but back to you for now, Libby. Yeah, you know, we were also seeing just the huge media interest there. That overhead shot was a lot of reporters, journalists covering the story. Obviously, both coasts are interested, but everyone in America is interested in this because more than two million people use Facebook. So Jeffrey, you don't expect to learn something new from today's hearing, but do you think Americans will learn something new? Will, will this be a wake up moment for the rest of us who haven't been covering this like you have for 10 years, haven't been digging into this and asking questions about what we're sharing and who we're sharing it with? I hope it will be. <clears throat> Uh, I think there, uh, there's a trade-off for this digital economy. Yes, we get a, some, some fantastic services. We get uh, Facebook to connect with lots of friends and family and you know, keep up with people we wouldn't normally get the chance to see. We get Google Maps. We get Google Search. We get all these things. But there has been a cost to it all along. And I think that there hasn't been nearly enough of a public conversation about what that is. Um, the way we put it in a, in a column I, I wrote in the Post uh, last week was, if you divided Facebook's North American profit by every North American who's a member, we're each worth $82 to Facebook per year mm. here in the United States and Canada. Um, is it worth that much to us? Mm. Um, would, uh, would we be willing to pay $82 or should Facebook be paying us for our data? You know, uh, maybe maybe we just need a new way to think about this. So, so that's what I'm hoping will come away from this wh wh is a is is a new sense of of taking ownership of uh, uh, of your relationship with these companies and these services. And if I have one message, it was don't do defaults. <laughs> Clearly, we have learned. We cannot trust these companies. So what you mean by that is don't use your default settings. Actually go in and figure out what your privacy settings are, what you're sharing, what you're allowing Facebook and other companies to, to, to look at and do something with. That's right, because they don't really have your best interests at heart. As many times as we're going to hear Mark Zuckerberg today talk about the community of Facebook. A word he loves to use. A word he yep. loves to use these days. Um, a community of which I guess he's the the self-appointed ruler and decision maker without any any you know a, any chance for us to to give him uh, feedback or check him well let's talk about his power so he is the founder of Facebook. He is. He is the CEO of Facebook. He is the chairman of the board. He is the voting authority on the board. Mm -hmm. So this 33-year-old who's worth at one check recently $60 billion, although that may depend on how Facebook stock is doing and investments are doing, uh, ha has a lot of power. He does. And there was this kind of fantasy that kind of happened in a call that he did with a bunch of journalists last week where some people started saying, so Zuck, are you going to step down? Should, are you still the person uh, who should be leading Facebook right now? Sheryl Sandberg, the COO, also got asked that question. And he was like, clearly kind of, it was over the phone, but he was clearly taken, taken aback by the question. Like, how could anybody imagine Facebook without him? So I don't think he's going anywhere, but uh, it's still, we're at a moment where we're even asking that question. You know, one thing I'm actually really curious to see today is how many senators are kind of taken with his generally innocent look and youth. I mean, Dianne Feinstein yesterday was saying, personally speaking, he's a very nice young man. He's so young. I didn't. He has a whole huge company and 27,000 employees, but he's so young, and and they are. He doesn't look like this typical person that comes before Congress to testify about an enormous issue. And, that, of course, that's why he's been such a phenomenon. But I just want to mention that we are seeing members of the Senate come yes, in. Yes, We've are. got uh, Amy Klobuchar. Jordan, are you with Amy Klobuchar now? We've got that footage right now of her. Let's listen. The 
support people's information. They built a product with no locks and no alarms, and big surprise, the bad guys got inside, including the Russians. So they have to show to me what are the new rules they're putting in place. I am very pleased that they said they're going to support the Honest Ads Act, and in fact, they are voluntarily in June putting an archive up so everyone can see the paid political ads and requiring disclaimers. Twitter just came on board today. That is a major step because this election is only a couple hundred days away, and we cannot have a repeat of 2016. Can I ask one follow-up? You are live on Bloomberg. Should Americans feel safe, Senator, that we are protected in our political institutions institutions are protected in the midterm elections, and is Mark Zuckerberg fit to lead Facebook? Um, I'm not going to get into who leads, and that, that is a, that's a decision of their company, and I think a lot's going to ride here on how he does today and what he says. Um, as for the infrastructure, we just passed $385 million, something Senator Graham and Senator um, Langford and I worked on for election infrastructure. Starting in May, that money is going directly out to the states. We can get the backup paper ballots, and they can upgrade their equipment. That is key. And the second is having a fair system for ads so everyone knows what's out there, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. So, Libby, as you heard there, we were just, uh, we got AB, Amy, Senator Amy Klobuchar. She was headed into the hearing room. Uh, you saw some other senators file in behind us. And as we were mentioning, we were talking about the Honest Ads Act, right? Amy Klobuchar has been one of the major proponents of that ad, or of that act, rather. And she seemed pretty happy with what Facebook is kind of going in the direction to support her legislation. The other thing that we heard her say kind of before we, we got to her was she was questioning the consistency of Facebook and kind of how there was this trickle of info, uh, this trickle of information that came out over a series of months of what information had leaked, how much privacy had maybe gone around. Um, and so we expect her to really hit Mark Zuckerberg with that. Libby, I'm going to send it back to you. We're going to head back over and see if we can snag any other senators. All right, fantastic, Jordan. It's so interesting. She's also, of course, talking about the upcoming election, Karin, so not just reflecting on 2016, right, but looking right. at what's coming up next. Exactly, and they are taking. They did approve the money that she was talking about. It, some people say it's not enough to actually really safeguard everything, and of course, um, you, I part do, of this... Yo, go ahead. Well, I was, they're pretty much filtering in now, too. So, yeah. But part of even what she was saying right there in the Honest Ads Act endorsement is, again, getting back to this idea of the get smarter approach. I mean, yes, there will be indicators on those advertisements about where it comes from. You still have to read them and you have to choose not to believe what you see. A lot of this is going to end up falling back in the laps of the pop public population. And that goes to what Jeff was saying a minute ago, which is that, you know, we got to get a little bit more adept at knowing what's going on. You here. know, something that's so interesting is Amy Klobuchar was like, I'm not going to weigh in on who leads this company. But she, there was a little bit of like, a, let's wait and see how this goes today, Jeffrey. Yeah, I think and, uh, the view you were saying earlier that, that that Washington has of Zuckerberg, oh, he's so young, that is literally making Silicon Valley laugh right now. Like, well, I think course, I've heard people. But, yeah. you, you actually know, heard it. I actually <laughs> heard people across the country um, <laughs> laughing at that at that idea. But we do talk about the age of the senators and how many of them are there's actually a bunch on social of media. Yeah, on this and panel. how many so, of them are yeah. actually on Facebook? Now, some of them are on social media, uh, but this is a different set than the Silicon Valley set, Jeffrey. It, it definitely is. <laughs> you know, the, the other thing that you brought up with this Honest Ads Act, okay, so let's label all the ads, but. Where's, who's going to do the investigation to find out if ads, you know, maybe some of these interest ads are being paid you know, by people who are hiding who they are? This kind it of. Clear everything yeah, th this doesn't clear everything up. This doesn't stop it from happening. The problem is we still have a system that, uh, <clears throat> that profits from uh, these hyper targeted ads. So that's always going to be uh, a lure out there for anybody who wants to manipulate the masses. That's what it is. But this is the thing is that they have to go baby step, baby step because it's been such an inimical relationship for so long to even get the tech companies to actually play ball on this and now they're saying oh we can pounce on this this one's safe this one's okay you know and so this one's moving but obviously it's not enough and of course the senators that endorsed it that wrote it want that you know to, 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 to talk about this as a very big deal that they believe it is and even though it's not quite enough to actually, you know, solve the problem that you have in front of you. We see a lot of senators already gathered, including yeah. some of the sort of most senior and top members of these two committees. It's the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee, and it's more than 40 members, and they'll each get about four or five minutes to ask questions of Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, you know, Jeffrey, how historic is this moment? I mean, there's obviously a lot of media attention, a lot of national attention, two committees together for this hearing. Yeah, it's rare that we see a CEO as famous as Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg in that hot seat. Um, and he's it, put it off for so long. Right, right. Um, we have a piece in the in the Post uh, today where we sort of talk about 
14 years of Mark Zuckerberg apologies and the times he's been in the hot seat and, and, and how he's always sort of uses these same kind of lines over and over again. Oh, I was naive. So sorry about that. I moved, I moved fast and broke things, but here, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it in the future. So very interested right, to see, see that. Mark Zuckerberg coming there in the hearing room now. Blue tie. And he's been prepping for this, Jeffrey. I mean, he's been getting training and, and figuring out how he's going to deal with this moment. Yes. I'm trying to figure out who that is behind him. They have matching ties on, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> Yesterday, he was on Capitol Hill with a representative of Facebook who deals with Congress, specifically Democrats. We also saw him with another aide. Um, yeah, he's had it some time to actually walk around the hill and get used to the setting. So we're seeing him shake the hand of one of the senators, of Ron Johnson. Look for him to be acting, or try to be acting like a human. I mean, that's, uh, I, so sorry if that comes across as rude, but this is what the world thinks of him. We saw on Saturday Night Live this weekend. They, right. you know, sort of portrayed him as a Zuck robot. So, you know, does he blink? Um, does he seem to have human reactions to things? This itself right now is one of the most nerve-wracking moments. I mean, look at the ratio of one witness to dozens and dozens of cameras. And the, it's the, the, the sound of the, the shutters is deafening. So Totally, this but this the, man the, has been on the cover of Time. Oh, I know. He's, uh, he's had the audience of kings and rulers around the world and presidents. There was even speculation at one point over the past year that he might make his own political bid at some point because he was doing a bit of, a, a bit of an American tour. Yep, that was the word going around. I think uh, we're hearing the gaveling in of this, these two committees. You can watch this coverage throughout the day on WashingtonPost.com, on YouTube, and also on Twitch. We'll bring it to you live and uninterrupted. Thanks so much, Jeffrey Fowler, Karen Demergen, and also Jordan Frazier. I'm Libby Casey. We'll take you now live to this hearing of Mark Zuckerberg on Capitol Hill. Committees on the Judiciary and Commerce, Science, and Transportation will come to order. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on Facebook's social media privacy and the use and, dish and abuse of data. Although not unprecedented, this is a unique hearing. The issues we will consider range from data privacy and security to consumer protection and the Federal Trade Commission enforcement, touching on jurisdictions of these two committees. We have 44 members between our two committees. That may not s seem like a large group by Facebook standards, <laughs> but it is significant here for a hearing in the United States Senate. We will do our best to keep things moving efficiently given our circumstances. We will begin with opening statements from the chairman and ranking members of each committee, starting with Chairman Thune, and then proceed with Mr. Zuckerberg's opening statement. We will then move on to questioning. Each member will have five minutes to question witnesses. I'd like to remind the members of both committees <coughs> that time limits will be and must be strictly enforced given the number of here today. If you're over your time, Chairman Thune and I will make sure to let you know there will not be a second round as well. Of course, there will be the usual follow-up written questions for the record. Questioning will alternate between majority and minority and between committees. We will proceed in order based on respective committee seniority. We will anticipate a couple short breaks later in the afternoon, and so it's my pleasure to recognize the chairman of the Commerce Committee, uh, uh, Chairman Thune, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Today's hearing is extraordinary. It's extraordinary to hold a joint committee hearing. It's even more extraordinary to have a single CEO testify before nearly half of the United States Senate. But then Facebook is pretty extraordinary. More than two billion people use Facebook every month. 1.4 billion people use it every day. More than the population of any country on Earth except China, 
and more than four times the population of the United States. It's also more than 1,500 times the population of my home state of South Dakota. Plus, roughly 45 percent of American adults report getting at least some of their news from Facebook. In many respects, Facebook's incredible reach is why we're here today. We're here because of what you, Mr. Zuckerberg, have described as a breach of trust. A quiz app used by approximately 300,000 people led to information about 87 million Facebook users being obtained by the company. There are plenty of questions about the behavior of Cambridge Analytica, and we expect to hold a future hearing on Cambridge and, sim and similar firms. But as you said, this is not likely to be an isolated incident, a fact demonstrated by Facebook's suspension of another firm just this past weekend. You've promised that when Facebook discovers other apps that had access to large amounts of user data, you will ban, ban them and tell those affected. And that's appropriate. But it's unlikely to be enough for the two billion Facebook users. One reason that so many people are worried about this incident is what it says about how Facebook works. The idea that for every person who decided to try an app, information about nearly 300 other people was scraped from your services, to put it mildly, disturbing. And the fact that those 87 million people may have technically consented to making their data available doesn't make most people feel any better. The recent revelation that malicious actors were able to utilize Facebook's default privacy settings to match email addresses and phone numbers found on the so-called dark web to public Facebook profiles, potentially affecting all Facebook users, only adds fuel to the fire. What binds these two incidents is that they don't appear to be caused by the kind of negligence that allows typical data breaches to happen. Instead. They both appear to be the result of people exploiting the very tools that you've created to manipulate users' information. I know Facebook has taken several steps and intends to take more to address these issues. Nevertheless, some have warned that the actions Facebook is taking to ensure that third parties don't obtain data from unsuspecting users, while necessary, will actually serve to enhance Facebook's own ability to market such data exclusively. Most of us understand that whether you're using Facebook or Google or some other online services, we are trading certain information about ourselves for free or low-cost services. But for this model to persist, both sides of the bargain need to know the stakes that are involved. Right now, I'm not convinced that Facebook's users have the information that they need to make meaningful choices. In the past, many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle have been willing to defer to tech companies' efforts to regulate themselves. But this may be changing. Just last month, in overwhelming bipartisan fashion, Congress voted to make it easier for prosecutors and victims to go after websites that knowingly facilitate sex trafficking. This should be a wake-up call for the tech community. We want to hear more, without delay, about what Facebook and other companies plan to do to take greater responsibility for what happens on their platforms. How will you protect users' data? How will you inform users about the changes that you are making? And how do you intend to proactively stop harmful conduct instead of being forced to respond to it months or years later? Mr. Zuckerberg, in many ways, you and the company that you've created, the story that you've created represent the American dream. Many are incredibly inspired by what you've done. At the same time, you have an obligation, and it's up to you, to ensure that that dream doesn't become a privacy nightmare for the scores of people who use Facebook. This hearing is an opportunity to speak to those who believe in Facebook and to those who are deeply skeptical about it. We are listening, America is listening, and quite possibly the world is listening to. Thank you. Now, Ranking Member Feinstein. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Grassley, Chairman Thune. Thank you both for holding this hearing. Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you for being here. 
you have a real opportunity to, no. this afternoon to lead the industry the and demonstrate a meaningful commitment to protecting individual privacy. We have learned over the past few months, and we've learned a great deal that's, that's alarming. We've seen how foreign actors are abusing social media platforms, like Facebook, to interfere in elections and take millions of Americans' personal information without their knowledge in order to manipulate public opinion and target individual voters. Specifically, on February the 16th, Special Counsel Mueller issued an indictment against the Russia-based Internet, Internet Research Agency and 13 of its employees for interfering operations targeting, targeting the United States. Through this 37-page indictment, we learned that the IRA ran a coordinated campaign through 470 Facebook accounts and pages. The campaign included ads and false information to create discord and harm Secretary Clinton's campaign. And the content was seen by an estimated 157 million Americans. A month later, on March 17th, news broke that Cambridge Analytica exploited the personal information of approximately 50 million Facebook users without their knowledge or permission. And last week, we learned that number was even higher, 87 million Facebook users who had their private information taken without their consent. Specifically, using a personality quiz he created, Professor Kogan collected the personal information of three Facebook users and then collected data on millions of their friends. It appears the information collected included everything these individuals had on their Facebook pages, and according to some reports, even included private direct messages between users. Professor Kogan is said to have taken data from over 70 million Americans. It has also been reported that he sold this data to Cambridge Analytica for $800,000. Cambridge Analytica then took this data and created a psychological welfare tool to influence United States elections. In fact, the CEO, Alexander Nix, declared that Cambridge Analytica ran all the digital campaign, the television campaign, and its data informed all the strategy for the Trump campaign. The reporting has also speculated that Cambridge Analytica worked with the Internet Research Agency to help Russia identify which American voters to target which it's with its propaganda. I'm concerned that press reports indicate Facebook learned about this breach in 2015 but appears not to have taken significant steps to address it until this year. So this hearing is important, and I appreciate the conversation we had yesterday. And I believe that Facebook, through your presence here today, and the words you're about to tell us, will indicate how strongly your industry will regulate and or reform the platforms that they control. I believe this is extraordinarily important. You lead a big company with 27,000 employees, and we very much look forward to your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. The history and growth of Facebook mirrors that of many of our technological giants. Founded by Mr. Zuckerberg, in 2004, Facebook has exploded over the past 14 years. Facebook currently has over 2 billion monthly active users across the world, over 25,000 employees and offices in 13 U.S. cities and various other countries. Like their expanding user base, the data collected on Facebook users has also skyrocketed. They have moved on from schools, likes, and relationship statuses. Today, Facebook has access to dozens of data points 
ranging from ads that you've clicked on, events you've attended, and your location based upon your mobile device. It is no secret that Facebook makes money off this data through advertising revenue, although many seem confused by or all get altogether unaware of this fact. Facebook generates generated $40 billion in revenue in 2017, with about 98% coming from advertising across Facebook and Instagram. Significant data collection is also occurring at Google, Twitter, Apple, and Amazon, and even an ever-expanding portfolio of products and services offered by these companies grant endless opportunities to collect increasing amounts of information on their customers. As we get more free or extremely low-cost services, the trade-off for the American consumer is to provide more personal data. The potential for further growth and innovation based on collection of data is limitless. However, the potential for abuse is also significant. While the condors of the Cambridge Analytica situation are still coming to light, there was clearly a breach of consumer trust and a likely improper transfer of data. The Judiciary Committee will hold a separate hearing exploring Cambridge and other data privacy issues. More importantly, though, these events have ignited a larger discussion on consumers' expectations and the future of data privacy in our society. It is exposed that consumers may not fully understand or appreciate the extent to which their data is collected, protected, transferred, used, and misused. Data has been used in advertising and political campaigns for decades. The amount and type of data obtained, however, has seen a very dramatic change. Campaigns including Presidents Bush, Obama, and Trump all use these increasing amounts of data to focus on micro-targeting and personalization over numerous social media platforms and especially Facebook. In fact, President Obama's campaign developed an app utilizing the same Facebook feature as Cambridge Analytica to capture the information of not just the app's users, but millions of their friends. The digital director for that campaign uh, for 2012 described the data scraping app as something that would, quote, wind up being the most groundbreaking piece of technology developed for this campaign, end of quote. So the effectiveness of these social media tactics can be debated, but their use over the past years across the political spectrum and their increased significance cannot be. Our policy towards data privacy and security must keep pace with these cha changes. Data privacy should be tethered to consumer needs and expectations. Now, at a minimum, consumers must have the transparency necessary to make an informed decision about whether to share their data and how it can be used. Consumers ought to have clear information, not opaque policies and complex click-through consent pages. The tech industry has an obligation to respond to widespread and growing concerns over data privacy and security and to restore the public's trust. The status quo no longer works. Moreover, Congress must determine if and how we need to strengthen privacy standards to ensure transparency and understanding for the billions of consumers who utilize these products. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, good afternoon. Uh, let me just cut to the chase. If you and other social media companies do not get uh, your act in order, none of us are going to have any privacy anymore. Uh, that's what we're facing. We're talking about personally identifiable information 
that if not kept by the social media, media companies from theft, a value that we have in America being our personal privacy, we won't have it anymore. Uh, it's the advent of technology, uh, and of course all of us are part of it. From the moment that we wake up in the morning until we go to bed, we're on those handheld tablets. And online companies like Facebook are tracking our activities and collecting information. Facebook has a responsibility to protect this personal information. We had a good discussion yesterday. We went over all of this. You told me that the company had failed to do so. It's not the first time that Facebook has mishandled its users' information. The FTC found that Facebook's privacy policies had deceived users in the past. And in the present case, we recognize that Cambridge Analytica and an app developer lied to consumers and lied to you, lied to Facebook, but did Facebook watch over the operations? We want to know that. And why didn't Facebook notify 87 million users that their personally identifiable information had been taken? And it was being also used, why were they not informed for unauthorized political purposes? So only now, and I appreciate our conversation, only now Facebook has pledged to inform those consumers whose accounts were compromised. I think you're genuine. I got that sense in con conversing with you you want to do the right thing, you want to enact reforms, we want to know if it's going to be enough. And I hope that will be in the answers uh, today. Now, since we still don't know what Cambridge Analytica has done with this data, uh, you heard uh, Chairman Thune say, as we have discussed, we want to haul Cambridge Analytica in to answer these questions at a separate hearing. I want to thank uh, Chairman Thune for working with all of us on scheduling a hearing. There's obviously a great deal of interest in this subject. I hope we can get to the bottom of this. And if Facebook and other online companies will not or cannot fix the privacy invasions, then we are going to have to, we, the Congress. How can American consumers trust folks like your company to be caretakers of their most personal and identifiable information? And that's the question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, my colleagues and Senator Nelson. Uh, our witness today is Mark Zuckerberg, founder, chairman, chief executive officer of Facebook. Mr. Zuckerberg's launched Facebook February 4th, 2004, at the age of 19. And at that time, he was a student at Harvard University. As I mentioned previously, his company now has over 40 billion of annual revenue and over two billion monthly active users. Mr. Zuckerberg, along with his wife, also established the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to further philanthropic causes. I now turn to you. Welcome to the committee. Uh, and uh, whatever your statement is orally, if you have a longer one, it'll be included in the record. So proceed, sir. Chairman Grassley, Chairman Thune, uh, Ranking Member Feinstein and Ranking Member Nelson and members of the committee. We face a number of important issues around privacy, safety, and democracy. And you will rightfully have some hard questions for me to answer. Before I talk about the steps we're taking to address them, I want to talk about how we got here. 
Facebook optimistic company. For most of our existence, we focused on all of the good that connecting people can do. And as Facebook has grown, people everywhere have gotten a powerful new tool for staying connected to the people they love, for making their voices heard, and for building communities and businesses. Just recently, we've seen the Me Too movement and the March for Our Lives organized, at least in part, on Facebook. After Hurricane Harvey, people came together to raise more than $20 million for relief. And more than 70 million biz small businesses use Facebook to create jobs and grow. But it's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, for foreign interference in elections and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. So now, we have to go through our, all of our relationship with people and make sure that we're taking a broad enough view of our responsibility. It's not enough to just connect people. We have to make sure that those connections are positive. It's not enough to just give people a voice. We need to make sure that people aren't using it to harm other people or to spread misinformation. And it's not enough to just give people control over their information. We need to make sure that the developers they share it with protect their information too. Across the board, we have a responsibility to not just build tools, but to make sure that they're used for good. It will take some time to work through all the changes we need to make across the company, but I'm committed to getting this right. This includes the basic responsibility of protecting people's information, which we failed to do with Cambridge Analytica. So here are a few things that we are doing to address this and to prevent it from happening again. First, we're getting to the bottom of exactly what Cambridge Analytica did and telling everyone affected. What we know now is that Cambridge Analytica improperly accessed some information about millions of Facebook members by buying it from an app developer. That information, uh, th this was information that people generally share publicly on their Facebook pages like names and their profile picture and the pages they follow. When we first contacted Cambridge Analytica, they told us that they had deleted the data. About a month ago, we heard new reports that suggested that wasn't true. And now we're working with governments in the US, the UK, and around the world to do a full audit of what they've done and to make sure they get rid of any data they may still have. Second, to make sure no other app developers out there are misusing data, we're now investigating every single app that had access to a large amount of information in the past. And if we find that someone improperly used data, we're gonna ban them from Facebook and tell everyone affected. Third, to prevent this from ever happening again going forward, we're making sure that developers can access as much information now. The good news here is that we already made big changes to our platform in 2014 that would have prevented this specific situation from Cam with Cambridge Analytica from occurring again today. But there's more to do, and you can find more details on the steps we're taking in my written statement. My top priority has always been our social mission of connecting people, building community, and bringing the world closer together. Advertisers and developers will never take priority over that as long as I'm running Facebook. I started Facebook when I was in college. We've come a long way since then. We now serve more than two billion people around the world and every day, people use our services to stay connected with the people that matter to them most. I believe deeply in what we're doing. And I know that when we address these challenges, we'll look back and view helping people connect and giving more people a voice as a positive force in the world. I realize the issues we're talking about today aren't just issues for Facebook and our community. They're issues and challenges for all of us as Americans. Thank you for having me here today and I'm ready to take your questions. <clears throat> I'll remind members that maybe weren't here when I had my opening comments that we are operating under the five-minute five, five minute rule, and that applies to uh, the, <laughs> the five-minute rule, and that applies to those of us who are chairing the committee as well. Uh, 
I start with you. Uh, Facebook handles extensive amounts of personal data for billions of users. A sig significant amount of that data is shared with third party developers who utilize your platform. As of this early this year, you did not actively monitor whether that data was transferred by such developers to other parties. Moreover, your policies only prohibit transfers by developers to parties seeking to profit from such data. Number one, besides Professor Kogan's transfer and now potentially CubeU, do you know of any instances where user data was improperly transferred to third party in breach of Facebook's terms? If so, how many times has that happened? And was Facebook only made aware of that transfer by some third party? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, we're now conducting a full investigation into every single app that had a access to a large amount of information uh, before we locked down platform uh, to prevent developers from accessing this information in around 2014. Uh, we believe that we're gonna be investigating many apps, tens of thousands of apps, and if we find any suspicious activity, we're going to conduct a full audit of those apps to understand how they're using their data and if they're doing anything improper. And if we find that they're doing anything improper, we'll ban them from Facebook and we will tell everyone affected. Uh, as for past activity, I, I don't have um, all the examples of apps that we've banned here, but if you'd like, I can have my team follow up with you after this. Okay. Have you ever required an audit to ensure the deletion of improperly transferred data? And if so, how many times? Mr. Chairman, um, yes, we have. I don't have the exact figure on how many times we have, but Overall, the way we've enforced our platform policies in the past um, is we have looked at patterns of how apps have, have used our APIs and accessed information, as well as looked into uh, reports that people have made to us about apps that might be doing sketchy things. Going forward, we're going to take a more proactive position on this uh, and, and do much more regular spot checks and other reviews of apps, um, as well as increasing the amount of audits that we do and again, I can make sure that our team follows up with you on, on anything about the, the specific past stats that would be interesting. Um, I was going to assume that sitting here today, you have no idea. Uh, and if, if I'm wrong on that, you're able, you're telling me, I think, that you're able to supply those figures to us, at, at least as of this point. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I will have my team follow up with you on what information we have. Okay, but right now you have no certainty of whether or not, uh, what, what, how much of that's going on, right? Okay. Facebook collects massive amounts of data from consumers, including content, networks, contact lists, device information, location, and information from third parties. Yet your data policy is only a few pages long and provides consumers with only a few examples of what is collected and how it might be used. The examples given emphasize benign uses, such as connecting with friends, but your policy does not give any indication for more controversial issues of such data. My question, why doesn't Facebook disclose to its users all the ways the data might be used by Facebook and other third parties and what is Facebook's responsibility to inform users about that information? Mr. Chairman, I, I believe it's important to tell people exactly how the information that they share on Facebook is going to be used. That's why every single time you go to share something on Facebook, whether it's a photo in Facebook uh, or a message in, in Messenger or WhatsApp, uh, every single time it, there's a control right there about who you're going to be sharing it with, whether it's your friends or public or a specific group, uh, and you can, you can change that and control that in line. To your broader point about the privacy policy, um, this gets into an, an issue that I, I think we and others in the industry have found challenging, which is that long privacy policy, and if you make it long and spell out all the detail, then you're probably going to reduce the percent of people who read it and make it accessible to them. So one of the things that, that we've struggled with over time is to make something that is as simple as possible so people can understand it, as well as giving them controls in line in the product in the context of when they're trying to actually use them, uh, taking into account that 
we don't expect that most people will want to go through and read a full legal document. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yesterday when we talked, I gave the relatively harmless example that I'm uh, communicating with my friends on Facebook and indicate that uh, I love a certain kind of chocolate. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, I start receiving advertisements for chocolate. What if I don't want to receive those commercial advertisements? So your chief operating officer, Ms. Sandberg, suggested on the NBC Today show that Facebook users who do not want their personal information used for advertising might have to pay for that protection, pay for it. Are you actually uh, considering having Facebook users pay for you not to use that information? Um, Senator, people have a control over how their information is used in ads in the product today. So if you want to have an experience where your ads aren't, you aren't targeted using uh, all the information that we have available, you can turn off third-party information. What we've found is that even though some people don't like ads, people really don't like ads that aren't relevant. And while there is some discomfort, for sure, with using information in making ads uh, more relevant, the overwhelming feedback that we get from our community is that people would rather have us uh, show relevant content there um, than not. So we offer this control that, you, that you're referencing. Um, some people use it. It's not the majority of people on Facebook. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's a, a good level of control to offer. I think what Cheryl was saying was that in order to not run ads at all, we would still need some sort of business model. And that is your business model. So I take it that, uh, and I use the harmless example of chocolate, but if it got into more personal thing, communicating with friends, and I want to cut it off, I'm going to have to pay you in order not to send me, using my personal information, something that I don't want. That, in essence, is what I understood Ms. Sandberg to say. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. Although, to be clear, we don't offer an option today for people to pay to not show ads. We think offering an ad-supported service is the most aligned with our mission of trying to help connect everyone in the world because we want to offer a free service that everyone can afford. Okay. That's the only way that we can reach billions well, of people. So, therefore, you consider my personally identifiable data the company's data, not my data. Is that it? No, Senator. Actually, at the first line of our terms of service, say that you control and own the information and content that you put on Facebook. Well, the recent scandal... Uh, is obviously frustrating, not only because it affected 87 million, but because it seems to be part of a pattern of lax data practical going back years. So back in 2011, it was a settlement with the FTC, and now we discover yet another instance where the data was failed to be protected. When you discovered the Cambridge Analytica that had fraudulently obtained all of this information, why didn't you inform those 87 million? When we learned in 2015 that Cambridge Analytica had bought data from an app developer on Facebook that people had shared it with, uh, we did take action. We took down the app and we demanded that both the app developer and Cambridge Analytica delete and stop using any data that they had. They told us that they did this. In retrospect, it was clearly a mistake to believe them. And yes. we should have followed up and done a full audit then. And that is not a mistake that we will make. Yes, you did that. And you uh, apologize for it. But you didn't <laughs> notify them. And... Uh, do you think that you have an ethical obligation to notify 87 million Facebook 
users? Senator, when we heard back from Cambridge Analytica that they had told us that they weren't using the data and had deleted it, we considered it a closed case. <coughs> In retrospect, that was clearly a mistake. We shouldn't have taken their word for it, and we've updated our policies and how we're going to operate the company to make sure that we don't make that mistake again. Did anybody notify the FTC? No, Senator, for the same reason, that we'd considered it a closed, uh, closed case. Senator Thune. And, and Mr. Zuckerberg, would you that, do that differently today, presumably, that in response to Senator Nelson's question? Yes. Having to do it over. Um, this may be your first appearance before Congress, but it's not the first time that Facebook has faced tough questions about its privacy policies. Uh, Wired Magazine recently noted that you have a 14-year history of apologizing for ill-advised decisions regarding user privacy, not unlike the one that you made uh, just now in your opening statement. After more than a uh, decade of promises to do better, how is today's apology different? And why should we trust Facebook to make the necessary changes to ensure user privacy and give people a clearer picture of your privacy policies? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we have made a lot of mistakes in running the company. I think it's, it's pretty much impossible, I, I believe, to start a company in your dorm room and then grow it to be at the scale that we're at now without uh, making some mistakes. And because our service is about um, helping people connect and information, um, those mistakes have been different in, in how they, uh, we try not to make the same mistake multiple times, but in general, a lot of the mistakes are around um, how people connect to each other just because of the nature of the service. Overall, I would say that we're going through a broader philosophical shift in how we approach our responsibility as a company. For the first 10 or 12 years of the company, I viewed our responsibility as primarily building tools that if we could put those tools in people's hands, then that would empower people to do good things. What I think we've learned now across a number of issues, not just data privacy, but also fake news and foreign interference in elections, is that we need to take a more proactive role and a broader view of our responsibility. It's not enough to just build tools. We need to make sure that they're used for good. And that means that we need to now take a more active view in policing the ecosystem um, and in watching and kind of looking out and, and making sure that all of the members in our community are using these tools in a way that's going to be good and healthy. So um, at the end of the day, this is going to be something where people will measure us by our results uh, on this. Um, it's not that I expect that anything I say here today to, to necessarily change people's view, uh, but I'm committed to getting this right. And I believe that over the coming years, once we fully work all these solutions through, um, people will see real, real differences. Okay. Well, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, you all have gotten that message. Um, as we discussed in my office yesterday, the line between legitimate political discourse and hate speech can sometimes be hard to identify, and especially when you're relying on artificial intelligence and other technologies for the initial discovery. Can you discuss what steps that Facebook currently takes when making these evaluations, the challenges that you face, and any examples of where you may draw the line between what is and what is not hate speech? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll speak to hate speech, and then um, I'll talk about enforcing our content policies more broadly. Uh, so actually, maybe if, if, if you're okay with it, I'll go in the other order. So from the beginning of the company in 2004, I started it in my dorm room. Um, it was me and my roommate. We didn't have AI technology that could look at the content that people were sharing. So um, so we basically had to uh, enforce our content policies reactively. People could share what they wanted, and, uh, and then if someone in the community found it to be offensive or against our policies, they'd flag it for us and we'd look at it reactively. Now, increasingly, we are developing AI tools that can identify certain classes of bad activity um, proactively and flag it for our team at Facebook. Um, by the end of this year, by the way, we're going to have uh, more than 20,000 people working on security and content review, um, working across all these things. So when, when content gets flagged to us, we have those, those people look at it, and if it violates our policies, then we take it down. Some problems lend themselves more easily to AI solutions than others. So hate speech is one of the hardest, because determining if something is hate speech is very linguistically nuanced. Right? It's, you need to understand... Um, you know, what is a slur and what, um, 
whether something is hateful, not just in English, but the majority of people on Facebook use it in languages that are different across the world. Um, contrast that, for example, with an area like finding terrorist propaganda, which we've actually been very successful at deploying AI tools on already. Today, as we sit here, 99% of the ISIS and Al-Qaeda content that we take down on Facebook our AI systems flag before any human sees it. So that's a success in terms of, of rolling out AI tools um, that, can, that can proactively um, police and enforce safety across the community. Um, hate speech, I am optimistic that over a five to 10 year period, we will have AI tools that can uh, get into some of the nuances, the linguistic nuances of, of, of different types of content to be more accurate in flagging things for our systems. But today we're just not there on that. So a lot of this is still reactive. People flag it to us. Um, we, we have people look at it. Um, we have policies to try to make it as not subjective as possible. But until we get it more automated, there's a higher error rate than I'm happy with. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, what is Facebook doing to prevent foreign actors from interfering in U.S. elections? Thank you, Senator. Um, this is... One of my top priorities in 2018 um, is to get this right. I, uh, one of my greatest regrets in running the company is that we were slow in identifying the Russian information operations in 2016. We expected them to do a number of more traditional cyber attacks, which we did identify and notify um, the campaigns that they were trying to hack into them, but we were slow at identifying the type of, of new information operations. When did you identify new operations? Uh, it was right around the time of the 2016 election itself. So since then, we 2018 is, is an incredibly important year for elections, not just in, with the U.S. midterms, but around the world. There are important elections in India, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Pakistan, and in Hungary that we want to make sure that we do everything we can to protect the integrity of those elections. Now, I have more confidence that we're going to get this right because since the 2016 election, there have been several important elections around the world where we've had a better record. There's the French presidential election. There's the German election. There was the U.S. Uh, Senate Alabama special election last year. Explain what is better about the record. So we've deployed new AI tools uh, that do a better job of identifying fake accounts that may be trying to interfere in elections or spread misinformation. And between those three elections, we were able to proactively remove tens of thousands of accounts that before they, they could um, contribute significant harm. And the nature of these attacks, though, is that you know, there are people in Russia whose job it is is to try to exploit our systems and other Internet systems and other systems as well. So this is an arms race. I mean, they're going to keep on getting better at this, and we need to invest in keeping on getting better at this too, which is why uh, one of the things I mentioned before is we're going to have uh, more than 20,000 people by the end of this year working on security and content review across the company. About automated bots that spread disinformation, what are you doing to punish those who exploit your platform in that regard? Well, you're not allowed to have a fake account on Facebook. Your content has to be authentic. So we build technical tools to try to identify when people are creating fake accounts, especially large networks of fake accounts like the Russians have, in order to remove all of that content. After the 2016 election, our top priority was protecting the integrity of other elections around the world. But at the same time, we had a parallel effort to trace back to Russia um, the IRA activity, the Internet Research Agency activity, that was the part of the Russian government that, uh, that did this activity in, in, in 2016, and just last week, uh, we were able to determine uh, that a number of Russian media organizations that were sanctioned by the Russian regulator were operated and controlled by this Internet Research Agency. So we took the step last week that was a pretty big step for us of taking down um, sanctioned news organizations in Russia as part of an operation to remove 270 uh, fake accounts and pages, part of their broader network in Russia, um, that was, that was actually not targeting international interference as much as, I'm um, sorry, let me, let me correct that. It was primarily targeting um, spreading misinformation in Russia itself, as well as certain Russian-speaking neighboring countries. How many accounts of this type have you taken down? Across, uh, in the IRA specifically, the ones that we've pegged back to the IRA, um, we can identify the 470 in the American elections, 
and the 270 that we specifically went after in Russia last week. There are many others that our systems catch, which are uh, more difficult to attribute specifically to Russian intelligence. But the number would be in the tens of thousands of fake accounts that we remove. And I'm happy to have my team follow up with you on more information if that would be helpful. Would you please? Uh, I think this is very important. Um, if you knew in 2015 that Cambridge Analytica was using the information of Professor Kogan's, why didn't Facebook ban Cambridge in 2015? Why'd you wait? Another Senator, year? that's a, a great question. Um, Cambridge Analytica wasn't using our services in 2015, as far as we can tell. So this is, this is clearly one of the questions that I asked our team as soon as I learned about this, is why, why did we wait until we found out about the reports last month to, to, to ban them? Um, it's because as of the time that we learned about their activity in 2015, they weren't an advertiser, they weren't running pages, so we actually had nothing to ban. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, thank you, Senator Feinstein. Now Senator Hatch. Well, in my opinion, this is, the most, uh, this is the most intense public scrutiny I've seen uh, for a tech-related hearing since the Microsoft hearing that, that I chaired back in the late 1990s. The recent stories about Cambridge uh, Analytica and data mining on social media have raised serious concerns about consumer privacy. And naturally, I know you understand that. At the same time, these stories touch on the very foundation of the Internet economy, and the way the websites uh, that drive our internet economy make money. Some have professed themselves shocked, shocked, that, that companies like Facebook and Google share u user data with advertisers. Did any of these individuals ever stop to ask themselves why Facebook and Google didn't, uh, don't, change, don't charge for access? Nothing in life is free. Everything involves trade-offs. If you want something without having to pay money for it, you're going to have to pay for it in some other way, it seems to me. And that's where, what we're seeing here. And these great websites that don't charge for access, they extract value in some other way. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as they're upfront about what they're doing. To my mind, the issue here is transparency. It's consumer choice. Between the two when they access a website or agree to terms of service, our websites up front about how they extract uh, value from users, or do they hide the ball? Do consumers have the information they need to make an informed choice regarding whether or not to visit a particular website? To my, to my mind, these are questions that we should ask or be focusing on. Now, Mr. Zuckerberg, I remember well your first visit to Capitol Hill back in 2010. You spoke to the Senate Republican High Tech Task Force, which I chair, you said back then that Facebook would always be free. Is that still your objective? Senator, yes. There will always be a version of Facebook that is free. It is our mission to try to help connect everyone around the world and to bring the world closer together. In order to do that, we believe that we need to offer a service that everyone can afford, and we're committed to doing that. Well, if so, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. I see. That's great. Whenever a controversy like this arises, there's always a danger that Congress's response will be to step in and overregulate. Now, that's been the experience that I've had in my 42 years here. In your view, what sorts of legislative changes would help to solve the problems the Cambridge Analytica story has revealed, and what sorts of legislative changes would not help to solve this issue? Senator, I think that there are a few categories of legislation that, uh, that make sense to consider. Around privacy specifically, um, there are a few principles that I think it would be useful to, to discuss and, um, and potentially codify into law. Uh, one is around having a simple and practical um, set of, of ways that you explain what you're doing with data. And we talked a little bit earlier around the complexity of laying out these this long privacy policy, it's hard to say that people you know, fully understand something when it's only written out in a long legal document. This, need, this stuff needs to be um, implemented in a way where people can actually understand it, where consumers can, can understand it, um, but that can also um, capture all the nuances of how uh, these services work in a way that does it, that's not overly restrictive on, on pr providing the services. So that's one. The second 
is around giving people complete control. This is the most important principle for Facebook. Every piece of content that you share on Facebook, uh, you own, and you have complete control over who sees it and, and how you share it, and you can remove it at any time. Um, that's why every day, uh, about 100 billion times a day, um, people come to one of our services and either post a photo or send a message to someone because they know that they have that control um, and that who they say it's going to go to is going to be um, who, who sees the content. And I think that that control is something that's important that I think should apply to, uh, to every service. And Go ahead. The, the third point is, is just around enabling innovation. Because some of these use cases that, um, that are, are very sensitive, like face recognition, for example. And I think that there's a balance that's extremely important to strike here, where you obtain special consent for sensitive features like face recognition, but don't but that we still need to make it so that American companies can innovate in those areas or else we're going to fall behind Chinese competitors um, and others around the world who have different regimes um, for, for different new uh, features like that. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, do you know who Palantir is? I do. Some people have referred to them as a Stanford Analytica. Do you agree? Senator, I have not heard that. Okay. Do you think Palantir taught Cambridge Analytica, as press reports are saying, how to do these tactics? Senator, I don't know. Do you think that Palantir has ever scraped data from Facebook? Senator, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Do you think that during the... 2016 campaign as Cambridge Analytica was providing support to the Trump campaign under Project Alamo. Were there any Facebook people involved in that sharing of technique and information? Senator, we provided support to the Trump campaign similar to what we provide to any advertiser or campaign uh, who, who asks for it. So that was a yes. Is that a yes? Senator, can you repeat the specific question? I just want to make sure I, I, I get specifically what you're asking. During the 2016 campaign, Cambridge Analytica worked with the Trump campaign to refine tactics, and were Facebook employees involved in that? Senator, I'm, I don't know that our employees were involved with Cambridge Analytica, although I know that we did help out the Trump campaign overall in sales support in the same way that we do with other campaigns. So they may have been involved in all working together during that time period. Maybe that's something your investigation will find out. Senator, my, I can certainly have my team get back to you on any specifics there that I don't know sitting here today. Have you heard of total information awareness? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I do not. Okay. Total information awareness was uh, 2003. John Ashcroft and others trying to do similar things to what I think is behind all of this geopolitical forces trying to get data and information to influence a process. So when I look at Palantir and what they're doing, and I look at WhatsApp, which is another acquisition, and I look at where you are from the 2011 consent decree and where you are today, I'm thinking, is this guy out foxing the foxes or is he going along with what is a major trend in an information age to try to harvest information for political forces. And so my question to you is, do you see that those applications, that those companies, Palantir, and even WhatsApp are going to fall into the same situation that you've just fallen into over the last several years? Um, Senator, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure specifically. Overall, I, I do think that these issues around information access are challenging. To the specifics about those apps, I'm not really that familiar with what Palantir does. Um, WhatsApp collects very little information and I, I think is less likely to have the kind of issues because of the way that the service is architected. But certainly I think that these are broad issues across the tech industry. Well, I guess 
Given the track record of where Facebook is and why you're here today, I guess people would say that they didn't act boldly enough. And the fact that um, people like John Bolton basically was an investor in uh, New York Times article earlier, I guess it was actually last month, that the Bolton Pack was obsessed with how America was becoming limp-wristed and spineless and had wanted research and messaging for national security issues. So the fact that, you know, there are a lot of people who are interested in this larger effort. And what I think my constituents want to know is, was this discussed at your board meetings? And what are the applications and interests that are uh, being discussed without putting real teeth into this. We don't want to come back to this situation again. I believe you have all the talent. My question is whether you have all the will to help us solve this problem. Yes, Senator. So data privacy and foreign interference in elections are certainly topics that we have discussed at the board meeting. These are some of the biggest issues that the company has faced, and we feel a huge responsibility to get these right. Do you believe the European regulations should be applied here in the U.S.? Senator, I think everyone in the world deserves good privacy protection. And regardless of whether we implement the exact same regulation, I would guess that it would be somewhat different because we have somewhat different sensibilities in the U.S. as to other countries. Um, we're committed to rolling out the controls and the affirmative consent uh, and the... Uh, special controls around sensitive uh, types of technology like face recognition um, that are required in GDPR, we're doing that around the world. Um, so I think it's certainly worth discussing whether we should have something similar in, in the U.S., uh, but what I would like to say today is that we're going to go forward and implement that regardless of what the regulatory outcome is. Senator Wicker. Uh, Senator Thune will chair uh, next. Senator Wicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you for being with us. Uh, my question is going to be sort of a follow-up on what Senator Hatch was talking about. And let me agree with uh, basically uh, his, his um, advice that we don't want to over-regulate to, to the point where we're stifling innovation and investment. I understand with regard to suggested rules or suggested legislation, there are at least two schools of thought uh, out there. Uh, one would be the ISPs, the inter Internet Service Providers, who are advocating for privacy protections for consumers that apply to all online entities equally across the entire Internet ecosystem. Now, uh, Facebook is an edge provider, on the other hand. It's my understanding that many edge providers, such as Facebook, may not support that effort because edge providers have different business models uh, than the ISPs and should not be considered like services. So um, do you think we need consistent privacy protections for consumers across the entire Internet ecosystem that are based on the type of consumer information being collected, used, or shared, regardless of the entity doing the collecting or using or sharing? Senator, this is an important question. I would differentiate between ISPs, which I consider to be the pipes of the Internet, and the platforms like Facebook or Google or Twitter or YouTube that are the um, apps or, or platforms on top of that. I think in general, the expectations that people have of the pipes um, are somewhat different from the platforms. So there might be areas where there needs to be more regulation in one and less in the other, but I think that there are going to be other places where there needs to be more regulation of, of the other type. Um, specifically, though, on the pipes, one of the important issues that um, that I think we face and, and have debated is... is when, you, when you say pipes, you mean... ISPs. The ISPs. Yeah. Um, and I know net neutrality has been a, a hotly debated topic, and one of the reasons why I have been out there um, saying that I think that that should be the case is because you know, I look at my own story of when I was getting started building Facebook at Harvard. Um, you know, I only had one option for an ISP to use, and if I had to pay extra in order to um, make it so that my app could potentially be seen or used by other people, 
then uh, then we probably wouldn't be here today. Okay, well, well, I'm, but we're talking about privacy concerns, and and let me just say we're, we'll have to follow up on this. But I I, I think you and I agree this is going to be one of the major um, items of debate if we go forward and and do this from a governmental standpoint. Let me just uh, a couple of items. Is it true? that, um, as was recently publicized, that Facebook collects the call and text histories of its users that use Android phones. Senator, we have an app called Messenger uh, for sending messages to your Facebook friends, and that app offers people an option to sync uh, their, their text messages into the messaging app and to make it so that uh, so basically, so you can have one app where it has both your texts and um, and your Facebook messages in one place. Um, we also allow people the option of you can letting, opt in or out of that. Yes, is it, it is opt, to in. opt out. It is opt in. You, you you have to affirmatively say that you want to sync that information before we get access. Unless to it. unless you opt in, that you don't collect that call and text history. That is correct. And is that true for? Uh, is this practice done at all with minors, or do you make an exception there for persons aged 13 to 17? Um, I do not know. We can follow up. Okay, do that. Let's do that. One other thing. Uh, there have been reports that Facebook can track a user's Internet browsing activity even after that user has logged off of the Facebook platform. Can you confirm whether or not this is true? Um, Senator... I, I want to make sure I get this accurate, so it would probably be better to have my team follow up. So you afterwards. don't know? Um, I know that the people use cookies on the Internet and that you can probably correlate activity between, um, between sessions. Um, we do that for a number of reasons, including security and including measuring ads to make sure that the ad experiences are the most effective, which, of course, people can opt out of. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm precise well, in my when, answer, so well, when you let get me... When you get back to me, sir, uh, would, would you also let us know how Facebook discloses to its users that engaging in this type of tracking um, uh, gives us that result? Yes. Thank, and thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Wicker. Senator Leahy's up next. <clears throat> thank you. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, I, I assume um, Facebook's been served with subpoenas from the special counsel Mueller's office, is that correct? Yes. Have you or anyone at Facebook been interviewed by the special counsel's office? Yes. Have you been interviewed? I have not. I, I, I have not. Others have. I, I believe so, and I want to be careful here because that our work with the special counsel is confidential, and I want to make sure that in an open session I'm not revealing something that's <clears throat> confidential. I understand. That's why I made clear that you have been contacted and you have had subpoenas. Actually, let me clarify that. I, I actually am not aware of, of a subpoena. I believe that there may be, but I know we're working with them. Thank you. Um, six months ago, your general counsel uh, promised us that you were taking steps to prevent Facebook for serving what I would call an unwitting co-conspirator in Russian interference. But these um, these unverified divisive pages are on Facebook today. They look a lot like the anonymous groups of Russian agents used to spread propaganda during the 2016 election. Are you able to confirm whether they're Russian-created groups? Yes or no? Senator, are you asking about those specifically? Yes. Um, Senator, last week we actually announced a, a major change to our ads and pages policies that we will be verifying the identity of um, every single Ask advertiser. Specific ones. Do you know whether they are? I am not familiar with those pieces of content specifically. But if you signed this policy a week ago, you'd be able to verify them? We are working on that now. What we're doing is we're going to verify the identity of any advertiser who's running a political um, or issue-related ad. Uh, this is basically what the Honest Ads Act is proposing, um, and we're following that. Um, and we're also going to do that for pages. But you can't so, answer on these. 
I, I'm not familiar with those specific well, cases. Will you, will you find out the answer and get back to me? I'll have my team get back to you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think it's worth adding, though, that we're going to do the same verification of the identity and location of admins who are running large pages. So that way, even if they aren't going to be buying ads in our system, um, that will make it significantly harder for Russian um, interference efforts or other inauthentic efforts well, some, um, to try to spread misinformation through the network. And so far, it's been going on for some time. Some might say that's about time. You know, six months ago, I asked your general counsel about Facebook's role as a breeding ground for hate speech against Rohingya refugees. Recently, UN investigators blamed Facebook uh, for playing a role in citing possible genocide in Myanmar, and there has been genocide there. Now, you say you use AI to find this. This is a type of uh, content I'm referring to. It calls for the death of a Muslim journalist. Now, that threat went straight through your detection systems. It spread very quickly. And then it took attempt after attempt after attempt and the involvement of civil society groups to get you to remove it. Why couldn't it be removed within 24 hours? Senator, what's happening in Myanmar is a terrible tragedy, uh, and we well, need to we, do more. We, we all agree with that. Okay. But you and investigators have blamed, you, you blame Facebook for playing a role in their genocide. We all agree it's terrible. How can you dedicate and will you dedicate the resources to make sure, sure such hate speech is taken down within 24 hours? Yes, we're working on this. And there are three specific things that we're doing. One is we're hiring dozens of more Burmese language um, content reviewers because hate speech is very language specific. It's hard to do it without people who speak the local language, and we need to ramp up our effort there dramatically. Second is we're working with civil society in Myanmar to identify specific hate figures so we can take down their accounts rather than specific pieces of content. And third is we're standing up a product team to do specific product changes in Myanmar and other countries that, that may have similar issues in the future um, to prevent this from, from happening. When Senator Cruz and I uh, sent a letter to Apple uh, asking what they're going to do about Chinese censorship, uh, my question, I'll place it. That'd be great. Thank you, Senator Lee. Place for the record, I want to know what you will do about Chinese censorship when they come to you. Sen Senator Graham's up next. Thank you. Uh, are you familiar with Andrew Bosworth? Yes, Senator, I am. He said, so we connect more people, maybe someone dies in a terrorist attack, coordinated on our uh, tools. The ugly truth is that we believe in connecting people so deeply that anything that allows us to connect more people more often is de facto good. Do you agree with that? No, Senator, I do not. And as context, Boz wrote that. Boz is what we call him internally. Um, he wrote that as an internal note. Um, we have a lot of discussion internally. I disagreed with it at the time that he wrote it. If you looked at the comments on the internal discussion, the Would vast majority of people internally did too. That you did a poor job as a CEO communicating your displeasure with such thoughts. Because if he had understood where you where you were at, he would never have said it to begin with. Well, Senator, we try to run our company in a way where people can express different opinions internally. Well, this is an opinion that really disturbs me. <laughs> and if somebody worked for me that said this, I'd fire him. Uh, who's your biggest competitor? Uh, Senator, we have a lot of competitors. Well, who's your biggest? Mm, I think the categories of... Do you want just one? I, I'm not sure I can give one, but can I give a, a, a bunch? Mm-hmm. So there are three categories that I would focus on. One are the other tech platforms, so Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. We overlap with them in different ways. Do they, do, do they provide the same service you provide? Um, in different ways, different let me, parts let me put of it, this yes. Way. If I buy a Ford and it doesn't work well and I don't like it, I can buy a Chevy. If I'm upset with Facebook, what's the equivalent product that I can go sign up for? 
Uh, well, there's the second category that I was going to talk about. Are I'm not talking about categories. I'm talking about is there real competition you face? Because car companies face a lot of competition. If they make a defective car, it gets out in the world. People stop buying that car, they buy another one. Is it an alternative to Facebook in the private sector? Uh, yes, Senator. The average American uses eight different apps okay. to communicate with their friends and stay in touch with people, okay. ranging from texting Which is apps the, to email. Is the same to service you provide. Well, we is, provide a number of different services. Is Twitter the same as what you do? It overlaps with a portion of what we do. You don't think you have a monopoly? Uh, it certainly doesn't feel like that to me. Okay. <laughs> so, it doesn't. So, Instagram, you bought Instagram. Why did you buy Instagram? Uh, because they were very talented app developers who were making good use of our platform and understood our values. It was a good business decision. My point is that one way to regulate a company is through competition, through government regulation. Here's the question that all of us got to answer. What do we tell our constituents, given what's happened here, why we should let you self-regulate? What would you tell people in South Carolina that given all the things we've just discovered here, it's a good idea for us to rely upon you to regulate your own business practices? Well, Senator, my position is not that there should be no regulation. Okay. I think the Internet is increasingly important. you embrace important. regulation? I, I think the real question, as the Internet becomes more important in people's lives, is what is the right regulation, not whether there should but, be but or not. you as a company welcome regulation? I think if it's the right regulation, then Do yes. you think the Europeans have it right? Uh, I think that they get things right. Have you ever submitted? <laughs> That's true. Uh, so would you work with us in terms of what regulations you think are necessary in your industry? Absolutely. Okay. Would you submit to us some proposed regulations? Yes, and I'll have my team follow up with you so that way we can have this discussion across the different categories where I think that this discussion needs to happen. Look forward to it. When you sign up for Facebook, you sign up uh, for terms of service. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay. It says... The terms govern your use of Facebook and the products, features, apps, services, technology, software we offer Facebook's products or products, except where we expressly state that separate terms and not these apply. I'm a lawyer. I have no idea what that means. But when you look at terms of service, this is what you get. Do you think the average consumer understands what they're signing up for? I don't think that the average person likely reads that whole document. Yeah. But I think that there are different ways that we can communicate that and have a responsibility to do so. Do you, do you agree with me that you better come up with different ways because this ain't working? Uh, well, Senator, I think in certain areas that is true. And I think in other areas, like the core part of what we do. But if you, if you think about it just at the most basic level, people come to Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger about 100 billion times a day to share a piece of content or a message with a specific set of people. And I think that that basic functionality, people understand because we have the controls in line every time, and given the volume of, of, of the activity and the value that people tell us that they're getting from that, um, I think that that control in line does seem to be working fairly well. Now, we can always do better, and there are other and the services are complex, and there is more to it than just... Uh, you know, you go and you post a photo. Um, so I, I, I agree that, that in many places we could do better. But I think for the core of the service, it actually is um, quite clear. Thank you, Senator Graham. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, I think we all agree that what happened here was bad. You acknowledged it was a breach of trust. And the way I explain it to my constituents is that if someone breaks into my apartment with a crowbar and they take my stuff, uh, it's just like if the manager gave them the keys or if they didn't have any locks on the doors. It's still a breach. It's still a break-in. And I believe we need to have laws and rules that are sophisticated as the brilliant products that you've developed here. And we just haven't done that yet. And one of the areas that I've focused on is the election. And I appreciate the support that you and Facebook 
and now Twitter, actually, have given to the Honest Ads Act, a bill uh, that you mentioned that I'm leading with Senator uh, McCain and Senator Warner. And I just want to be clear, as we work to pass this law so that we have the same rules in place to disclose political ads and issue ads um, as we do for TV and radio, as well as disclaimers, that you're going to take early action as soon as June, I heard, uh, before this election so that people can view these ads, including issue ads. Is that correct? That is correct, Senator. And I just want to take a moment before I go into this in more detail to thank you for your leadership on this. Um, this, I think, is an important area for the whole industry to move on. Um, the two specific things that we're doing are, one is around transparency. So now you're going to be able to go and click on any advertiser or any page on Facebook and see all of the ads that they're running. So that actually brings advertising online on Facebook to an even higher standard than what you would have on TV or print media because there's nowhere where you can see all of the TV ads that someone is running, for example, whereas you will be able to see now on Facebook um, whether this um, campaign or, or third party is saying different messages to different types of people. I think that that's a really important element of transparency. Mm -hmm. Then the other really important piece is around verifying every single um, advertiser who's going to be running political um, or issue ads. I appreciate that. And Senator Warner and I have also called on Google and the other platforms to do the same. So memo to the rest of you. Uh, we have to get this done or we're going to have a patchwork of ads. And I uh, hope that you'll be working with us to pass this bill. Is that right? We will. Okay, thank you. Um, now on the subject of Cambridge Analytica, um, were these people, uh, the 87 million people, users, um, concentrated in certain states? Are you able to figure out where they're from? I do not have that information with me, but, uh, could, but we can follow up with your, your office. Okay, because as we know, that election was close and it was only thousands of votes in certain states. Uh, you've also estimated that roughly 126 people, million people may have been shown content from a Facebook page associated with the Internet Research Agency. Have you determined when he, whether any of those people were the same Facebook users whose data was shared with Cambridge Analytica? Are you able to make that determination? Senator, we're investigating that now. Um, we believe that it is entirely possible that there will be a connection there. Okay, that seems like a big deal as we look back at that last election. Uh, former Cambridge Analytica employee Christopher Wiley has said that the data uh, that it improperly obtained, that Cambridge Analytica improperly obtained from Facebook users, could be stored in Russia. Uh, do you agree that that's a possibility? Uh, sorry, are you, are you asking if... Cambridge Analytica's data, data could be stored in Russia? That's what he said this weekend on a Sunday show. Um, Senator, I don't have any specific knowledge that would suggest that, but one of the steps that we need to take now is go do a full audit of all of Cambridge Analytica's systems to understand uh, what they're doing, whether they still have any data, to make sure that they remove all the data. If they don't, we're going to take legal action against them to do so. That audit, um, we have temporarily ceded that in order to let the UK government complete their government investigation first, because of course a government investigation takes precedence over a company doing that. But we are committed to completing this full audit and getting to the bottom of what's going on here, so that way we can have more answers to this. Okay, you um, earlier stated uh, publicly and here uh, that you would support some privacy rules um, so that everyone's um, playing by the same rules here. Um, and you also said here that you should have notified customers earlier. Uh, would you support a rule uh, that would require you to notify your users of a breach within 72 hours? Senator, that makes sense to me, and I think we should um, have our team follow up with, with yours to, to discuss the details around that more. Thank you. I just think part of this was when people don't even know that their data has been breached, uh, that's a huge problem. And I also think we get to solutions faster when we get that information out there. Uh, thank you, and we look forward to passing this bill. We'd love to pass it before the election on the honest ads and um, looking forward to better disclosure of this election. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Blunt's up next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dr. Burke, nice to see you. When I saw you not too long after I entered the Senate in 2011, I told you when I sent my business cards down to be printed, they came back from the Senate print shop with a message that was the first business card they'd ever printed a Facebook uh, address on. 
there are days when I've regretted that, but more days when we get lots of information that we need to get. There are days when I wonder if the Facebook friends is a little misstated. It doesn't seem like I have those every single day. But, you know, the, the platform you've created is really important. Now, my son, Charlie, who's 13, is dedicated to Instagram, so he'd want to be sure I mentioned him while I was here with uh, uh, with you. I haven't printed that on my card yet. I, I will, will say that, but I think we have that account as well. Lots of ways to connect people. And the the information, obviously, is an important commodity, and it's what makes your business work. I get that. However, I wonder about some of the collection efforts, and maybe we can go through largely just even yes and no, and then we'll get back to more expense, uh, expansive discussion of this. Uh, but do you um, collect user data through cross-device tracking? Uh, Senator, I believe we do link people's accounts between devices in order to make sure that their Facebook and Instagram and their other experiences can be synced between their devices. And that would also include offline data, data that's uh, tracking that's not necessarily linked to Facebook but linked to one some device they went through Facebook on. Is that right? Senator, I want to make sure we get this right, so I, I want to have my team follow up with you on that afterwards. Well, I, that doesn't seem that complicated to me. Now, you, you understand this better than I do, but maybe, maybe you can explain to me why that's, that, why that's complicated. Do you track devices that an individual who uses Facebook has that is connected to the device that they use for their Facebook connection but not necessarily connected to Facebook? I'm not, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Really? Yes. There, there may be some data that um, is necessary to provide the service that we do, uh, but I don't, I don't have that on, on sitting here today, so that's something that I would want to follow now, up. Now, the FTC last year flagged cross-device tracking as one of their concerns, generally, that people are tracking devices that the users of something like Facebook don't know that are being tracked. How do you disclose your... Uh, collected collection methods. Is that all in this document that I would see and agree to before I entered into a Facebook? Yes, Senator. So there are, there are two ways that we do this. One is we try to be exhaustive in the legal documents around the terms of service and privacy policies. But more importantly, we try to provide inline controls so that people that are in plain English that people can understand. Um, they can either go to settings or we can show them at the top of the app. Um, periodically, so that people understand all the controls and settings they have um, and can can configure their experience the way that they want. So do people, do people now give you permission to track specific devices in their contract? And if they do, is that a relatively new addition to what you do? Senator, I'm sorry, Are, I, don't, I, able, I don't have am that. Am I able to opt out? Am I able to say it's okay for you to... Um, track what I'm saying on Facebook, but I don't want you to track what I'm texting to somebody else off Facebook on an Android phone. Oh, okay. Yes, Senator. In, in general, Facebook is not collecting data from other apps that you use. There may be some specific things about the device that you're using that Facebook needs to understand in order to offer the service, but if you're using Google or you're using um, some texting app, um, unless you specifically opt in that you want to share the texting app information, um, Facebook wouldn't see that. Has it always been that way? Or is I, that a recent uh, addition to how you deal with those other uh, ways that I might communicate? Senator, my understanding is that that is how the mobile operating systems are architected. The um, so do you you don't have bundled permissions for how I can agree to what devices I may use that you may have contact with. Do you have do you bundle that permission, or am I able to want it individually? Uh, say what I'm willing for you to con to to watch and what I don't want you to watch, and I think we may have to take that for the record based on everybody else's time. 
Thank you, Senator Blunt. Next up, Senator Durbin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um, <laughs> uh, no. If you messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that might be what this is all about. Your right to privacy, the limits of your right to privacy, and how much you give away in modern America in the name of, quote, connecting people around the world. The question, basically, of um, what information Facebook's collecting, who they're sending it to, and whether they ever ask me in advance my permission to do that. Is that a fair thing for a user of Facebook to expect? Uh, yes, Senator. I think everyone should have control over how their information is used. And as we've talked about in, in some of the other questions, I think that that is laid out in, in some of the documents. But more importantly, you want to give people control in the product itself. So the most important way that this happens across our services is that every day people come to our services to choose to share photos or send messages. And every single time they choose to share something, um, they're they have a control right there about who they want to share it with. But they that level of control is extremely important. They certainly know within the Facebook pages who their friends are, but they may not know, as has happened, and you've conceded this point in the past, that sometimes that information is going way beyond their friends, and sometimes people have made money off of sharing that information. Correct? Senator, you're referring, I think, to our developer platform. Um, and it may be useful for me to give some background on how we set that up, if that's useful. I have three minutes left, so maybe you can do that for the record, because I have a couple of the questions I'd like to ask. You have recently announced uh, something that is called um, Messenger Kids. Facebook created an app allowing kids between the ages of 6 and 12 to send video and text messages through Facebook as an extension of their parents' account. You have cartoon-like stickers and other features designed to appeal to little kids, first graders, kindergartners. On January 30th, the Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood and lots of other child development organizations warned Facebook. They pointed to a wealth of research demonstrating that excessive use of digital devices and social media is harmful to kids and argued that young children simply are not ready to handle social media accounts at age six. In addition, there are concerns about data that's being gathered about these kids. Now, there are certain limits in the law, we know. There's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. What guarantees can you give us that no data from messenger kids is or will be collected or shared with those that might violate that law? All right, Senator, so a number of things I think are, are important here. The background on Messenger Kids is we heard feedback from thousands of parents that they want to be able to stay in touch with their kids and call them, use apps like FaceTime um, when they're working late or not around and want to communicate with their kids, but they want to have complete control over that. So I think we can all agree that if you're, when your kid is six or seven, even if they have access to a phone, you want to be able to control everyone who they can contact. And there wasn't an app out there that did that. So we built this service to do that. The app collects a minimum amount of information um, that is necessary to operate the service. So for example, the messages that people send um, is something that we collect in order to operate the service. But um, in general, that data is not going to be shared with third parties. Um, it is not connected to um, the broader Facebook experience. Excuse me, uh, as a lawyer, I picked up on that word in general, the phrase in general. It seems to suggest that in some circumstances it will be shared with third parties. No. It will not. All right. Um, would you be open to the idea that someone having reached adult age, having grown up with messenger kids, should be allowed to delete the data that you've collected? Senator, yes. As a matter of fact, when you become 13, which is our legal limit, our limiter, we, we don't allow people under the age of 13 to use Facebook, um, you don't automatically go from having a Messenger Kids account to a Facebook account. You have to start over and get a Facebook account. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a good idea to consider making sure that all that information is deleted, and in general, people are going to be starting over when they get their, their Facebook or other accounts. I'll close because I just have a few seconds. Illinois has a Biometric Information Privacy Act. 
our state does, which is to regulate the commercial use of facial, voice, finger, and iris scans and the like. We're now in a fulsome debate on that, and I'm afraid Facebook has come down to the position trying to carve out exceptions to that. I hope you'll fill me in on how that is consistent with protecting privacy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here. I note in, up until 2014, um, the mantra or motto of Facebook was move fast and break things. Is that correct? I don't know when we changed it, but the mantra is currently move fast with stable infrastructure, which is a much less sexy mantra. Sounds much more boring, but my question is, during the time that it was Facebook's mantra or motto to move fast and break things, do you think some of the misjudgments, perhaps mistakes that you've admitted to here were as a result of that culture or that attitude, particularly as regards to uh, personal privacy of the information of your subscribers? Senator, I do think that we made mistakes because of that, but <clears throat> the broadest mistakes that we made here are not taking a broad enough view of our responsibility. And well, well, that I, wasn't a matter. The, the move fast cultural value is more tactical around whether engineers can ship things and, and, and different ways that we operate. But I think the big mistake that we've made looking back on this is viewing our responsibility as just building tools rather than viewing our whole responsibility as making sure that those tools are used for good. Well, I, and I appreciate that because previously or earlier in the past, we've been told that um, platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the like are neutral platforms, and the people who own and run those uh, for profit, and I'm not criticizing doing something for profit in this country, um, but they bore no responsibility for the content. You agree now that Facebook and other, other social media platforms are not neutral platforms, but bear some responsibility for the content. I agree that we're responsible for the content. And I think that there's a, one of the big societal questions that I think we're going to need to answer is the current framework that we have is based on this reactive model that assumed that there weren't AI tools that could proactively um, tell you know, whether something was terrorist content or something bad. So it naturally relied on um, requiring people to flag for a company and then the company needing to take reasonable action. In the future, we're going to have tools that are going to be able to identify more types of bad content. And I think that there's, there are moral and legal obligation questions um, that I think we'll have to wrestle with as a society about when we want to require companies to take action proactively on certain of those things I, and when I, that gets in the way of... I appreciate that. I have two minutes left All right. to ask you questions. So you, you interestingly, the terms of uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the terms of service is a legal document which discloses to your subscribers how their information is going to be used, how Facebook is going to operate. And, um, but you concede that you doubt um, everybody reads or understands uh, that legalese, those terms of service. So are, is that to suggest that the consent that people give um, subject to that terms of service is not informed consent? In other words, they may not read it, and even if they read it, they may not understand it? I just think we have a broader responsibility than what the law requires. So I, well, I think I'm we talking, need to... I'm talking about, I appreciate that. What I'm asking about in terms of what your subscribers understand in terms of how their data is going to be used. But let me go to the terms of service. Under paragraph number two, you say you own all of the content and information you post on Facebook. That's what you've told us here today a number of times. So... If I choose to terminate my Facebook account, can I bar Facebook or any third parties from using the data that I had previously supplied uh, for any purpose whatsoever? Yes, Senator. If you delete your account, we should get rid of all of your information. You should or we do. do you? We do. How about third parties that you have um, contracted with to use some of that underlying information, perhaps 
to target advertising. So you can't, do you, do you, with, do you claw back that information as well, or does that remain in their custody? Well, Senator, this is actually a very important question, and I'm glad you brought this up, because there's a, a very common misperception about Facebook that we sell data to advertisers. And we do not sell data to advertisers. Well, we don't you, sell data you clearly to clearly rent it. Um, what we allow is for advertisers to tell us who they want to reach, and then we do the placement. So if an advertiser comes to us and says, all right, I'm a ski shop and I want to sell skis to women, um, then we might have some sense because people shared skiing-related content or said they were interested in that. Um, they shared whether they're a woman. And then we can show the ads to the right people without the, that data ever changing hands and going to the advertiser. That's a very fundamental part of how our model works and something that is often misunderstood. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you brought that up. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Um, we had indicated earlier on that we would uh, take a couple of breaks, give our witness an opportunity. And I think we've been going now for just under two hours. So um, I think we'll do... You is do a few more. Zuckerberger. Are you... <laughs> you you, you want to keep going? I mean, maybe, maybe 15 minutes. Okay. Does that work? All right, we'll keep going. Senator Blumenthal is up next. And um, we will commence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here today. Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, you have told us today and you've told the world that Facebook was deceived by Alexander Kogan when he sold user information to Cambridge Analytica, correct? Yes. I want to show you uh, the terms of service that Alexander Kogan provided to Facebook. And note for you that in fact, Facebook was on notice that he could sell that user information. Have you seen these terms of service before? I have not. Who in Facebook was responsible for seeing those terms of service that put you on notice that that information could be sold? Senator, our app review team would be responsible for that. Has and anyone been fired on that app review, review team? Uh, Senator, not because of this. Uh, doesn't that term of service conflict with the FTC order that Facebook was under at that very time that this uh, term of service was, in fact, provided to Facebook? And you'll note that the, face, the FTC order specifically requires Facebook to protect privacy. Isn't there a conflict there? Senator, it certainly appears that we should have been aware that this app developer submitted a term that was in conflict with the rules of the platform. Well, what happened here was, in effect, willful blindness. It was heedless and reckless, which, in fact amounted to a violation of the FTC consent decree. Would you agree? Uh, no, Senator. Uh, my understanding is that is, is not that this was a violation of the consent decree. But as I've said a number of times today, I think we need to take a broader view of our responsibility around privacy than just what is mandated um, in the current laws. Well, the here is decree. my reservation, Mr. Zuckerberg, and I apologize for interrupting you, but my time is limited. We've seen the apology tours before. You have refused to acknowledge even an ethical obligation to have reported this violation of the FTC consent decree. And we have letters, we've had contacts with Facebook employees. And I'm going to submit a letter for the record from Sandy Parakilis, with your permission. Uh, that indicates not only a lack of resources, but lack of attention to privacy. And so my reservation about your testimony today is that I don't see how you can change your business model unless there are specific rules of the road. Your business model is to monetize user information, to maximize profit over privacy, and unless there are specific rules and requirements enforced by an outside 
agency, I have no assurance that these kinds of vague commitments are going to produce action. So I want to ask you a couple of very specific questions, and they are based on legislation that I've offered, the My Data Act, legislation that Senator Markey is introducing today, the Consent Act, which I'm joining. Don't you agree that companies ought to be required to provide users with clear, plain information about how their data will be used and specific ability to consent to the use of that information? Senator, I do generally agree with, with what you're saying, and I laid that out earlier when I talked about what... Would you agree to an opt in as opposed to an opt-out? Uh, Senator, I think that that certainly uh, makes sense to discuss, and I think the details around this matter a lot. Would so you agree that users should be able to access all of their information? Senator, yes, of course. All of the information that you collect as a result of purchases from data brokers as well as tracking them? Senator, we have already a download your information tool that allows people to see and to take out all of the information that Facebook, that they've put into Facebook or that Facebook knows about them. So yes, I agree with that. We already have that. I have a number of other specific requests that you agree to support as part of legislation. I think legislation is necessary. The rules of the road have to be the result of congressional action. Uh, we have... Uh, Facebook has participated recently in the fight against scourge, the scourge of sex trafficking and the bill that we've just passed. It will be signed into law tomorrow. SESTA, the Stop Exploiting Sex Trafficking Act, was the result of our cooperation. I hope that we can cooperate on this kind of measure as well. Thanks. Senator, I look forward to having my team work with you on this. Thank you, Thank Sen you. Senator Blumenthal. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, welcome. Thank you for being here. Mr. Zuckerberg, does Facebook consider itself a neutral public forum? Senator, we consider ourselves to be a platform for all ideas. Let me ask the question again. Does Facebook consider itself to be a neutral public forum? And representatives of your company have given conflicting answers on this. Are you a First well, Amendment speaker expressing your views, or are you a neutral public forum allowing everyone to speak? Uh, Senator, here's how we think about this. I don't believe that uh, there is certain content that clearly we do not allow, right? H hate speech, terrorist content, um, nudity, anything that makes people feel unsafe in, in the community. Uh, from that perspective, that's why we generally try to refer to what we do okay. as a platform for all ideas. Let me try just because the time is constrained. It's just a, a simple question. The predicate for, for Section 230 immunity under the CD, CDA is that you are a neutral public forum. Do you consider yourself a neutral public forum, or are you engaged in political speech, which is your right under the First Amendment? Well, Senator, our goal is certainly not to engage in political speech. I'm not that familiar with the specific legal language of the, the law that you, that you speak to, so I, I would need to follow up with you on that. I'm just trying to lay out how broadly I think about this. Well, Mr. Zuckerberg, I will say there are a great many Americans who I think are deeply concerned that, that Facebook and other tech companies are engaged in a pervasive pattern of bias and political censorship. Uh, there have been numerous instances with Facebook. In May of 2016, Gizmodo reported that Facebook had purposely and routinely suppressed conservative stories from trending news including stories about CPAC, including stories about Mitt Romney, including stories about the Lois Lerner IRS scandal, including stories about Glenn Beck. In addition to that, Facebook has initially shut down the Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day page, has blocked a post of a Fox News reporter, has blocked over two dozen Catholic pages, and most recently blocked Trump supporters Diamond and Silk's page with 1.2 million Facebook followers after determining their content and unsafe to the community. To a great many Americans, that appears to be a pervasive pattern of political bias. Do you agree with that assessment? Senator, let me say a few things about this. First, I understand where that concern is coming from because 
Facebook and the tech industry are located in Silicon Valley, which is an extremely left-leaning place. And uh, I, this is actually a concern that I have and that I try to root out in the company, is making sure that we don't have um, any bias in the work that we do. And I think it is a fair concern that, um, that people would, so, would, so would me, at least me, wonder about. Let me ask this now, question. Are, are you aware of any ad or page that has been taken down from Planned Parenthood? Senator, I, I'm, I'm not, but let me just... Uh, how about moveon.org? Sorry? How about moveon.org? I'm not specifically aware of those. How about any Democratic candidate for office? I, I'm not specifically aware. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. In your testimony, you say that you have 15 to 20,000 people working on security and content review. Do you know the political orientation of those 15 to 20,000 people engaged in content review? Uh, no, Senator. We do not generally ask people about their political orientation when they're joining the company. So as CEO, have you ever made hiring or firing decisions based on political positions or what candidates they supported? No. Why was Palmer Lucky fired? That is a specific personnel matter that seems like it would be inappropriate to You speak just made a specific here. representation that you didn't make decisions based on political views. Well, I can, I can commit that it was not because of a political view. Do you know of those 15 to 20,000 people engaged in content review, how many, if any, have ever supported financially a Republican candidate for office? Senator, I do not know that. Your testimony says it is not enough that we just connect people. We have to make sure those connections are positive. It says we have to make sure people aren't using their voice to hurt people or spread misinformation. We have a responsibility not just to build tools, to make sure those tools are used for good. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you feel it's your responsibility to assess users, whether they are good and positive connections or ones that those 15 to 20,000 people deem unacceptable or deplorable? Senator, are you asking about me personally? Facebook. Uh, Senator, I think that there are a number of things that we would all agree are clearly bad. Foreign interference in our elections, terrorism, uh, self-harm. I'm Those talking are about things. censorship. Oh, well, I think that you would probably agree that we should remove terrorist propaganda from the service. So that, I, I agree, I think is, is clearly bad activity that we want to get down, and we're generally proud of, of how well we, we do at that. Now, what I can say, and, and, I, and I do want to get this in before the end here, is that I am I'm very committed to making sure that Facebook is a platform for all ideas. That is a, a very important founding principle of, of what we do, uh, we're proud of the discourse and the different ideas that people can share on the service. And that is something that, as long as I'm running the company, I'm going to be committed to ensure that is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Do you want a break now? <laughs> or do you want to keep going? <laughs> sure. I mean, that was, that was pretty good. So, all right. All right. We have uh, Senator uh, Whitehouse is up next. But if you want to take a, a yeah. five-minute break right now, uh, we have now been going a good two hours. So thank you. Uh, we'll be uh, we'll recess for five minutes and, and uh, reconvene. You're watching live coverage of testimony on Capitol Hill. Mark Zuckerberg before two Senate panels, Judiciary and Commerce, and we've only gotten partway through the 40-plus senators who will get a chance to ask him questions this afternoon. This is live coverage from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm joined by our technology columnist, Jeffrey Fowler. Thanks so much for watching, Jeffrey. And also, Karin Demergen, who's a congressional correspondent. You know, I, I want to start out by just getting your takeaway, Jeff, because you've been watching Mark Zuckerberg perform in public for years. You've been watching Facebook. Uh, what's your big takeaway so far today? He's been boring. And the senators, frankly, have not had very dynamic questions, ex with the exception of a couple. Right. There have been a couple of times when, um, when we, we should talk about those cases where there were some good gotchas. Um, but beyond that, he's been boring. It's been technical. And that's the goal. And that's kind of the goal. That's how Facebook got 2.2 billion people to hand over so much personal data in the first place. Make it complicated. Make it, make it not fun. Okay, Karen. Just like the motto change, right? That, that, that was one more one. The motto change is a perfect example. Right, where you go yeah. from uh, move fast and break things to move fast with stable infrastructure. And Absolutely. I think that's clearly yeah, what yeah. he's, it's supposed to be the mature Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. that's on that uh, hot seat. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, there are, have been a couple moments, though, where senators have given more pointed questions. I frankly felt like a lot of senators were revealing their ignorance of how Facebook works in terms of like what a user might ask versus what someone who 
has gotten prepped, might ask. There was a <clears throat> there was a funny combination of like really like sort of ignorant questions and some really very highly specific ones that were clearly written by a twenty something on the staff of one of yeah. these senators about very specific um, issues that Facebook has. One of the the most interesting ones to me as a nerd, uh, the nerd on this panel, um, was that uh, he was asked if Facebook continues to track uh, people even when they're logged out of their browser and. Um, what we learned today is when Zuckerberg doesn't want to answer a question, he's like, I need to consult for the technical with my technical team to make sure we're accurate on that, which just means that he doesn't want to say I mean, the real answer. It seems like something that would be no. you should fairly know. basic. It yes, is no. to understand, yes. Yes. He just didn't want to answer it. So we saw a fair amount of that today. Were you surprised by pushback or lack of pushback from senators? I mean, in that Q&A in particular? Uh, th that, that one, I was also surprised to see how senators sometimes the interest of being able to hit a lot of different points to make sure that they had covered everything moved away too quickly. Um, John Cornyn actually had this fairly interesting exchange going where he was talking about how much artificial intelligence would actually change the, the, the way that things are done in the future about policing this better and more in real time. And then he kind of cut him off and was like, I have to move on, I have to move on, I only have two minutes left. And so you, you missed having a complete discussion, even when you started having complete discussions, about things that would actually change the way that the company operates and that they, you know, the, 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 ter the terms on which they operate with users in the future. Can we talk about this Dick Durbin question? Absolutely. <laughs> so my favorite moment, now sadly, I think this came after a lot of the, the TV networks had already cut away, so um, maybe America didn't really get a chance to see They're this. They're watching here, Jeff. But we're watching here, that's right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Dick Durbin said to, to, to Zuckerberg, hey, would you please tell us where you, where you stayed last night, what hotel? And what was amazing was to see Zuckerberg sort of like not, like you could watch the gears in his head go, as he was processing that, not wanting to answer it, and essentially saying, no, I don't want to tell you where I slept last night. And then the point being, well, why are you collecting all of that data um, about Facebook users? And then Zuckerberg, we saw, in response, sort of retreated to the same stuff we've been seeing for 14 years, which is, oh, but we give you controls over how to publicize that, that information. Not really willing to engage with the, sort of the emotion of that question, which is, we're creeped out by you, sir. Stop yeah. doing that. And he could see where that was going. I think it was, that was why there was that pause there of the, wait, 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 how do I answer this without coming off seeming like I'm obtuse, right? But, but again, it, he, he is reverting back to, like you said, just the, the standard stock answer whenever he's kind of caught in those headlights. Let's go to Capitol Hill. Our colleague Jordan Frazier is there right outside the hearing room. Jordan, I want to get your impressions of this as someone who covers Congress on a regular basis. Are you hearing some clear lines of how Democrats and, Republican, and Republicans are breaking down their line of questioning? Yeah, so Libby, we are still here in the back hallway. The hearing room is just here. And, you know, this long hearing, senators have been kind of coming and going as, as it goes on. And we've caught up with a few of them as they've left the hearing to go to other meetings and other uh, activities here on Capitol Hill. In particular, we talked to Lindsey Graham, who during the hearing, you heard him raise a lot of concern about regulation and how the industry can be regulated and what suggestions Facebook might have for that. And when he came out here and we asked him about that exchange, he said, you know, really take with a grain of salt what Facebook has to say as far as suggestions about regulation because he really doesn't believe that you can trust the industry, which he called a monopoly, to really give meaningful suggestions on regulations. And at the end of the day, Lindsey Graham said, you know, he hasn't learned much out of this hearing, it, you know, similar to what, what you all have been discussing. We also caught up with Florida Senator uh, Bill Nelson, and uh, he talked about, you know, we asked him, would you be comfortable giving your own personal data to Facebook after what you've heard so far today? And he gave a very simple answer. He said no. So I don't know that many of the senators are overly impressed with what they've heard thus far. Again, we're only halfway through. We've got we've got a lot more to a lot more to get to. But so far, uh, not a resounding success, I would say, here on Capitol Hill. And we'll go right back to that hearing as soon as it gets back underway. You know, Senator Nelson said to Mark Zuckerberg, if you do not get your act in order, none of us are going to have any privacy anymore. And that was one of the first things we heard as this hearing got underway today, Jeffrey. Yeah, there were a couple of moments early on where I was kind of surprised that we were getting to a little bit closer to the, to the core of the issue, getting to these questions about what is Facebook's business model, having him sort of explain and defend it. I think that's a that's a that's a, an important part of this conversation. I don't think it sort of um, stopped stopped suck up at all, but it was an important part of the conversation. Another related moment was when um, I forget which senator it was asked him if there would ever 
there be a paid version of Facebook? That's the topic that we were talking about earlier. I wrote my column about last week and was very interesting. Zuckerberg said there will always be a free Facebook, but he didn't close the door on a on a paid one. And I think that's a fascinating kind of door for Facebook to open as as a way to maybe through the product, deal with some of this criticism. Yeah, Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah, who's a Republican, um, was bringing up this question uh, the, you know, about, well, if there's always a free service, where will the money come from? And Zuckerberg was sort of like, well, duh, advertisers. Yes, ads and right. ads are really one of the most important elements to this conversation, not just because of the concerns over Russian propaganda and ads that were planted, but also because if we're the product, if, if, if we're what's being spot and sold, it's the ads that can target people like us online. Right, and that's exactly what they were discussing in more detail with other senators that I think were a little bit more savvy maybe to the way that Facebook actually works, and they were asking questions about, well, you know, having your specified, um, have those, having those ads catered to you specifically because it scraped your other information from Facebook or those of your friends and whether they were comfortable with that or not. So yeah, the ads are kind of the centerpiece of this game. The one um, piece of legislation that seems to have gotten some support is called the Honest Ads Act. I mean, ads are pretty pretty front and center in this whole right. debate right now. now. The Honest Ads Act obviously is about political advertising yes, yes, trying yes, yes, yes. to disclose who is <clears throat> who's the money behind it. Um, the other ad conversation is, um, to, to put it another way, about sort of the, the perverse incentive that Facebook has in the first place to do all this tracking, to want to know where you slept last night. That's, th th that's sort of the core problem. And then that leads to all these other problems. Why does it have so much data? What happens when it loses the data? How does it police the data? Um, how does it um, potentially allow advertisers, including malicious ones, right. um, manipulate us because they can even get to our emotional states? But in a way, this all goes back to kind of the, the visual of those senators that are holding up the terms of the service agreement. And, you know, does it, do people actually read this? And Mark Zuckerberg is saying, yeah, of course, they're not actually reading it. There is a disconnect between how people think about Facebook and what th Facebook thinks about it itself. It's a company. It needs to make money. It needs to be able to keep going. And we think about it as just kind of extension of ourselves. And this then goes back to that whole, you know, get smart idea of what, what are you actually doing with your stuff that you put online. And don't do defaults. I, I, right. Don't do defaults. Right. But I don't know if this is actually going to lead to any sort of legislation because it does seem like the senators are coming at it from every which way and don't really have an organized. Uh, uh, they're not trying to push a plan right now because they clearly don't have one that they all agree on. Yeah, but well, let's ask Jordan about that. Yeah, let's ask Jordan about that. Jordan, do you get a sense that Republicans and Democrats are aligning among one major thrust or push? It, it certainly doesn't sound like that from where we're sitting because they are having to do this, yeah. you know, a scattershot approach to so many questions. Right, and I think that's part of the number of senators and the time constraints we're looking at with this. I think if you look kind of beyond this hearing and sort of in Capitol Hill in general, I think it does go back to how this impacts elections and campaign ads and things like that. When we spoke to Lindsey Graham, he kind of mentioned something about that specifically. You'll remember in the 2016 election, there was the whole Pizzagate scandal that kind of went viral on Facebook and on social media, and it resulted in, in a shooting actually here in Washington. Lindsey Graham wanted to bring that up to Mark Zuckerberg because the point he wanted to make, as he told reporters later, was that, you know, that's only possible on social media. Legacy media companies like a newspaper, a broadcast outlet, we have more standards than uh, someone, you know, pushing a share button on on Facebook and making something go viral. And he, he's using that as justification for the need to regulate a platform like Facebook because it needs to have a standard so these, these phony stories that cause real-life consequences uh, don't go viral. So that's where I think both Democrats and Republicans will end up with this. Uh, we're nowhere near that yet, but I think that's the definitely dire the direction we're headed. Yeah. I think it's, technology is probably going to get there before regulation from, in a legislative form, can. I mean, this is the problem in general with the federal government. They pass laws, they get antiquated because the technology outpaces them, and then they don't know what to do or how to apply the old laws to the modern tools, and you end up in situations like this. So that's why I was bringing up the corn conversation. That was an interesting point that we didn't actually get to hear the whole thing of, and it matters. Great point. And we do see Mark Zuckerberg coming back into the chamber. You know, I, I want to point out stock price of Facebook doing quite well today. Uh, we'll leave you with that as we get back underway to this hearing. Before I call on Senator Whitehouse, uh, Senator uh, Feinstein asked permission to
to put letters and statements in the record, and without uh, objection, they will be put in from the ACLU, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, the Association for Computing, <coughs> Computing Machinery Public Policy Council, and Public Knowledge. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to correct one thing that I said earlier in response to a question from Senator Leahy. Um, he had asked if uh, why we didn't ban Cambridge Analytica at the time when we learned about them in 2015, and I answered that uh, what, my, what my understanding was was that they were not on the platform, were not an app developer or advertiser. Um, when I went back and, and met with my team afterwards, they let me know that Cambridge Analytica actually did start as an advertiser later in 2015, so we could have, in theory, banned them then. We made a mistake by not doing so, but I just wanted to make sure that I updated that and because I, I, I misspoke or got that wrong earlier. White House. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome back, Mr. Zuckerberg. On the subject of um, bans, I just wanted to explore a little bit what these bans mean. Uh, obviously, Facebook has been done considerable reputational damage by its association with Alexander Kogan and with Cambridge Analytica, which is one of the reasons you're having this enjoyable afternoon with us. Um, your testimony says that Alexander Kogan's app has been banned. Has he also been banned? Yes, my understanding is he has. Um, so if he were to open up another account under a name and you were able to find it out, that would be taken, that would be closed down. Senator, I believe we, we are preventing him from building any more apps. Does he have a Facebook account still? Uh, Senator, I believe the answer to that is no, uh, but I can follow up with you afterwards. Okay. And with respect to Cambridge Analytica, your testimony is that First, you required them to formally certify that they had deleted all improperly acquired data. Where did that formal certification take place? That sounds kind of like a quasi-official thing to formally certify. What did that entail? Senator, first, uh, they sent us an email notice from their chief data officer uh, telling us that they didn't have any of the data anymore, that they deleted it and weren't using it. And then later, we followed up with, I believe, a full legal uh, contract where they certified that they had deleted the data. In a legal contract? Yes, I believe so. Okay. And then um, you ultimately said that you have banned Cambridge Analytica. Um, who exactly is banned? What if they opened up Cranston, Rhode Island Analytica? Um, different corporate form, same enterprise. Would that enterprise also be banned? Senator, that is certainly the intent. Uh, Cambridge Analytica actually has a parent company, and we banned the parent company, and recently we also banned a firm called AIQ, which I think is also associated with them. Uh, and if we find other firms that are associated with them, we will block them from the platform as well. Our individual principles, PALS principles of the firm, also banned? Senator, my understanding is we're blocking them from doing business on the platform, but I do not believe that we're blocking people's personal accounts. Okay. Um, can any customer amend your terms of service, or is the terms of service a take-it-or-leave-it proposition for the average customer? Senator, I think the terms of service are what they are, but the service is really defined by people because you get to choose what information you share and the whole service is about which friends you connect to, which people yeah, you choose to connect to. My question would relate to Senator Graham held up that big fat document. It's easy to put a lot of things buried in a document that then later turn out to be of consequence. And all I wanted to establish with you is that that document that Senator Graham held up that is not a negotiable thing with individual uh, customers. That is a take-it-or-leave-it proposition for your customers to sign up to or not use the service. 
Senator, that's right on the terms of service, yeah. although we offer a lot of controls so people can configure the experience how they want. So um, last question on a different subject having to do with the authorization process that you are undertaking for entities that are putting up political content or so-called issue ad content. Um, you've said that they all have to go through an authorization process before they do it. You said here, we will be verifying the identity. How do you look behind a shell corporation and find who's really behind it through your authorization process? Well, step back. Do you need to look behind shell corporations in order to find out who is really behind the content that's being posted, and if you may need to look behind a shell corporation, how will you go about doing that? How will you get back to the true, what lawyers would call beneficial owner of the site that is putting out the uh, political material? Senator, are you referring to the verification of political and issue ads? Yes. And before that, political ads, yes. Yes. So what we're going to do is require a valid government identity and we're going to verify uh, the location. So we're going to do that so that way someone sitting in Russia, for example, um, couldn't say that they're in America and therefore able to run an election ad. But if they were running through a corporation domiciled in Delaware, you wouldn't know that they were actually a Russian owner. Senator, that's, that's correct. Okay, thank you. My time has expired and I appreciate the courtesy of the chair for the extra seconds. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, I wanted to follow up on a statement that you made shortly before the break just a few minutes ago. Uh, you said that there are some categories of speech, some types of content that Facebook would never want to have any part of and it takes active steps uh, to avoid disseminating, including hate speech, nudity, uh, uh, racist speech. Uh, I, I assume you also meant uh, terrorist acts, uh, threats of physical violence, things like that. Uh, beyond that, would you agree that Facebook ought not be putting its thumb on the scale with regard to the content of speech, assuming it fits out of one of those categories that, that's prohibited? Senator, yes. There are generally two categories of content that, that we're very worried about. One are things that could cause real-world harm. So terrorism certainly fits into that. Um, Self-harm fits into that. I would consider election interference to fit into that. And those are the types of things that we, I, I don't really consider there to be much discussion around whether those are good or bad sure. topics. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not disputing that. Uh, uh, what I'm asking is, once you get beyond those categories of things that are prohibited and should be, uh, is it Facebook's position that it should not be putting its thumb on the scale? It should not be favoring or disfavoring speech based on its content, based on the viewpoint of that speech? Senator, in general, that's our position. What we... One of the things that is really important, though, is that in order to create a service where everyone has a voice, uh, we also need to make sure that people aren't bullied or, um, or basically intimidated or the environment feels unsafe for them. Okay. So uh, when you say in general, that's, that's the, the exception that you're referring to, uh, uh, the exception being that if someone feels bullied, even if it's not a terrorist act, uh, nudity, terrorist threats, racist speech, or something like that, uh, you, you might step in there. Beyond that, would you step in and put your thumb on the scale as far as the viewpoint uh, of the content uh, being posted? Uh, Senator, no. I mean, in general, our, our goal is to allow people to have as much expression as possible. Okay. So subject to the exceptions we've discussed, uh, you, you would stay out of that. Let me ask you this. Isn't there a significant free market incentive that a social media company, including yours, has in order to safeguard the data of your users? Don't you have free market incentives in yep. that respect? Senator, yes. Does, don't your interests align with, with those of us here who want to see data safeguarded? Absolutely. Do you have the technological means uh, uh, available at your disposal to make sure that that doesn't happen and to, to protect, uh, say, an app developer? Um, from transferring Facebook data to a third party? Senator, a lot of that we do, and some of that happens outside of our systems and will require new measures. So, for example, what we saw here was people chose to share information with an app developer. That worked according to how the system was designed. 
that information was then transferred out of our system to servers that this developer, Alexander Kogan, had. And then that person chose to then go sell the data uh, to Cambridge Analytica. That is going to require much more active intervention and auditing from us to prevent going forward, because once it's out of our system, it is a lot harder for us to uh, have a full understanding of what's happening. From what you've said today and from previous statements made by you and, and other officials at your company, data is at the center of your business model. It's, it's how you make money. Your ability uh, to run your business effectively, given that you don't charge your users, uh, is based on monetizing data. And so the, the, the real issue, it seems to me, uh, really comes down to what you tell the public, what you tell users of Facebook about what you're going to do with the data, about how you're going to use it. Uh, can, you, can you give me a couple of examples, maybe two examples, of ways uh, in which data uh, is collected by Facebook uh, in a way that people are not aware of? Um, two examples of uh, types of data that Facebook collects that might be surprising to, to Facebook users. Well, Senator, I would hope that what we do with data is not surprising to people. And has it been at times? Um, well, Senator, I think in, in this case, people certainly didn't expect this developer to sell the data to Cambridge Analytica. Um, in general, there, there are two types of data that, uh, that Facebook has. The vast majority, and then the first category, is content that people chose to share on the service themselves. So that's all the photos that you share, the posts that you make, what you think of as the Facebook service. Right? That's, everyone has control every single time that they go to share that. They could delete that data anytime they want. Full control, the majority of the data. The second category is around specific data that we collect in order to make the advertising experiences better and more relevant and work for businesses. And those often revolve around measuring, okay, if, you, if we showed you an ad and then you click through and you go somewhere else, we can measure uh, that you actually, uh, that, that, the, that the ad worked. That helps make the experience more relevant and better for uh, for people who are getting more relevant ads and better for the businesses because they perform better. You also have control completely of that second type of data. You can turn off the ability for Facebook to collect that. Your ads will get worse, so a lot of people don't want to do that. Uh, but you have complete control over what you do there as well. Senator Schatz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on the questions around the terms of service. Your terms of service are about 3,200 words with 30 links. One of the links is to your data policy, which is about 2,700 words with 22 links. And I think the point has been well made that people really have no earthly idea what they're signing up for. And I understand that at the present time that's legally binding, but I'm wondering if you can explain to the billions of users in plain language, what are they signing up for? Senator, that's a, a good and important question here. In general, you know, you, you sign up for the Facebook. You get the ability to share the information that you want with, with people. That's what the service is, right, is that uh, you can connect with the people that you want and you can share whatever content uh, matters to you, whether that's photos or links or posts. Um, and you get control over who you share it with, and you can take it down if you want, and you don't need to put anything up in the first place if you don't want. Um, what about the part that people are worried about, not the fun part? Well... What's that? The, uh, the part that people are worried about is that the data is going to be improperly used. So people are trying to figure out, uh, are your DMs informing the ads? Uh, are your browsing habits uh, being collected? Everybody kind of understands that when you click like on something, or if you say you like a certain movie or have a, a particular political proclivity, that I think that's fair game. Everybody understands that. What we don't understand exactly, because both as a matter of practice and as a matter of not being able to decipher those terms of service and the privacy policy, is what exactly are you doing with the data, and do you draw a distinction between uh, data collected in the process of utilizing the platform and that which we clearly volunteer to the public to present ourselves to other Facebook users? Senator, I'm not sure I, I fully understand this. In, in general, you're, you're, you, people come to Facebook to share content with other people. We use that in order to also 
uh, inform how we rank services like newsfeed and ads to provide more relevant experience. Let, let me let me try a couple of specific examples. If I'm email if I'm emailing emailing within WhatsApp, does that ever inform your advertisers? No, we don't see any of the content in WhatsApp. It's fully encrypted. Right, but the, is there some algorithm that spits out some information to your ad platform? And then, let's say I'm emailing about Black Panther uh, within WhatsApp. Do I get a WhatsApp? Do I get a Black Panther uh, banner ad? Senator, we don't. Facebook systems do not see the content of messages being transferred over WhatsApp. Yeah, I know, but that's that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking about whether these systems talk to each other without a human being touching it. Senator, I think the answer to your specific question is if you message someone about Black Panther and WhatsApp, it would not inform uh, any ads. Okay. Uh, I want to follow up on Senator Nelson's original question, which is the question of ownership of the data. And I understand as a sort of matter of principle, you're saying, you know, we want our customers to have more rather than less control over the data. But I can't imagine that it's true as a legal matter that I actually own my Facebook data because you're the one monetizing it. Um, do you want to modify that to sort of express that as a statement of principle, a sort of aspirational uh, goal? But it doesn't seem to me that uh, we own our own data, otherwise we'd be getting a cut. Well, Senator, you own it in the sense that you choose to put it there, you could take it down any time, and you completely control the terms under which it's used. When you put it on Facebook, you are granting us a license to be able to show it to other people. I mean, that's necessary in order for the service to operate. Right, but the, so the, the, so your definition of ownership is I sign up, um, I voluntarily, and I may delete my account if I wish, but that's basically it. Uh, well, Senator, I, I think that the control is much more granular than that. You can choose uh, each photo that you want to put up or each message, um, and you can delete those. And you don't need to delete your whole account. You have specific control. You can share different posts with different in the, people. In the time I have left, I want to I want to propose something to you and take it for the record. Uh, I read an interesting article this week by Professor Jack Balkin at Yale uh, that proposes a concept of an information fiduciary. People think of fiduciaries as responsible primarily in the uh, economic sense, but this is really about a trust relationship like doctors and lawyers, tech companies, uh, should hold in trust our personal data. Are you open to the idea of a information fiduciary enshrined in statute? Senator, I think it's certainly an interesting idea, and Jack is very thoughtful in this space, so I, I do think it deserves consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> for uh, Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here today. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, the full scope of a Facebook user's activity can print a um, very personal picture, I think. And additionally, you have those two billion uh, users that are out there every month, and so we all know that's larger than the population of most countries. So how many data categories do you store? Does Facebook store on the categories that you collect? Senator... Can you clarify what you mean by data well, there's, categories? Well, there's some past reports that have been out there that indicate that it, that Facebook collects about 96 data categories for those 2 billion active users. That's 192 billion data points that are being generated, I think, at any time uh, from consumers globally. So how many do you, does Facebook store out of that? Do you store any? Senator, I'm not actually sure what that is referring to. On, on the points that you collect uh, information, if we call those categories, how many do you store of information that you are collecting? Senator, the, the way I think about this is this. I, I, this probably doesn't line up with whatever the, the specific report that you were seeing is, and I can make sure that we follow up with you afterwards to get you the information you need on that. The two broad categories that I think about are content that a person has chosen to share and that they have complete control over. They get to control when they put it into the service, when they take it down, um, who sees it. And then the other category are data that are connected to uh, making the ads relevant. You have complete control over both. 
You can turn off the data related to ads. You, you can choose not to share any content or control exactly who sees it or take down the content in the former category. And do you, does Facebook store any of that? Yes. How much do you store of that? All of it? All of it? Everything we click on? Is that in storage somewhere? Senator, we store data about what people share on the service and information that's required to do ranking better, to show you what you care about a news feed. Do you, do you store uh, text history, user content, um, activity, device location? Senator, some of that content, with people's permission, we do store. Do you um, disclose any of that? Yes, it, it, Senator, in order to, for people to share that information with Facebook, I, I believe that almost everything that you just said would be opt-in. Right. And the privacy settings, it's my understanding that they limit the sharing of that data with other Facebook users. Is that correct? Senator, yes. Okay. Every person gets to control who gets to see their content. And does that also limit the ability for Facebook to collect and use it? Senator, yes, there are other, uh, there are controls that uh, determine what Facebook can do as well. So for example, people have a control about face recognition. If people don't want us to uh, be able to help identify when they're in photos that their friends upload, um, they can turn that off. Right. And, and then we won't store that kind of template for them. And. And there was uh, some action taken by the FTC in 2011. And you wrote a Facebook post at the time um, it, on a public page on the internet that it used to seem scary to people. But as long as they could make their page private, they felt safe sharing with their friends online. Control was key. And you just mentioned control. Uh, Senator Hatch, um, um, ask you a question and you responded there about complete control. So you and your company have used that term repeatedly and I believe you use it to reassure users, is that correct? That you do have control and complete control over this information? Well, Senator, this is how the service works. Is I mean, the core thing that Facebook is, and all of our services, WhatsApp, right. Instagram, Messenger, so is this, a, is this then a question of uh, Facebook is about feeling safe or are users actually safe? Is Facebook, is Facebook being safe? Senator, I think Facebook is safe. I use it and my family use it and all the people I love and care about use it all the time. These controls are not just to make people feel safe, it's actually what people want in the product. The reality is, is that when you I mean, just think about how you use this yourself. You don't want to share, like you take a photo, you're not going to always send that to the same people. Sometimes you're going to want to text it to one person. Sometimes you might send it to a group. I bet you have a page. You'll probably want to put stuff, some stuff out there publicly so you can communicate with your constituents. There are all these different groups of people that someone might want to connect with, and those controls are very important in practice for the operation of the service, not just to build trust, although I think that they, providing people with control also does that, but actually in order to make it so that people can fulfill their goals with the service. Senator Coons. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for joining us today. I think the whole reason we're having this hearing is because of a tension between two basic principles you've laid out. Uh, first, you've said about the data that users post on Facebook. You control and own the data that you put on Facebook. You've said some very positive, optimistic things about privacy and data ownership. But it's also the reality that Facebook is a for-profit entity that generated $40 billion in ad revenue last year by targeting ads. In fact, Facebook claims that advertising makes it easy to find the right people, capture their attention, and get results. And you recognize that an ad-supported service is, as you said earlier today, best aligned with your mission and values. But the reality is there's a lot of examples where ad targeting has led to results that I think we would all uh, disagree with or dislike or would concern us. Uh, you've already admitted that Facebook's own ad tools allowed Russians to target users, voters, 
based on racist or anti-Muslim or anti-immigrant views, and that that may have played a significant role in an election here in the United States. Just today, Time Magazine posted a story saying that wildlife traffickers are continuing to use Facebook tools to advertise illegal sales of protected animal parts. And I am left questioning whether your ad targeting tools would allow other concerning practices like diet pill manufacturers targeting teenagers who are struggling with their weight or allowing a liquor distributor to target alcoholics or a gambling organization to target those with gambling problems. Um, I'll give you one concrete example. I'm sure you're familiar with ProPublica back in 2016. Um, highlighted that Facebook lets advertisers exclude users by race in real estate advertising. Um, there was a way that you could say that this particular ad, I only want to be seen by white folks, not by people of color. And that clearly violates fair housing laws and our basic sense of fairness in the United States. And you uh, promptly announced that uh, that was a bad idea, you were going to change the tools, and that you would build a new system to spot and reject discriminatory ads that violate our commitment to fair housing. And yet a year later, a follow-up story by ProPublica said that those changes hadn't fully been made, and it was still possible to target uh, housing advertisement in a way that was racially discriminatory. And my concern is that this practice of making bold and, and engaging promises about changes in practices and then the reality of how Facebook has operated in the real world uh, are in persistent tension. Several different senators have asked earlier today about the 2011 FTC consent decree that required Facebook to better protect users' privacy. Uh, and there are a whole series of examples uh, where there have been things brought to your attention, where Facebook has apologized and has said we're going to change our practices and our policies, uh, and yet um, there doesn't seem to have been as much follow-up as would be called for. At the end of the day, policies aren't worth the paper they're written on if Facebook doesn't enforce them. And I'll close with a question that's really rooted in an experience I had today as an avid Facebook user. I woke up this morning uh, and was notified by a whole group of friends across the country uh, asking if I had a new family or if there was a fake Facebook post of Chris Coons. I went to the one they suggested. It had a different middle initial than mine. Uh, and there's my picture with Senator Dan Sullivan's family. Same schools I went to, but a whole lot of Russian friends. Dan Sullivan's got a very attractive family, by the way. And you keep that for the record there, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> The friends who brought this to my attention included uh, people I went to law school with in Hawaii and our own attorney general in the state of Delaware. And fortunately, I've got you know great folks who work in my office. I brought it to their attention. They pushed Facebook, and it was taken down by midday. Uh, but I'm left worried about what happens to Delawareans who don't have these resources. It's still possible to find Russian trolls operating in the platform. Hate groups thrive in some areas of Facebook, even though your policies prohibit hate speech and you've taken strong steps against extremism and terrorists. But is a Delawarean who's not in the Senate going to get the same sort of quick response? I've already gotten input from other friends who say they've had trouble getting a positive response when they've brought to Facebook's attention a page that's, um, frankly, clearly violent of your basic principles. My core question is, isn't it Facebook's job to better protect its users? And why do you shift the burden to users to flag inappropriate content and make sure it's taken down? Senator, there are a number of important points in there. And I think it's clear that this is an area, content policy enforcement, that we need to do a lot better on over time. Mm -hmm. The history of how we got here is we started off um, in my dorm room with not a lot of resources and not having the AI technology to be able to proactively identify a lot of this stuff. So just because of the sheer volume of content, um, the main way that this works today is that people report things to us and then we have our team review that. And as I said before, by the end of this year, we're going to have more than 20,000 people at the company working on security and content review because this is important. Over time, we're going to shift increasingly to a method where more of this content is flagged up front by AI tools that we develop. We've prioritized the most important types of content that we can build AI tools for today, like terror-related content, where I mentioned earlier that um, our systems that we deploy, we are taking down 99% of the ISIS and Al-Qaeda-related content that we take down before a person even flags them to us. If we Fast forward five or ten years, I think we're going to have more AI technology that can do that in more areas. 
Um, and I think we need to get there as soon as possible, which is why we're investing in that. I Senator couldn't agree Fred. more. I just think we can't wait five years no, to Senator. get housing discrimination and personally offensive material out of Facebook. Thank I, you, I agree. Chairman. Senator Sass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, thanks for being here. Uh, at current pace, uh, you're due to be round of questioning by about 1 a.m., so congratulations. Um, Chris Coons a lot uh, with his own family or with Dan Sullivan's family. Both are great photos. Uh, but I want to ask a similar set of questions from the other side, maybe. Uh, I think the, the line, the conceptual line between mere tech company, mere tools, and an actual content company, I think it's really hard. I think you guys have a hard challenge. I think regulation over time will have a hard challenge. Um, and you're a private company, so you can make policies uh, that may be uh, less than First Amendment full spirit embracing, in my view. But I worry about that. I worry about a world where when you go from violent groups to hate speech in a hurry, in one of your responses to one of the opening questions, um, you may decide, or Facebook may decide, it needs to police a whole bunch of speech um, that I think America might be better off not having policed by one company that has a really big and powerful platform. Can you define hate speech? Senator, I think that this is a really hard question. And I think it's one of the reasons why we struggle with it. There are certain definitions that, that we that we have around, um, you know, calling for for violence or um, let's just agree on that. If somebody's calling yeah. for violence, we that shouldn't be there. I'm worried about the psychological categories around speech. You, you use language of safety and protection earlier. We see this happening on college campuses all across the country. It's dangerous. Forty percent of Americans under age 35 tell pollsters they think the First Amendment is dangerous because you might use your freedom to say something that hurts somebody else's feelings. Guess what? There are some really passionately held views about the abortion issue on this panel today. Can you imagine a world uh, where you might decide that pro-lifers are prohibited from speaking about their abortion views on your content, on your platform? I certainly would not want that to be the case. But it, it might really be unsettling to people who've had an abortion to have an open debate about that, wouldn't it? It might be, but I don't think that that would, uh, would fit any of the definitions of, of, of what we have. But I do generally agree with the point that you're making, which is as, we sh as we're able to technologically shift towards especially having AI proactively look at content, I think that that's going to create massive questions for society about what obligations we want to require companies to, to fulfill. And, and I do think that that's a question that uh, we need to struggle with as a country, because I know other countries are, and they're putting laws in place. And I, I think that America needs to uh, figure out and create the set of principles that we want American companies to operate under. Thanks. I, I wouldn't want you to leave here today and think there's sort of a unified view in the Congress that you should be moving toward policing more and more and more speech. I think violence has no place on your platform. Uh, sex traffickers and human traffickers have no place on your platform. But vigorous debates, adults need to engage in vigorous debates. I, I have only a little less than two minutes left, so I want to shift gears a little bit. But that was about adults. Um, you're a dad. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about social media addiction. You started uh, your comments today. Today by talking about how Facebook is and was founded as an optimistic company. You and I have had conversations separate from here. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think as you've aged, you might be a little bit less idealistic and optimistic uh, than you were when you, when you started Facebook. As a dad, uh, do you worry about social media addiction as a problem for America's teens? Well, my hope is, is that we can be idealistic but have a broad view of our responsibility. Uh, to your, your point about teens, this is certainly something that I think any parent thinks about, is how much do you want your kids using technology? It, 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 at Facebook specifically, uh, I view our responsibility as not just building services that people like, but building services that are good for people and good for society as well. So we study a lot of effects of well-being of our, of our tools and broader technology. And, you know, like any tool, um, there are good and, and bad uses of it. What we find in general is that if you're using social media uh, in order to build relationships, right, so you're, you're sharing content with friends, you're interacting, then that is associated with all of the long-term measures of well-being that you would intuitively think of. Long-term health, long-term happiness, long-term feeling connected, feeling less lonely. But if you're using the Internet and social media, 
um, primarily to just passively consume content and you're not engaging with other people, then it doesn't have those positive effects and it could be negative. We're, we're almost at time, so I want to ask you one more. Uh, do social media companies hire consulting firms to help them figure out how to get more dopamine feedback loops so that people don't want to leave the platform? No, Senator. That's not how we talk about this or, or, or how we uh, set up our product teams. We want our products to be valuable to people, and if they're valuable, then people choose to use them. Are you aware of other social media companies that do hire such consultants? Not sitting here today. Thanks. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to Senator Blumenthal's pointed questions, you refuse to answer whether Facebook should be required by law to obtain clear permission from users before selling or sharing their personal information. So I'm going to ask it one more time. Yes or no? Should Facebook get clear permission from users before selling or sharing sensitive information about your health, your finances, your relationships? Should you have to get their permission? That's essentially the consent decree with the Federal Trade Commission that you signed in 2011. Should you have to get permission? Should the consumer have to opt in? Senator, we do require permission to use the, the system and to, to put information in there and for, for all the uses of it. I, I want to be clear, we don't sell information. So regardless of whether we could get permission to do that, that's just not a thing that we're going to go do. So would you support legislation. I have a bill, Senator Blumenthal referred to it, um, the Consent Act, uh, that would just put on the books a law that said that Facebook and any other company that gathers information uh, about Americans has to get their permission, their affirmative permission, before it can be reused for other purposes. Would you support that legislation to make it a national standard for not just Facebook, but for all the other companies out there, some of them bad actors. Would you support that legislation? Senator, I, I, in general, I think that that principle is exactly right, and I think we should have a, a discussion around how to best no, but Would you that. support legislation to back that general principle, that opt-in, that getting permission is the standard? Would you support legislation to make that the American standard? Europeans have passed that as a law. Facebook's going to live... Uh, with that law beginning on May 25th, would you support that as the law in the United States? Senator, as a principle, yes, I would. I think the details matter a lot. Right, and but that... assuming that we work out the details, you do support opt-in as the standard, getting permission affirmatively as the standard for... Is that correct? Senator, I think that that's the right principle. And a hundred billion times a day in our services, when people go to share content, they choose who they want to share so it you, affirmatively. You, you could support a law that enshrines that as the promise that we make to the American people that permission has to be uh, obtained before their information is used. Is that correct? Senator, yes. I, okay. I've said that in principle I think that that makes sense okay. and the details matter. And I look forward to having our team work with you on, on fleshing that out. Right. So... Um, the next subject, because I want to, uh, again, I want to make sure that we kind of drill down here. Uh, you, you earlier made reference to the Child Online Privacy Protection Act of 1999, which I am the author of. So that is the Constitution for Child Privacy Protection Online in the country, and I'm very proud of that. But there are no protections, additionally, for a 13, a 14, or a 15-year-old. They get the same protections that a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old get. So I have a separate piece of legislation uh, to ensure that kids who are under 16 absolutely have a privacy bill of rights and that um, permission has to be received from their parents or the children before any of their information is reused for any other purpose other than that which was originally intended. Would you support a child online privacy bill of rights for kids under 16 to guarantee that that information uh, is not reused for any other purpose without explicit permission from the parents or the kids? Senator, I think the 
As a general principle, I think protecting, pe protecting minors and protecting their privacy is extremely important. And we do a number of things on Facebook to do that already, which I'm happy to get I, and I appreciate that I'm helps. talking about a law. I, I'm talking about a law. Would you support a law to ensure that kids under 16 have this pri I, Privacy Bill of Rights? I had this conversation with you in your office seven years ago about this specific subject in Palo Alto. Um, and, uh, and I think that's really what the American people want to know right now. What is the protections? Uh, this, uh, what are the protections that are going to be put on the books for their families, but especially for their children? Would you support a privacy bill of rights for kids where opt-in is the standard? Yes or no? Senator, I think that that's an important principle. And I appreciate I think, that. And I think we should... Do we need a law to protect those children? That's my question, too. Do you believe we need a law to do so? Yes or no? Senator, I'm not sure if we need a law, but I think that this is certainly a thing that, 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 that deserves a lot of discussion. I, and I, 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 again, I couldn't disagree with you more. Other, we're leaving these children to the most rapacious commercial predators in the country who will exploit these children unless we absolutely have a law on the books. Please, and and I think it is absolutely... Please give, a short, please give a short answer. Senator, I look forward to having my team follow up to flesh out the details of it. I don't think this is a Senator difficult Flake. Senator issue Flake. to get a correct, a correct answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Thanks for enjoying so far. And uh, I'm sorry if I plow old ground. I had to be away for a bit. Uh, I, myself and uh, Senator Kuhn, Senator Peters, and a few others were in the country of Zimbabwe just a few days ago. Uh, we met with opposition figures uh, who had talked about, you know, their goal is to be able to have access to state-run media in many African countries, many countries around the world, third world countries, small countries, the only traditional media is state-run. And we asked them how they get their message out, and it's through social media. Uh, Facebook provides a very valuable service uh, in many countries for opposition leaders or others who simply don't have access unless maybe just before an election, uh, to traditional media. Um, so that's, that's very valuable, and I think we all recognize that. On the flip side, what we've seen with the Rohingya, that example of uh, you know, where the state can use similar data or use this platform had to go after people. You talked about uh, what you're doing in that regard, hiring more uh, um, you know, traditional or uh, local language speakers. What else are you doing in that regard to ensure that uh, uh, these states don't, uh, or these governments go, go after uh, opposition figures or others? Senator, there are three main things that we're doing in Myanmar specifically, and that will apply to, to other situations like that. The first is hiring en uh, enough people to do local language support, because the definition of hate speech or things that can be racially coded to uh, incite violence are very language specific and we can't do that with just English speakers for people around the world so we need to grow that. The second is in these countries there tend to be active civil society who can help us identify um, the figures who are, um, who are spreading hate and we can work with them in order to make sure that those figures don't have a place on our platform. The third is that there are specific product changes uh, that we can make in order to uh, that, that might be necessary in some countries, but not others, including things around um, news literacy, right? And in, like in, encouraging uh, people in, in different countries uh, about you know, ramping up or down um, you know, things that, that we might do around fact checking um, of, of content, specific product type things um, that we would want to implement in different places. But I think that that's something that we're going to have to do in a number of countries. There are obviously limits of uh, you know, native speakers that you can hire or uh, people that have eyes on the page. Uh, artificial intelligence is going to have to take the bulk of this. How, uh, you know, how much are you investing and in working on, on uh, that tool to, to do what really... Um, we don't have or can't hire enough people to do. Senator, I think you're absolutely right that over the long term, building AI tools is going to be the scalable way to identify and root out most of this harmful content. Mm -hmm. uh, we're investing a lot in doing that, as well as scaling up the number of people who are doing content review. Um, you know, one of the things I've mentioned is in this year, we're 
uh, or in the last year, we've basically doubled the number of people doing security and content review. We're going to uh, have more than 20,000 people working on security and content review by the end of this year. Um, so it's going to be coupling, continuing to grow the people who are doing review in these places with uh, building AI tools, uh, which is we're, we're working as quickly as we can on that, but some of the stuff is just hard. Um, th that, I think, is going to help us get to a better place on eliminating more of this harmful content. Thank you. Um, you've talked some about this, I know. Do you believe that uh, Russian and or Chinese governments uh, have harvest harvested Facebook data um, and have detailed data sets on Facebook users? Has your f forensic analysis uh, shown you who else other than Cambridge uh, Analytica downloaded this kind of data? Senator, we have kicked off an investigation of every app that had access to a large amount of people's data before we locked down the platform in 2014. That's underway. I imagine we'll find some things, and we are committed to telling the people who are affected when we do. I don't think sitting here today that we have specific knowledge of, of other um, efforts by, by those nation states, but in general, we assume that um, a number of countries are trying to um, abuse our systems. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Person is Senator Hirano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, the U.S. Immigration and Custom Enforcement has proposed a new extreme vetting initiative, which they have renamed Vis Visa Lifecycle Vetting. That sounds less scary. They have already held an industry day that they advertised on the federal contracting web website to get input from tech companies on the best way to, among other things, and I'm quoting ICE, exploit publicly available information such as media, blogs, public hearings, conferences, academic websites, social media websites such as Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn to extract pertinent information regarding targets. And uh, basically what they, the, what they want to do uh, with these targets is to determine, and again I'm quoting the ICE's own uh, document, they want... Uh, ICE has been directed to develop processes that determine and evaluate an applicant's, i.e. target's, probability of becoming a positively contributing member of society, as well as their ability to contribute to national interest in order to meet the executive order, that is the president's executive order. And then ICE must also develop a mechanism or methodology that allows them to assess whether an applicant intends to commit criminal or terrorist acts after entering the United States. The question to you is, does Facebook plan to cooperate with this extreme vetting initiative and help the uh, Trump administration target people for deportation or other ICE enforcement? Senator, I don't know that we've had specific conversations around that. In general... Well, if you were asked to... Um, provide or cooperate with ICE so, so that they could determine whether somebody's going to uh, commit a crime, for example, or become fruitful members of our society, would you cooperate? We would with not that? proactively do that. We cooperate with law enforcement in two cases. One is if we become aware of an imminent threat of harm, then we will proactively reach out to law enforcement, as we believe is our responsibility to do. The other is when law enforcement reaches out to us with a valid um, legal subpoena or, or um, request for data. In those cases, if their request is overly broad or we believe it's not a legal request, then we're going to push back aggressively. Well, let's assume that ICE doesn't have a, a law, there's no law or rule that requires that Facebook cooperate to, to uh, allow them to get this kind of information so that they can make those kinds of assessments. Um, it sounds to me as though uh, you would uh, decline. Senator, that is correct. Is there some way that, um, well, I know that you determine what kind of content would be deemed harmful. So do you believe that ICE can even do what they are talking about, namely uh, through a combination of various kinds of information, including information that they would hope to obtain from entities such as yours, predict who will commit crimes or present a national security problem? Do you think that, that that's even doable? Senator, I'm not familiar enough with what they're doing to offer an informed opinion on that. Well, you have to make assessments as to what constitutes hate speech. That's pretty hard to do. You have to assess um, what election 
interferences. So these are um, rather difficult to identify. But w wouldn't the, trying to predict whether somebody's going to commit a crime fit into a category of a pretty difficult to assess? Senator, it sounds difficult to me. All of these things, like you're saying, are yeah. difficult. Well, I don't know without having worked on it or thinking about it. How I think Congress would make. tell us that that's pretty difficult, and yet that's what ICE is proceeding to do. You were asked about discriminatory advertising, and um, in February of 2017, Facebook announced that it would no longer allow certain kinds of ads uh, that um, discriminated on the basis of race, gender, family status, sexual orientation, disability, or vet veteran status, all categories prohibited by federal law and housing, and yet... After 2017, it was discovered that you could, in fact, place those kinds of ads. So what is the status of whether or not these ads can currently be placed on Facebook? And have you followed through on your February 2017 promise to address this problem? And is there a way for the public to verify that you have, or are we just expected to trust that you've done this? Senator, those are all important questions, and in, in general, it is against our policies to, dis to have any ads that are discriminatory. Well, you Some said that you wouldn't allow it, but then, um, what is it, ProPublica could, could place these ads even after you said you would no longer allow these kinds of ads. So what assurance do we have from you that uh, this is stop, going to stop? Well, two things. One is that we've removed the ability to exclude um, ethnic groups and other sensitive categories from ad targeting. So that just isn't a feature that's even available anymore. For some of these cases uh, where it may make sense to target proactively a group, um, the enforcement today is, is still, we, we review ads, we screen them up front, um, but most of the enforcement today is still that our community flags issues for us when they come up. So if the community flags that issue for us, then uh, our team, which has t uh, thousands of people working on it, oh. um, should take it down. Um, we'll make some mistakes, but we try to make as few as possible. Over time, I think the strategy would be to develop more AI tools that can more proactively identify those types of content and do that filtering up front. So thank it's you. a work in Sen progress. Thank you, Senator Verona. Yeah. Senator Sullivan's thank up you. next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Mr. Zuckerberg, quite a story, right? Dorm room to the global behemoth that you guys are. O only in America. Would you agree with that? Uh, Senator, you, mostly you in could, America. You couldn't, you couldn't do this in China, right? Or what you did well, in 10 years. Well, Senator, there are, there are some very strong Chinese Internet companies. Right, but... You're supposed to answer yes to this question. <laughs> okay, come on. This I'm is, trying to help you, softball. right? I mean, give me a break. You're in front of a bunch of... The answer is yes, okay? So thank you. Um, now, your, your testimony, you have talked about a lot of power. You've been involved in um, elections. I, I thought your, your testimony was very interesting, all, really all over the world. Uh, the Facebook, 2 billion users, over 200 million Americans, 40 billion in revenue. I believe you and Google have almost 75% of the digital advertising in the U.S. Is face, one of the key issues here is, is Facebook too powerful? Are you too powerful? And do you think you're too powerful? Well, Senator, I think most of the time when people talk about our scale, they're referencing that we have 2 billion people in our community. And I think one of the big questions that we need to think through here is the vast majority of those 2 billion people are outside of the U.S. And I think that that's something that, to your point, that Americans should be proud of. Okay, and when I brought up the Chinese Internet companies, Sorry. I think that that's a real, uh, a real strategic and competitive threat that in, in American technology Let policy we should be thinking about. Let me get to another point here about. real quick. I, I, wanna, I, I don't want to interrupt, but... Um... You know, when, when you look at kind of the history of this country and you look at the history of these kind of hearings, right? You're a smart guy. You read a lot of history. When companies become big and powerful and accumulate a lot of wealth and power, what typically happens from this body is there's an there's a, uh, instinct to either regulate or break up, right? 
look at the history of this nation. Um, you have any thoughts on those two uh, policy approaches? Well, Senator, I'm not the type of person who thinks that all regulation is bad. So I think the Internet is becoming increasingly important in people's lives, and I think we need to have a full conversation about what is the right regulation, not whether it should be or shouldn't be. Let me, let me talk about the tension there, because I, I think it's a good point, and I appreciate you mentioning that. You know, my, one of my worries on regulation, again, with a company of your size, you're saying, hey, we might be interested in being regulated, but as you know, regulations can also cement the dominant power. So what do I mean by that? You know, you have a lot of lobbyists. I think every lobbyist in town is involved in this hearing in some way or another. A lot of powerful interests. You look at what happened with Dodd-Frank. That was supposed to be aimed at the big banks. The regulations ended up empowering the big banks and keeping the small banks down. Do you think that that's a risk, given your influence, that if we regulate, we're actually going to regulate into you, you into a position of cemented authority when one of my biggest concerns about what you guys are doing is that the next Facebook, which we all want, the guy in the dorm room, we all want that to start it, that you are becoming so dominant that we're not able to have that next Facebook. What, what, what are your views on that? Well, Senator, I agree with the point that when you're thinking through regulation across all industries, you need to be careful that it doesn't cement in the current companies that are, that are winning. But would you try to do that? Isn't that the normal inclination of a company to say, hey, I'm going to hire the best guys in town and I'm going to cement in an advantage? You wouldn't do that if we were regulating you? Uh, Senator, that, that certainly wouldn't be our approach. But, but I, think, I think part of the challenge with regulation in general, you add more rules that companies need to follow, that's something that a larger company like ours inherently just has the resources to go do, and that might just be harder for a smaller company getting started to be able to comply with. Correct. So it's not something that, like going into this, I would look at the conversation as, what is the right outcome? I think there are real challenges that we face around um, content and privacy and uh, in a number of other areas, adds transparency elections. Let me, let me get, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but let me get to one final question that kind of relates to what you're talking about in terms of content regulation and what exactly, what exactly Facebook is. You know, you, you mentioned you're a tech company, a platform, but there's some who are saying that you're the world's biggest publisher. I think about 140 million Americans get their news from Facebook, and when you talk to, Sen when you mentioned to Senator Cornyn, I. Uh, he, you said you are responsible for your content. So which are you? Are you a tech company? Or are you the world's largest publisher? Because I think that goes to a really important question on what form of regulation or government action, if any, we would take. Senator, this is a, a really big question. I, I, I view us as a tech company because the primary thing that we do is build technology and products. Like you said you're responsible for your content, which makes exactly. you kind of a publisher, right? Well, I agree that we're responsible for the content, but we don't produce the content. I, I think that when people ask us if we're a media company or a publisher, my understanding of what the heart of what they're really getting at is do we feel a responsibility for the content on our platform? The answer to that, I think, is clearly yes. And, but I don't think that that's incompatible with fundamentally at, at our core being a technology company where the main thing that we do is have engineers and build products. Thank you, you Senator Sullivan. Senator Udall. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being uh, here today. You, you spoke uh, very idealistically about your company, and you talked about the strong values, and you said you wanted to be a positive force in the community and the world. Uh, and you were hijacked by Cambridge Analytica for political purposes. Are you angry about that? Absolutely. And, and you're determined, uh, and I assume you want changes made in the law. That's what you've talked about today. Senator, the most important thing that I care about right now is making sure that no one interferes in the various 2018 elections around the world. We have an extremely important U.S. midterm. We have major elections in India, Brazil, Mexico, Pakistan, Hungary coming up. And we're going to take a, a number of measures from building and deploying new AI tools that take down fake news to growing our security team to more than 20,000 people to m making it so that we verify every advertiser who's doing political and issue ads um, to make sure that 
that kind of interference that the Russians were able to do in 2016 is going to be much harder for anyone to pull off in the future. And, and I think you've said earlier that you support the Honest Ads Act, and so I assume that means you want changes in the law in order to, to effectuate exactly what you talked about. Senator, yes, we support yeah. the Honest Ads Act. And so are We're you going to are you going to come back up here and be a strong advocate to see that that law is passed, Senator? The biggest thing that I think we can do is implement it. Well, that's a kind of we're doing yes that. or no question there. I hate to interrupt you, but are you going to come back and be a strong advocate? You're angry about this. You think there ought to be change. There ought to be a law put in place. Are you going to come back and be an advocate to get a law in place like that? Senator, our team is certainly going to work on this. What I can say is the biggest I'm talking thing about I, you, not your team. Just, well, Senator, I try not to come back here to and be an advocate for that law. That's what I want to see. I mean, you're upset about this. We're upset about this. Uh, I like a yes or no answer on that one. Senator, I'm, I'm posting this. Um, I don't come to Washington, D.C. too often. Uh, I'm going to direct my team to focus on this. And the biggest thing that I feel like we can do is implement it, which we're doing. Well, the biggest thing you can do is to be a strong advocate yourself, personally, here in Washington. Just let me make that clear. But many of us have seen the kinds of images shown earlier by Senator Leahy. You saw those images that he held up. Can you guarantee that any of those images that can be attributed or associated with the Russian company, Internet Research Agency, have been purged from your platform? Senator, no, I can't guarantee that because this is an ongoing arms race. As long as there are people sitting in Russia whose job it is is to try to interfere with elections around the world, this is going to be an ongoing conflict. What I can commit is that we're going to invest significantly because this is a top priority to make sure that people aren't spreading misinformation or trying to interfere in elections on Facebook. But I don't think it would be a realistic expectation to assume that as long as there are people who are employed in Russia for whom this is their job, that we're going to have zero amount of that or that we're going to be 100 percent successful at preventing that. Now, beyond disclosure of online ads, what specific steps are you taking to ensure that foreign money is not financing political or issue ads on Facebook in violation of U.S. law. Just because someone submits it a disclosure that says paid for by some 501c3 or PAC, if that group has no real person in the U.S., how can we ensure it is not foreign, interf foreign interference? Senator, our verification program involves two pieces. One is verifying the identity of the person who's buying the ads, that they have a valid government identity. The second is verifying their location. So if you're sitting in Russia, for example, and uh, you say that you're in the U.S., then we'll be able to, uh, to make it a lot harder to do that because what we're actually going to do is mail a code to the address that you say you're at. And if you can't get access to that code, then you're not going to be able to run ads. Yeah. Now, Facebook is creating an independent group to study the abuse of social media in elections. You've talked about that. Will you commit that all findings of this group are made public no matter what they say about Facebook or its business model? Yes or no answer? Senator, that's the purpose of this group, is that Facebook does not get to control uh, what these folks publish. These are going to be independent academics, and Facebook has no prior publishing um, control. They'll be able to do the studies that, that, um, that they're doing and publish the results. And you're fine with them being public. And what's the timing on getting those out? Uh, Senator, we're, we're kicking off the research now. Our goal is to focus on both providing ideas for preventing interference in 2018 and beyond, and also for holding us accountable to making sure that the measures that we put in place um, are, are successful in doing that. So I would hope that we will start to see the first results uh, later this year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Udall. Uh, Senator Moran is up next, and I would just say again, for the uh, benefit of those who are here, that after a couple of more questioners, we'll probably give the witness another short break. So Thank you. We're, we're getting about almost two-thirds through the, uh, the list of uh, members who are here to ask questions. Senator Moran. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you for your, I'm over here, thank you for your testimony and thank you for your presence here today. Um, on March the 26th of this year, the FTC confirmed that it was investigating Facebook to determine 
whether it's privacy practices violated the FTC Act or the consent order that Facebook entered into with the agency uh, in 2011. Uh, I chair the Commerce Committee subcommittee that has jurisdiction over the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, I remain interested in Facebook's assertion that it rejects any suggestion of violating that consent order. Part two of that consent order requires that Facebook, quote, clearly and prominently display notice and obtain users' affirmative consent before sharing their information with, quote, any third party. My question is, how does the case of approximately 87 million Facebook friends having their data shared with a third party due to the consent of only 300,000 consenting users not violate that agreement? Well, Senator, like I said earlier, I mean, our, our view is that, is that we believe that we are, are in compliance with the consent order, but I think that we have a broader responsibility to protect people's even beyond that. And in, in this specific case, the way that you could sign into an app and bring some of your information and some of your friends' information is how we explained it would work. People had settings to that effect. Uh, they, uh, w we explained and, th and they consented to, to it working that way. And the, the system basically worked as it was designed. The issue is that we designed the system in a way that wasn't good. And now we, starting in 2014, have changed the design of the system so that, that way it just massively restricts the amount of um, of data access that a developer can get. The Going forward... Th I'm sorry, the 300,000 people, uh, they were uh, treated in a way that uh, was appropriate. They consented, but you're not suggesting that the friends consented. Senator, I believe that, that we uh, rolled out this developer platform and that we explained to people uh, how it worked and that they did consent to it. Okay. It, it makes sense, I think, to, to go through the, the way the platform works. I mean, it's uh, in 2007, uh, we, we announced the Facebook developer platform, and the idea was that you wanted to make uh, more experiences social. Right? So, uh, for example, if you, like, you might want to have a calendar that can have your friends' birthdays on it, or you might want your address book to have your friends' pictures in it, or you might want a map that can show your friends' addresses on it. In order to do that, we needed to build a tool that allowed people to sign into an app and bring some of their information uh, and some of their friends' information to those apps. We made it very clear that this is how it worked, uh, and, and when people signed up for Facebook, they signed up for that as well. Now, a lot of good use cases came from that. I mean, there were games that were built. Uh, there were integrations with companies that I think we're familiar with, like Netflix and Spotify. But over time, what became clear was that that also enabled some abuse. And that's why in 2014, we took the step of changing the platform so now when people sign into an app, you do not bring some of your friends' information with you. You're only bringing your own information and you're able to connect with friends who have also authorized that app directly. Let me uh, turn to the bug, your bug bounty program. Uh, our subcommittee has had a, hearings in, a hearing in regard to bug bounty. Your press release uh, indicated that was one of the six changes that Facebook initially offered to crack down on platform abuse, abuses was to reward outside parties who find vulnerabilities. Um, one concern I have regarding the utility of this approach is that the vulnerability disclosure programs are normally geared toward identifying unauthorized access to data, not pointing out data sharing arrangement that likely could harm someone, but technically abide by complex consent agreements. How do you see the bug bounty program that you've announced uh, addressing the issue of that? Sorry, could you, could you clarify what, what specific... How do, you, how do you see that the bug bounty program that you are and have announced will deal with the sharing of information not permissible as compared to just unauthorized access to data? Senator, I'm not, uh, I'm not actually sure I, I understand this enough to, to speak to, to that specific point, and I can have my team follow up with you on the details of that. In general... Bounty programs are an important part of the security arsenal for hardening a lot of systems. Uh, I think we should expect that we're going to invest a lot in hardening our systems ourselves and that we're going to audit and investigate a lot of the folks in our ecosystem. But even with that, having the ability to enlist other third parties outside of the company to be able to help us out by giving them an incentive to point out when they see issues I think is likely going to help us improve the security of the platform overall, which is why we did this. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg.
Thank you, Senator Moran. Next up, Senator Booker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, Mr. Zuckerberg. As you know, much of my life has been focused on low-income communities, poor communities, working-class communities, and trying to make sure they have a fair shake. This country has a very bad history of discriminatory practices towards low-income Americans and Americans of color from the redlining, FHA practices, even to more recently, really dis discriminatory practices in the mortgage business. I've always seen technology as a promise to democratize our nation, expand access, expand opportunities. Uh, but unfortunately, we've also seen how platforms, technology platforms like Facebook, uh, can actually be used to double down on discrimination and, and give people more sophisticated t tools with which to discriminate. Now, in, in, 19, in, in 2016, ProPublica revealed that advertisers could use ethnic affinity, uh, a user's race, uh, uh, to market categories to potentially discriminate overall against Facebook users uh, in the areas of housing, employment, and credit, echoing a dark history in this country, uh, in vi and also in violation of federal law. In 2016, Facebook committed to fixing this, that the advertisers who have access to this data, to fixing it. Uh, but unfortunately, a year later, as, as, as ProPublica's article showed, they found that the system Facebook built was still allowing housing ads uh, uh, without uh, uh, applying to go forward without applying these new restrictions that were put on. Uh, Facebook then opted in a system that's very similar to what we've been talking about with uh, Cambridge Analytica, that they could self-certify that they were not engaging in these practices uh, uh, and complying with federal law, using this self-certification uh, way uh, uh, to, to overcome and to comply with, rather, Facebook's uh, anti-discrimination policy. Uh, unfortunately, in a recent lawsuit, um, as of February 2018, uh, alleges that discriminatory ads were still being created on Facebook, still disproportionately impacting low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, given the fact that you allowed Cambridge Analytica to self-certify in a way that I think, at least I think you've expressed regret over, is self-certification the best and strongest way to safeguard guard against the misuse of your platform and protect the data of users and not let it be manipulated in such a discriminatory fashion? Senator, this is a, a, a very Im important question. And, you know, in, in general, I think over time we're going to move towards more proactive review with more AI tools to help flag problematic content. Um, in the near term, we have a lot of content on the platform, uh, and we, it's, it's hard to review every single thing up front. We do a quick screen. Um, but I, I agree with you that I think in, in this specific case, uh, I'm not happy with where we are. And I, I think it makes sense to, to really focus on making sure that these areas get more review sooner. And, and I know you understand that there is uh, a growing uh, uh, distrust. I know a lot of civil rights organizations have met with you. Um, about Facebook's sense of urgency to address these issues. Um, uh, there's a distrust that stems from the fact, and I know uh, I've had conversations with leaders in Facebook about the lack of diversity in the tech sector as, uh, as well, people who are writing these algorithms, people who are uh, actually policing for this data, or policing for these problems. Uh, are they going to be a part of a more diverse group that's looking at this. You're looking to hire, as you said, 5,000 new positions for, among other things, reviewing content. But we know in your industry, uh, the inclusivity, it's a real serious problem that you are an industry that lacks diversity in a very dramatic fashion. It's not just true with Facebook. It's true with uh, the tech area as well. And, and so it's very important for me to, to communicate uh, uh, in that larger sense of urgency and, and what a lot of civil rights organizations are concerned with. And, and we should be working towards more, um, uh, a more collaborative approach. And I'm wondering if you'd be open to opening your platform for civil rights organizations to really audit uh, a lot of these companies dealing in areas of credit and housing to really audit what is actually happening and better have more transparency in working with your platform. Senator, I think that's a very good idea, and I think we should follow up on the details of that. Um, I also want to say that, that there was an investigation, uh, uh, something very disturbing to me, is the fact that there have been uh, law enforcement organizations that use Facebook's platform uh, to, uh, to, to, to surveil 
African-American organizations like Black Lives Matter. I know you've expressed uh, um, uh, support for the group and Philandro Castile's uh, uh, killing uh, was broadcast live on Facebook. Uh, but there are a lot of communities of color worried that that data uh, could be used uh, to surveil uh, um, uh, groups like Black Lives Matter, like folks who are trying to uh, organize against uh, substantive issues of discrimination in this country. Is this something that you're committed to addressing and to ensuring uh, uh, that the freedoms uh, that civil rights activists and others uh, are not targeted uh, or their work not being undermined or people not using your platform uh, to un unfairly surveil uh, and try to uh, um, undermine the activities that those groups are doing? Yes, Senator. Uh, I think that that's very important. We're, we're committed to that. Uh, and in general, unless law enforcement has a very clear uh, subpoena or ability or, or reason to get access to information, we're going to push back on that across the board. And then I'd just like for the record, because my time has expired, yeah. uh, but there's a lawsuit against Facebook about discrimination, and you uh, move for the lawsuit to be dismissed because no harm was shown. Could you please submit to the record, uh, could you believe that people of color who are not uh, recruited for various uh, uh, economic opportunities are being harmed? Can you please uh, uh, clarify why you move for to dismiss that lawsuit for the record? For the record. Thank you. Senator Heller is up next. <clears throat> I'll go to you. All right, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Appreciate the time, and thank you for being here. I'm over here. Thanks. Um, and thank you for taking time. I know it's been a long day, and uh, I think you're at the, uh, at the final stretch here, but I'm glad that you are here. Yesterday, uh, Facebook sent out a notification to 87 million users that information was given to Cambridge Analytica without their consent. Uh, my daughter was one of the 87 million, and six of my uh, uh, staff... Uh, uh, all from Nevada received this notification. Can you tell me um, how many Nevadans were among the 87 million uh, that uh, received this notification? Senator, I don't have this broken out by state right now, but I can have my team follow up with you to get you the information. Okay, okay. I figured that would be the answer. Uh, if uh, after hearing this, uh, going through this hearing, and Nevadans no longer want to have a Facebook account, if, if that's the case, if a Facebook user deletes their account, uh, do you delete their data? Yes. Um, my kids have been on Facebook and Instagram for years. How long do you keep a user's data? Sorry? Can How long do you keep a user's data? Once they, uh, uh, after, after they've left. If they, if they uh, choose to delete their account, how long do you keep their data? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I know we try to delete it as quickly as is reasonable. We have a lot of complex systems, and it work, takes a while to work through all that. Uh, but I think we try to move as quickly as possible, and I can follow up or have my team yeah. follow up to get you the, the data on that. Okay. Have you ever said that you won't sell an ad based on um, personal information, simply that, that you wouldn't sell this data because of the uh, usage of it goes too far? Um. Senator, could you clarify that? Um, have you ever drawn the line on selling data to an advertiser? Yes, Senator. We don't sell data at all. So the, the way the ad system works is advertisers can come to us and say, I, I have a message that I'm trying to reach a certain type of people. Uh, they might be interested in something. They might live in a place. And then we help them get that message in front of people. But this is one of the... It's widely mischaracterized about our system that we sell data, and it's actually one of the most important parts of how Facebook works is we do not sell data. Advertisers do not get access to people's individual data. Have you ever collected the content of phone calls or messages uh, through any Facebook application or service? Um, Senator, I don't believe we've ever collected the content of, of phone calls. Uh, we have an app called Messenger that allows people to message their, uh, mostly their Facebook friends. And we do, on the Android operating system, allow people to use that app as their client for both Facebook messages and texts. Uh, so we do allow people to import their texts into that. Okay. Let me ask you about government surveillance. Uh, for years, Facebook said that, there'd be, that there should be strict limits on the information the government can access... Uh, 
on Americans. And by the way, I agreed with you uh, that uh, privacy, because privacy is important to Nevadans. You argued that Facebook users wouldn't trust you if they thought you were giving their private information to the intelligence community. Yet you use and sell the same data to make money. And in the case of Cambridge Analytica, you don't even know how it's used after you sell it. Can you uh, tell us why this isn't hypocritical? Well, Senator, once again, we don't sell any data to anyone. We don't sell it to advertisers, and we don't sell it to developers. What we do allow is for people to sign into apps and bring their data, uh, and it used to be the data of some of their friends, but now it isn't, um, with them. And that, I think, makes sense. I mean, that's basic data portability, the ability that you own the data, you should be able to take it uh, from one app to another if you'd like. Do you believe you're more responsible with millions of Americans' personal data than the federal government would be? Yes. Uh, but, Senator, the, your point about surveillance, I think that there's a very important distinction to draw here, which is that when, when organizations do surveillance, people don't have control over that. Where on Facebook, everything that you share there, you have control over. You can, uh, you can say, I don't want this information to be there. You have full access to understand every, all, every piece of information that Facebook might know about you, and you can get rid of all of it. And I, I don't know of any other sur uh, any surveillance organization in the world that operates that way, which is why I think that that comparison just isn't really apt here. With you here today, do you think you're a victim? No. Do you think uh, Facebook as a company is a victim? Senator, no. I think we have a responsibility to protect everyone in our community from anyone in, in our ecosystem who is uh, going to potentially harm them. And I think that we haven't done enough historically, do you consider and the, we need to step up and okay, do more. Do you consider the 87 million users, do you consider them victims? Uh, Senator, I think, uh, yes. I mean, they, they did not want their information to be sold to Cambridge Analytica by a developer. And, and that happened, and it happened on our watch. So even though we didn't do it, I think we have a responsibility to be able to prevent that and be able to take action sooner. And we're committing to make sure that we do that going forward, which is why the steps that, that I announced before are now, uh, they're the two most important things that we're doing are locking down the platform to make sure that developers can't get access to that much data so this can't happen again going forward, which I think is largely the case since 2014. And going backwards, we need to investigate every single app that might have had access to a large amount of people's data to make sure that no one else was misusing it. If we find that they are, we're going to get into their systems, do a full audit, make sure they delete it, and we're going to tell everyone who's affected. Mr. Thank, Chairman, thank, thank you. you, Senator Heller. We'll go to Senator Peters and then into the break, and then Senator Tillis coming out of the break. So, Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you for being uh, here today. You know, you've uh, talked about uh, your very humble beginnings in, in starting uh, Facebook in, in your dorm room, which I appreciated uh, that story, but certainly Facebook has changed an awful lot over a relatively short period of time. When Facebook launched its uh, timeline feature, consumers saw their friends post uh, chronologically as the process. But Facebook has uh, since then changed to a timeline driven by some very sophisticated uh, algorithms. And I think it has left uh, many people as a result of that uh, asking, you know, why, why am I seeing this, uh, this feed, uh, and why am I seeing this uh, right now? And now in light of uh, the, uh, the Cambridge Analytica issue, Facebook users are asking, I think, some new questions right now. Can I believe what I'm seeing? And who has access uh, to this information uh, about me? So I think it's safe to say, uh, very simply, that uh, Facebook is losing the trust uh, of an awful lot of uh, Americans uh, as a result of this uh, incident. And I think an example of this is something that I've been hearing a lot from folks that have been coming up to me and talking about really kind of an experience they've had where they're having a conversation with friends, not on the phone, just talking, and then they see ads popping up fairly quickly on their Facebook. So I've heard constituents fear that Facebook is mining audio from their mobile devices for the purpose of ad targeting, which I think speaks to this lack of trust that we're seeing here. But uh, and I understand there's some technical issues and logistical issues for that to happen, but for the record, I think it's clear, seeing I hear it all the time, including from my own staff, uh, yes or no, does Facebook use audio obtained from mobile devices to enrich personal information about its users? No. Okay. The, uh, well, Senator, let, let, me be, let me be clear on this. 
I mean, so you're, you're talking about this um, conspiracy theory that gets passed around that we listen to what's going on on your microphone and use that for ads. Right. We don't do that. To be clear, we do allow people to take videos on their, on their devices and, um, and share those. And, of course, videos also have audio. So, um, so we do, while you're taking a video, um, record that and use that to make the service better by making sure that your videos have audio. But, I, I mean, that, I think, is, is pretty clear. But I just wanted to make sure I was exhaustive there. No, and uh, hopefully that will dispel a lot of what I've been hearing, so thank you for saying that. Certainly, uh, the, uh, today, uh, uh, in the era of uh, mega data, uh, we are finding that data drives uh, everything, including uh, consumer behavior. And so consumer information is probably the most valuable information you can get in the data ecosystem. And certainly, folks, as you've mentioned in your testimony here, people like the fact that they can have targeted ads that they're going to be interested in, as opposed to being bombarded by a lot of ads that they don't have any interest in. Uh, and that consumer information is important in order for you to tailor that. Uh, but also, people are now beginning to wonder, uh, is there an expense to that uh, when it comes to perhaps exposing them to being manipulated or through uh, deception? Uh, you've talked about artificial intelligence. You brought that up uh, many times during your testimony. And I know you're, you've employed some new algorithms to target bots, bring down fake accounts, deal with terrorism, things that you've talked about in this hearing. But you also know that artificial intelligence is not without its risk and that you have to be very transparent about how those uh, algorithms uh, are constructed. Uh, how do you see uh, artificial intelligence, more specifically, uh, dealing with the ecosystem by helping to get consumer insights, but also keeping consumer privacy safe? Senator, I think the, the core question you're asking about AI transparency is a really important one that people are just starting to very seriously study, and that's ramping up a lot. And I think this is going to be a very central question for how we think about AI systems over the next decade and beyond. Right now, a lot of our AI systems um, make decisions in ways that uh, people don't really understand. Right. And I don't think that in 10 or 20 years in the future that we all want to build, um, we want to end up with systems that people don't understand how they're making decisions. So having... Doing the research now um, to make sure that, the, that these systems um, can have those principles as we're developing them, I think is certainly a, an extremely important thing. Well, you bring up the, the principles because, uh, as, you, as you're well aware, uh, AI systems, especially in very complex uh, environments when you have machine learning, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to understand, as you mentioned, exactly how those decisions were arrived at. There's examples of how decisions are made on a discriminatory basis and that they can, can compound if you're not very careful about how that occurs. And so is your company, you mentioned principles, is your company developing a set of principles that are going to guide that development? And would you provide details to us as to what those principles are and how they will help uh, deal with this issue? Yes, Senator. I can make sure that our team follows up and gets you the information on that. And we have a whole AI ethics team that is working on developing um, basically the technology. It's not just about philosophical principles. It's also a technological foundation for making sure that this goes in the direction that we want. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Peters. Uh, we'll recess for five and um, come back in. So I'll give uh, Mr. Zuckerberg a quick break here. Thanks. You're watching live coverage of this hearing from Capitol Hill. Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, talking to senators who sit on the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee. This is the second break. It's really a marathon hearing because there are more than 40 senators, nearly half the Senate, who has the opportunity to ask him questions. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm joined here at the Washington Post by Karen Demergen, congressional reporter, hard at work, even as she's here on the set with us. Also, Jeffrey Fowler, technology columnist. And we've got our colleague, Jordan Frazier, on Capitol Hill, who give us a sense of what's going on there. But I want to turn to you first, Jeffrey. You know, we are getting a sense that some senators don't totally know how to talk about Facebook. They don't seem like users necessarily. Um, but is that reflective of a, a, a larger reality nationwide? I mean, it's not just them, right? Yeah. I mean, some of these senators are <clears throat> kind of being beaten up by techies right now who say, like, oh, they're misusing uh, some of the terminology, and Zuckerberg is actually even taking advantage of some of the loopholes in the language they're using. We saw one senator sort of make some <clears throat> odd references to, uh, to WhatsApp, which is actually an encrypted app, so Facebook couldn't be looking at the content of it. But the bigger point is this. If senators don't understand it... Uh, 
America doesn't understand it. The world doesn't understand it. And that's one of the images that's kind of that I'm taking away from this is how wide the gulf is between the the, the world that that Zuckerberg either thinks we live in or thinks that we might be a part of or and the world that that we actually are living in. And you hit on something really important, which is that Jeff Zuckerberg has been able to take advantage of some confusion or some lack of understanding on the behalf of some senators because they've said, well, explain this. And he's been able to get out of explaining it because they've used the wrong terminology or they haven't been clear. Some examples of that were Deb Fisher of Nebraska and also Brian Schatz when he was asking about WhatsApp. And he's a young guy on this panel and he's probably someone who uses social media. It well, yes, except for, you know, they're all kind of minimum, I think, in their 40s, at least on this panel, and, and that puts you a little bit out of step, at least with the, the most current terminology. And, and also, you know, some people kind of eventually got there. I, I think Dean Heller was the one who was asking about, well, what if you go away from Facebook? How long does your data still stay there? And they finally said, what if you delete your profile? What if you delete your right. profile? But it actually, the language. Exactly. Yeah, and, right. And so, I mean, it's, 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 you can see that Zuckerberg is getting more comfortable right now with mm -hmm. kind of working in between the spaces because he's, he's read them. They, they, there's a lot of... You don't have to just be an octogenarian to have a, a, a strange relationship with Facebook. A lot of these people have kids. It's their kids' generation who are actually engaging with the social media every day, and they're kind of viewing it through that lens of, you know, learning about it as isn't this an interesting social phenomenon that's going on, that they have staffs that run their Facebook pages for, for their offices. I mean, this is just... It, and also, even those who do understand the, the, the format that well are not quite sure necessarily what it is they want to try to get out of Mark Zuckerberg um, in terms of leading to them them being able to make changes that actually are substantive. That is my big takeaway so far, that it feels like we're kind of like, we've watched Congress straining to figure out what did we do, what does this mean, right. and we don't really have an answer. Nobody really knows what to do about this situation. Maybe, uh, maybe Facebook's users don't really know either. Like. We're in this situation, what do we do now? Let's hear from Jordan Frazier, who's been on Capitol Hill, and you've gotten the chance to talk to some senators as they've left the hearing, Jordan, and gone back and forth. Are right, you getting yeah. a sense that they have clear takeaways? Are they learning something concrete? Yeah, I would say definitely. You know, when they come out here and talk to the reporters set up, uh, you can see behind me, we've, we've talked to about a half dozen of them as they've left the hearing room. And two main themes have emerged um, from what they've had to tell us. The first is that Overall, they're disappointed in this, right? They are not satisfied with what they've heard today. We hear that over and over from both Democrats and Republicans. They're not satisfied with this hearing today. The second theme we've heard is, based on what they've heard, they're convinced that some sort of regulation or legislation is needed. We had an interesting exchange just a couple of moments ago with Senator Kennedy from Louisiana. Always a character up here on Capitol Hill, always quick uh, with a good one-liner. But what he had to say was really interesting, because he predicted that after today's hearing, a lot of bills will be introduced. But he said, based on Facebook's power and the influence they have, it will be up to Zuckerberg what bill ultimately passes. Based on the lobbying power and the social media organizing power, they will have, they will have the final say on what legislation actually gets passed. Senator Kennedy also put the interaction, uh, he summed it up really well, I thought. He said, quote, he doesn't feel like Zuckerberg and the committee are connecting well. He almost made it sound like a bad first date, right? Um, so two main themes, not not connecting and some sort of legislation likely to come. We'll see what happens, but I'll send it back to you. Maybe they'll friend each other on Facebook after this. Yeah, I want to talk about the interaction with Ed Markey, Senator Markey, who is someone who is really well versed in tech, who has taken regulation as a major component of, of what he goes after on Capitol Hill. And he tried to pin Mark Zuckerberg down about whether or not there should be more laws and regulations in place to protect the children was the language he was using. We didn't hear Mark Zuckerberg commit to that. Yeah, he didn't say, I want to protect the children. He kind of sort of got this stilted, like, oh, I'm in favor of some regulation. But then we know that Facebook has actually been fighting regulation. So that was that was not a winning moment. For and Zuckerberg. then his time ran out. I mean, yeah. then it had to go on to another <coughs> senator. So so all, right? Did, so did you get a sense that senators were able to get some concessions or um, hear something from Mark Zuckerberg that they can take home? I mean, I, I don't think we heard that that much in this last round. I think that you got the the, um, the emotional concessions, I guess, earlier on when you had the exchange with Dick Durbin, where it was just like the realization moments and the, the fallibility, I suppose. But but in terms of actually getting a, a concrete concession, I, I think that he said uh, they were talking about opt in, and he did say yes. We think you know philosophically it makes the most sense to have opt in be the standard. But again, that's not kind of going point by point through different 
these different options that you have when you're setting your settings on Facebook to actually say we're going to change these the way that we do it in very specific ways. So um, there's a bit of a general meeting of the minds, I guess, on certain points that just have to do with, you know, how do we think about how we engage with social media? But it's not really like they got into the, the weeds to, to, to establish either what he's specifically going to go home and change or what they're going to be able to sit around and watch in the next few weeks and, and draft up that would force them to make changes, and other social media companies too. We were surprised not to hear more about the news feed and the algorithm of, of the news feed until very late in the game here. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of at the core. That's the, the product if you're a Facebook user, you know, like that's the, the main home screen that you come to, and it's where Facebook gets to decide the order of stuff you get to see. Um, and that also fuels sort of the fake news phenomenon because the stuff that's the most viral gets the most likes, the most clicks shows up at the highest on that. It's also how, um, the system that Facebook uses to show you advertisements or the what gets sort of interlaced in that. But there didn't seem to be a lot of sort of technical knowledge about how that's the core of a lot of the problems with the Facebook product here. But again, this is a, a strange situation, right? Because even if they're getting more educated in the process of this, and as we all are perhaps watching this, that's very nice, right? We understand understand better the nuts and bolts of how Facebook works and what its founder and CEO actually thinks it should be doing, but that does not lead you to actually making DC-style, Congress-style legislative changes in a very obvious way. But maybe this is the important groundwork to lay before we can even have that conversation in a, in a way that's worth having. Dan Sullivan, Republican of Alaska, was one of the members who asked about being a publisher versus a content producer and, and how Facebook defines itself and what it sees itself as. Why is that important, Jeffrey? We heard that the old Facebook line, which is, oh, we're not a media company, we're a technology company. And what that's code for is we're not responsible for the content of what's on our website because uh, big internet um, providers, uh, Facebook, but also Google and others have for years been able to say, oh, there's a law, Section 230, of the, uh, that, that allows them to not be responsible for what other people publish using their platform. Um, that's one of the things that could be on the table here for, uh, for, 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 for legislation, that maybe, maybe we need to put more responsibility back on these, uh, these, these tech companies. But again, I, I mean, yeah, that's certainly one of the areas, but where do you define it, right? And that's the thing. If you have a bunch of lawmakers who aren't even sure how this one very, very famous, globally known tech company fully works, how are they going to make that definition in a way where they're not getting pushback from their constituents? And remember, these are all politicians. They are very sensitive to pushback from constituents, and constituents have a lot of opinions about how this, these particular companies work because they are engaged in them and it's their information. So you're going to get some of it from the, the privacy advocates, some of it from the, the, the people who are, especially the people, representatives of you know, Silicon Valley and various other tech centers across the country. You have you know, younger voters co co coming up that may actually have opinions too. And how that all gels together, I do not know. And we haven't been able to figure out for several years. Let's check in with Jordan Frazier on the Hill. Yeah, I just want to pick up on that discussion you guys are having because what's evident to me in talking to senators up here is they very much are starting to view Facebook as a media company. I, this line that they're they're not a platform, they're, that they're a platform and not a, a publisher or some sort of media entity, I don't think that's going to end up going very far because look at it, at the perspective that these senators are having. Right, they've got constituents who come to them and say, "Hey, I saw on Facebook. I read this on Facebook." They see it as looking at Facebook, right? It's not these individual people using it as a platform form to publish. So I think we're getting to a consensus up here on Capitol Hill in, in the discussions we're having that they are looking at it more as a media company. And it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, that regulating media, that's something Congress is more comfortable with, right? So I think, if anything, if I could predict, that's the direction we'll go in, mainly because Congress likes to do what it knows best, right? And that's, that's where they're most comfortable. So uh, I would predict that that's kind of where we're headed here, Libby. We're watching live coverage of this congressional hearing. We'll bring it back to you. You can see it there. Uh, we're waiting for the senators to resume their seats and Mark Zuckerberg to resume his seat as well. And we'll, of course, bring you that live and uninterrupted once they resume. Uh, marathon hearing here. More than 40 senators get their chance to ask questions. And you can follow this coverage at WashingtonPost.com. We're also on YouTube. And we're also on Twitch. So welcome if you're viewing there. Go ahead, Jeff. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So I'm from San Francisco. I cover Silicon Valley. I'm not used to this. Does this normally go on this long? I mean, I brought popcorn, it's as some people have been noticing on the live feed. Um, it's gone. It's we, gone. We, we, more. I've eaten all the popcorn. We're out. Um, <laughs> do I need to replenish? Is this normal? 
I mean, how many names have we gotten through at this point? Is it more than halfway? Yes, You're we're doing definitely, yeah, we're about, we're, we're more than two-thirds of the way there oh, that's um, good. from my count. Well, two, maybe two-thirds of the way there. So I mean, we still have a handful we've got to get through. The only people that you see go on for quite this long are people like cabinet secretaries when they're going to be vetted. Then you have sometimes multi-day affairs. And Mark Zuckerberg is not a cabinet secretary, but he's certainly as famous as, and possibly more famous than any of them. So, uh, it, it's a big deal and everybody wants to have their, their moment, which is why you're fusing two committees in, in, in one big hearing and that's that's very rare. Yeah, pushing the two committees together is fairly unusual. It's you don't usually unusual. see them glom on to one hearing and just have this sort of marathon experience of, of having more than 40 people be able to ask questions, which is really almost half the Senate. I mean, we expect to hear from yeah. 43 yeah. members of the Senate today representing a lot of the states and a lot of um, places, including California. And we will hear uh, at some point from Kamala Harris of California. We also heard earlier, of course, from um, one right. of the top members in this committee, Diane Feinstein, representing your state of California, Jeff. So uh, we see both the Silicon Valley interests represented here as well as Middle America and the East Coast. So yeah, we've got, you've got a heard real... Chris Coons referring to Delawareans over and over again, too. I mean, like, it, it, this, is, this is a very big spread, of course. And like you said, Half of the members of the Senate are actually getting involved here. Yeah, you know, but Jordan, that's the a media lot. interest has been so vast, including international media. Yeah, that's right. So it's not every day. Uh, you know, every day we're up here, obviously, the American press is up here, but it's not every day that our international friends join us. And we have had people from, from England and, and, and the, the, uh, in Mexico and it, all over. So it just amplifies the interest that we've seen. All right, Mark Zuckerberg returning to the hearing. So let's get back to hear uh, about 10 more members of the Senate ask questions of Mark Zuckerberg. Senator Tillis is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here. I think you've done a good job. I've been here for most of it, the session, except for about 20 minutes. I watched on television back in my office. Um, I, I was Googling earlier. I actually got on my Facebook app on my phone earlier, and I found one of your Facebook page, or, yeah, one of your Facebook presences. It was the same one on March 30th. I think you posted a pic of a first Seder. But... Um, Further down, you listed out the facts uh, since the new platform was uh, released in 2007, sort of a timeline. You start with 2007, then you jump to the Cambridge Analytica um, issue. I actually think that we need to fully examine what Cambridge Analytica did. They either broke a kind of code of conduct, if they broke any other rules or agreements with you all, I hope that they suffer the consequences. But I think that timeline needs to be updated. And it really needs to go back. Uh, I've read a series of three articles that were published in the MIT Technology Review back in 2012. And it talks about how proud the Obama campaign was of exploiting data on Facebook in the 2012 campaign. In fact, somebody asked you earlier if it made you mad about what Cambridge Analytica did, and you rightfully answered yes. But I think you should probably be equally mad when a former campaign director of the Obama campaign proudly tweeted, Facebook was surprised we were able to suck out the whole social graph. But they didn't stop us once they realized that was what we were doing. So you clearly had some people in your employ that apparently knew it, at least that's what this person said on Twitter, and thank goodness for way back and some of the other history grabber machines. I'm sure we can get this tweet back and get it in the right context. Um, I think when you do your research, it's important to get the whole view. I've worked in data analytics practice for a good part of my career. And for anybody to pretend that Cambridge Analytica was the first person to exploit data clearly doesn't work or hasn't worked in the data analytics field. So when you go back and do your research on Cambridge Analytica, I would personally appreciate it if you'd start back from the first known high-profile national campaign that exploited Facebook data. In fact, they published an app that said it would grab information about my friends, their birth dates, locations, and likes. So presumably, if I downloaded that app that was published by the Obama campaign, I've got 4,900 uh, friends on my Facebook page. I delete the haters and save room for family members and true friends on my personal page, as I'm sure everybody does. Then that means if I clicked yes on that app, I would have approved the access of birth dates, locations, and likes of some 4,900 people without their consent. 
So as you do the chronology, I think it'd be very helpful so that we can take away the partisan rhetoric that's going on, like this is a Republican-only issue. It's a, it's a broad-based issue that needs to be fixed. And bad actors at either end of the political spectrum need to be held accountable, and I, and I trust that you all are going to work on that. Um, I think the one thing uh, that I, so for that, I just want to get to the facts, and there's no way you can answer any of the questions. I'm not going to burden you with that. But I think getting that chronology would be very helpful. The one thing I would encourage people to do is go to Facebook. I've, I'm a proud member of Facebook. Just got a post from my sister on this being National Sibling Day, so I've connected with four or five of my staff while I was giving you my undivided, our family undivided attention. But go to the Privacy tab. If you don't want to share something, don't share it. This is a free service. Go on there and say, I don't want to allow third-party search engines to get to my Facebook page. Go on there and say, only my friends can look at it. Go in there and understand what you're signing up for. It's a free app. Now, you need to do more, and I think it would be helpful. I didn't read your disclaimer page or the terms of use because I didn't see anywhere in there that I could get an attorney and negotiate the terms, so it was a terms of use. I went on there, then I used the privacy settings to be as safe as I could be with a presence on Facebook. Last thing, we talk about all these proposed legislation, good ideas, but I have one question for you. When you were developing this app in your dorm, how many people did you have in your regulatory affairs division? <laughs> exactly. So if government takes a handy, heavy-handed approach to fix this problem, then we know very well that the next Facebook, the next thing that you're going to wake up and worry about how you continue to be relevant as the behemoth that you are today is probably not going to happen. So we've, I think that there's probably a place for some regulatory guidance here, but there's a huge place for Google, Snapchat, Twitter, all the other social media platforms to get together and create standards. And I also believe that that person who may have looked the other way when the whole social graph was extracted for the Obama campaign, if they're still working for you, they probably shouldn't, or at least there should be a business code of conduct that says you don't play favorites, you're trying to create a fair place for a uh, for people to share their ideas. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Senator Harris. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I've been here for, for on and off for the last four hours that you've been testifying, and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm concerned about how much Facebook values trust and transparency if we agree that a critical component of a relationship of trust and transparency is we speak truth and we get to the truth. Uh, during the course of this hearing, these last four hours, you've been asked several critical questions for which you don't have answers. And those questions have included whether Facebook can track users' browsing activity even after the user has logged off of Facebook, whether Facebook can track your activity across devices even when you aren't logged into Facebook, who is Facebook's biggest competition? Whether Facebook may store up to 96 categories of users' information. Whether you knew whether Kogan's terms of service and whether you knew if that Kogan could sell or transfer data. And then another case in point specifically as it relates to Cambridge Analytica is, and a concern of mine, is that you meaning Facebook, and I'm going to assume you personally as CEO, became aware in December of 2015 uh, that Dr. Kogan and Cambridge Analytica misappropriated data from 87 million Facebook users. That's 27 months ago that, that you became as Facebook and perhaps you personally became aware. Um, however, a decision was made not to notify the users. So my question is, did anyone at Facebook have a conversation at the time that uh, you became aware of this breach and have a conversation wherein the decision was made not to contact the users? Senator, uh, I, I don't know if there were any conversations at Facebook overall because I was in, in a lot of them, but... Um, On that subject. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure what other people discussed. Um, our, at the time, in 2015, we heard the report that this developer, Alexander Kogan, had sold data to Cambridge Analytica. And That's in you, violation of our terms. Correct. And were you a part of a decision? Were you part of a discussion that resulted in a decision not to inform your users? 
I don't remember a conversation like that. But the reason why... Are you aware of anyone in leadership at Facebook who was in a conversation where a decision was made not to inform your users, or do you believe no such conversation ever took place? I, I'm not sure whether there was a conversation about that, but I can tell you the thought process at the time of the company, which was that in 2015, when we heard about this, we banned the developer, and we demanded that they delete all the data and stop using it, and same with Cambridge Analytica. And I, they and told I us they had. testimony in that regard, but I'm talking about notification of the users, and, and, and this relates to the issue of transparency and the relationship of trust, informing the user about what you know in terms of how their personal information has been misused. And I'm also concerned that when you personally became aware of this, did you or senior leadership do an inquiry to find out who at Facebook had this information and did they not have a discussion about whether or not the users should be informed back in December of 2015? Senator, in retrospect, I think we clearly view it as a mistake that we didn't inform people, and we did that based on false information that we thought that the case was closed and that the data had been deleted. So there was a decision made on that basis not to inform the users, is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. And, um, but I, I, in retrospect, I think that was a mistake, and knowing what we know now, we should have handled a lot of things here differently. And I appreciate that point. Do you know when that, when that decision was made not to inform the users? I don't. Okay. Um, last November, the Senate Intelligence Committee held a hearing on social media influence. I was a part of that hearing. I submitted 50 written questions to Facebook and other companies, and um, the responses that we received were unfortunately evasive and some were, frankly, non-responsive. So I'm going to ask the question again here. How much revenue did Facebook earn from the user engagement that resulted from foreign propaganda? Well, Senator, what we do know is that the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, the, the Russian firm, ran about $100,000 worth of ads. How I can't say Facebook that we've identified all of the foreign actors who are involved here, so I, I, I can't say that that's all of the money, but that is what we have identified. Okay, my time is up. I'll submit more questions for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Harris. Next up is Senator Kennedy. <clears throat> Mr. Zuckerberg, I come in peace. Um, I, I don't want to vote to have to regulate Facebook, but by God, I will. But that, a lot of that depends on you. Uh, I'm a little disappointed in this hearing today. I just don't feel like that we're connecting. So, so let me try to lay it out for you from my point of view. I think you're a really smart guy. And I think you have built an extraordinary American company. And you've done a lot of good. Some of the things that you've been able to do are magical. But our, our promised digital utopia, we have discovered, has minefields. There, there's some impurities in the Facebook punch bowl. And they got to be fixed. And I think you can fix them. Now, here, here's what's going to happen. There are going to be a whole bunch of bills introduced to regulate Facebook. It's up to you whether they pass or not. You can go back home, uh, spend $10 million on lobbyists and fight us, or you can go back home and uh, help us solve them. And there are two. One's a privacy problem. The other one is what I call a problem. Start with the privacy problem first. Let's start with the user agreement. Here's what everybody's been trying to tell you today, and I, I, I say this gently. Your user agreement sucks. <laughs> You're a, you, you, you can spot me 75 IQ points. If I can figure it out, you can figure it out. The purpose of that user agreement is to cover Facebook's rear end. It's not to inform your users about their rights. Now, you know that, and I know that. 
I'm going to suggest to you that you go back home and rewrite it. And tell your $1,200 an hour lawyers, no disrespect, they're good. But, but tell them you want it written in English, in non-Swahili, so the average American can understand it. That would be a start. I, are you willing, as a Facebook user, are you, are you willing to give me more control over my data? Senator, as someone who uses Facebook, I believe that you should have complete control over your data. Okay. Are, are you willing to uh, go back and, and, and work on, on giving me a greater right to erase my data? Senator, you can already delete any of the data that's there or are, are delete all of your data. Are you willing to expand that, work on expanding that? Senator, I think we already do what you're referring to, but certainly we're always working on trying to make these controls easier. Are, are you willing to expand my right to know who you're sharing my data with? Senator, we already give you a list of apps that, that you're using, and you signed into those yourself and provided affirmative consent. Right. As on I've said user, before, we that, don't share any that, data on with... that user agreement. Uh, are, are you willing to uh, expand my right to prohibit you from sharing my data? Senator, again, I believe that you already have that control. So, I mean, I think people have that, that full control in the system already today. Uh -oh. If we're not communicating this clearly, then that's a big thing that we should work on, because I think the principles that you're articulating are the ones that we believe in and try to codify in the product that we build. Are, are you willing to give me the right to take my data on Facebook and move it to another social media platform? Senator, you can already do that. We have a download your information tool where you can go, get a file of all the content there, and then do whatever you want with it. And you're, are you, then I assume you're willing to give me the right to say, I'm going to go on your platform and you're going to be able to tell a lot about me as a result, but I don't want you to share it with anybody. Yes, Senator, and I believe you already have that ability today. People can sign on and choose to not share things and just follow some friends or some pages and read content if that's what they want to do. Okay. Um, let me be sure I understand. I'm about out of time. Well, it goes fast, doesn't it? Let me ask you one final question question in my 12 seconds. Could somebody call you up and say, I want to see John Kennedy's file? Absolutely not. Could you, if it, not, not, could you, not would you do it, could you do it? Uh, in, in theory. Do you have the right to put my data, a name on my data, and share it with somebody? I do not believe we have the right to do that. Do you have the ability? Senator, the data is in the system. So you have the ability. Technically, I think someone could do that, but that would be a massive breach. So we would never do that. It would be a breach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Kennedy. Senator Baldwin's up next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, being here and uh, enduring a long day, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, I want to start with what I hope can be a quick round of, of questions just so I uh, make sure I understand your previous testimony. Um, specifically with regard to uh, uh, the process by which Cambridge Analytica uh, was able to purchase uh, Facebook users' data. So it was an app developer, Alexander uh, Kogan. He collected data via a personality quiz. Uh, uh, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And he thereby is able to gain access of not only the people who took the quiz, but their network. Is that correct, too? Senator, yes. The terms of the platform at the time allowed for uh, people to share their information and some basic information about their friends as well. And we've since changed that. As of 2014, and, now that's not possible. And so uh, in total, about 87 million uh, Facebook users. You earlier testified about the two t types of ways you gain data. One is what is voluntarily shared by Facebook members and users. And the other is um, in order to, I think you said, improve your advertising experience, whatever 
that exactly means. The data that Facebook collects in order to customize or, or focus on that. Did, was uh, Alexander Kogan able to get both of those sets of data or just what was voluntarily entered by the user? Yes, that's a good question. It was just a subset of what was entered by the person. and So a subset of the 95 uh, uh, categories of data that you keep? Yes. And when you sign okay. into an app, you, the app developer has to say, here are the types of data that from you that I'm asking for, mm -hmm. including public information like your name and profile, the pages you follow, other interests on your profile, that kind of content. Okay. The app developer has to disclose that up front, and you agree to it. Okay. Uh, so in answer to a couple of other senators' questions, uh, specifically Senator Fisher, you uh, talked about Facebook storing this data, and I think you just talked about the data being in the system. Um, I wonder if uh, outside of the way in which uh, Alexander Kogan was able to access this data, whether you uh, could Facebook be vulnerable to a data breach or hack? Why or why not? Well, there are many kinds of security threats that a company like ours faces, including people trying to break into our security systems. Okay. And if you believe that you had been hacked, do you believe you would have the duty to inform those who were impacted? Yes. Okay. Um, do you know whether uh, uh, Alexander Kogan sold any of the data he collected with anyone other than Cambridge Analytica? Senator, yes, we do. He sold it to a couple of other firms. Uh, Can you identify them? Yes, there was one called uh, Unoya and there may have been a couple of others as well. And can I you can furnish follow that up to with me you. after? Thank yes. you. I appreciate that. And then um, how much do you know or have you tried to find out uh, how Cambridge Analytica used the data while they had it before um, you believe they deleted it? Since we just heard that they didn't delete it about a month ago, we've kicked off an internal investigation to see if they use that data in any of their ads, for example. That investigation is still underway, and we will, we can come back to you with the results of that once we have that. Okay. I want to switch to my home state of Wisconsin. According to press reports, my home state of Wisconsin was a major target of Russian-bought ads on Facebook in the 2016 election. These divisive ads, um, touching on a number of very polarizing issues, were designed to interfere with our election. We've also learned that um, Russian actors using another platform, Twitter, uh, uh, similarly targeted Wisconsin with divisive content aimed at sowing uh, division and dissent, including in the wake of a police-involved shooting in Milwaukee's Sherman Park neighborhood in August of 2016. Now, I, I find some uh, encouragement in the steps you've outlined today to provide greater transparency regarding political ads. Um, I do want to get further information on how you can be confident um, that you have uh, excluded entities based outside of the United States. And, and we'll follow up on that. And then uh, I think on that uh, topic, um, if you require uh, disclosure of a political ads sponsor, um, what sort of transparency uh, will you be able to provide with regard to people who weren't the subject of that ad seeing its content? Senator, you'll be able to go to any page and see all of the ads that that page has run. So if someone is running a political campaign, for example, and they're targeting one district with one ad and another district with another. Historically, it's been hard to track that down, but now it'll be very easy. You'll just be able to look at all of the ads that they've run, the targeting associated with each to see what they're saying to different, to different folks, uh, and in, in some cases, how much they're spending on, on the ads, uh, and all, all of the relevant information. This is an area where I think more transparency will really help discourse overall and root out foreign interference in elections. Thank you, and Senator Baldwin. Senator Johnson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for testifying here today. Do you have any idea how many of your users actually read the terms of service, the privacy policy, the statement of rights and responsibilities? I mean, actually read it? Senator, I do not. Would you imagine it's a very small percentage? Senator, who read the whole thing? I would imagine that probably most people do not read the whole thing, but everyone has the opportunity to and consents to it. Well, I agree, but that's kind of true of every application where you, know, you want to get to it and you have to agree to it and people just press that agree. The vast majority, correct? Senator, it's really hard for me to make a full assessment, but... Common sense would tell you that would be probably the case. Um, with all this publicity, have you documented any kind of backlash from Facebook users? I mean, has there been a dramatic fall off in the number of people who utilize Facebook because of these concerns? Senator, there has not. Uh, you haven't even witnessed any? Um, Senator, there, there was a movement where some people were encouraging their friends to uh, delete their account, and I think that, that got shared a bunch. So, so it's kind of safe to say that Facebook users don't seem to be overly uh, concerned about all these revelations, although obviously Congress apparently is. Um, well, Senator... I think people are concerned about it, and I think these are incredibly important issues that people want us to address, and I think people have told us that very clearly. Well, it seems like Facebook users still want to use the platform because they enjoy sharing photos and they, they sh share the co connectivity with the family members, that type of thing, and that overrides their concerns about privacy. You talk about the user owns the data. You know, there are a number, been a number of proposals of having that data stay at the user and allow the user to monetize it themselves. Uh, your COO, uh, Ms. Sandberg, mentioned possibly if, if you can't utilize that data for, to sell advertising, t perhaps we charge people to go onto Facebook. Have you thought about that model where the user data is actually monetized by the actual user? Senator, I'm not sure exactly how, how it would work for it to be monetized by the, the, the person directly. In general, we're, we believe that the ads model is the right one for us because it aligns with our social mission of trying to connect everyone and bring the world closer together. But, but you're aware of people making that kind of proposal, correct? Yeah. I, Senator, a number of people um, suggest that, that we should offer a version where people can not have ads if they pay a monthly subscription. And um, certainly we consider ideas, reasonable ideas to, to think through. But overall, the... I think that the ads experience is going to be uh, the best one. I think in general people like not having to pay for a service. A lot of people can't afford to pay for a service around the world, and this aligns with our mission the best. You, you answered Senator Graham when he asked you if you thought you were a monopoly that you didn't think so. Uh, you're obviously a big player in this space. Uh, that might be an area for competition, correct? If somebody else wants to create a social platform that allows a user to monetize their own data. Senator, yes. There are lots of new social apps all the time, and as I said before, the average American, I think, uses eight different communication and social apps. So there's a lot of different choice and a lot of innovation and activity going on in this space. I want, in a very short period of time, you talk about the difference between advertisers and application developers, because those, again, you, you said in an earlier testimony that advertisers have no access to data whatsoever, but application developers do. Now, is that only through their own service agreements with their customers, or do they actually access data as they're developing applications? Senator, this is an important distinction, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to clarify this. People, we give people the ability to take their data to another app if they want. And this is a question that Senator Kennedy asked me uh, just a few minutes ago. The reason why we designed the platform that way is because we, we thought it would be very useful to make it so that people could easily bring their data to other, to other services. Some people inside the company argued against that at the time because they were worried that uh, they said, hey, we should just make it so that we can be the only ones who develop this but stuff. Again, that's, that's we the, thought that that was a, a useful thing for people that's to That's the do, user so agreeing it. to allow you to share, when they're using that app, to allow Facebook to share that data. Does the developer ever have access to that prior to users using it? I mean, in developing the application, because it used the term scraped data. What, what does that mean? Who scraped the data? Yes, Senator, this is a good question. So there's the developer platform, which is the sanctioned way that an app developer can ask a person to access information. We also have certain 
features and certain things that are public, right? A lot of the information that people choose to put on Facebook, they're sharing with everyone in the world, not privately, but um, you know, you put your name, you put your profile picture, that's public information um, that people put out there. And sometimes people who aren't registered developers of Facebook try to load a lot of pages in order to get access to a bunch of people's public information and aggregate it. We fight back hard against that because we don't want anyone to aggregate information, even if people made it public and chose to share it with everyone. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here today. Um, I, I want to talk to a couple of broader issues. I'm concerned that Facebook's profitability rests on two potentially problematic, problematic foundations, and we've heard other senators talk about this a little today. The foundations are maximizing the amount of time people spend on your products and collecting people's data. I've looked at Facebook's 2017 corporate financial statement where you lay out some of the major risks to your business. One risk is a decrease in, and I quote, user engagement including time spent on our products. That concerns me because of the research we've seen suggesting that too much time spent on social media can hurt people's mental health, especially young people. Another major risk to your business is a potential decline in, and here's another quote, the effectiveness of our ad targeting or the degree to which users opt out of certain types of ad targeting, including as a result of changes that enhance the user's privacy. There's clearly tension, as other senators have pointed out, between your bottom line and what's best for your users. You've said in your testimony that Facebook's mission is to bring the world closer together, and you've said that you will never prioritize advertisers over that mission, and I believe that you believe that. But at the end of the day, your business model does prioritize advertisers over the mission. Facebook is a for-profit company, and as a CEO, you have a legal duty to do what's best for your shareholders. So given all of that, why should we think that Facebook on its own will ever truly be able to make the changes that we need it to make to protect Americans' well-being and privacy? Well, Senator, you raise a number of important points in there, so, um, so let me respond in, in sure. a couple of different ways. The, the first is that I think it's really important to think about what we're doing is building this community over the long term. Any business has the opportunity to do things that might increase revenue in the short term, but at the expense of trust or building engagement over time. What we actually find is not necessarily that increasing time spent, especially not just in the short term, is going to be best for our business. It actually it aligns very closely with, um, with the well-being research that we've done, that when people are interacting with other people uh, and, and posting and and, and basically building relationships, that is both correlated with higher uh, measures of well-being, health, happiness, um, not feeling lonely, um, and that ends up being better for the business than when they're doing lower value things like just passively consuming content. So I think that that's, that's an important point to... Okay, to... But, and, and I understand the point that you're trying to make here, but here's what I'm concerned about. We have heard this point from you over the last decade plus. Since you founded Facebook, and I understand it, you, you founded it pretty much as a solo entrepreneur with your roommate, but now you know, you're sitting here the head of a bazillion dollar company, and we've heard you apologize numerous times and promise to change, but here we are again, right? So I really firmly believe in free enterprise, but when private companies are unwilling or unable to do what's necessary, public officials have historically, in every industry, stepped up to protect our constituents and consumers. You've supported targeted regulations such as the Honest Ads Act, and that's an important step for election integrity. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of that bill. But we need to address other broader issues as well. And today you've said you'd be open to some regulation but this has been a pretty general conversation. So will you commit to working with Congress to develop ways of protecting constituent privacy and well-being, even if it means that that results in some laws that will require you to adjust your business model? Senator, yes, we will commit to that. I think that that's an important conversation to have. Our position is not that regulation is bad. 
I think the internet is so important in people's lives and it's getting more important. Yep. The expectations on internet companies and technology companies overall are growing. And I think the real question is, what is the right framework for this, not should there be one? That is very helpful. And I think the other question, and it, it doesn't just go to Facebook, is whether the framework should include financial penalties when large providers like Facebook uh, are breached and privacy is compromised as a result. Because right now there is very little incentive for whether it's Facebook or Equifax to actually be aggressive in protecting customer privacy and looking for potential breaches or vulnerabilities in their system. So what we hear after the fact, after people's privacy has been breached, after they've uh, taken the harm that comes with that and considerable inconvenience in addition to the harm, we've heard apologies, but there is no financial incentive right now, it seems to me, uh, for these companies to aggressively stand in their consumers' stead and protect their privacy, and I would really look forward to working with you on that and getting your considered opinion about it. Well, Senator, we are discussing that with you. I would disagree, however, that we have no financial incentive or incentive overall to, to do this. Um, this episode has clearly hurt us and has clearly um, made it harder for us to achieve the social mission that we care about, and we now have to do a lot of work around building trust uh, back, which, which is, is just a really important part of this. Well, I thank you. My time is up, uh, and, and I'll follow up with you on that. Senator Capito. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here today. Um, I, I want to ask just kind of a process question. You've said uh, more than a few times that Facebook users can delete from their own account at any time. Well, we know in the course I do, uh, I've got grandchildren now, but children, you tell your children, once you make that mark, in uh, in cyber or in in the uh, internet system, it never really goes away. So my question to you is: If once an and I think you answered that that once an individual deletes the information from their page, it's gone forever from Facebook's archives. Is that correct? Yes, and I think you raise a good point though, which is that it, it we will delete it from our systems. But if you've shared something to someone else, uh, then we can't guarantee that they don't have it somewhere else. Okay, so if somebody leaves Facebook and then rejoins and asks Facebook, can you recreate my past, your answer would be? If they delete their account, the answer is no. That's why we actually offer two options. We offer deactivation, which allows you to shut down or suspend your account but not delete the information because actually a lot of people want to, at least for some period of time, I mean, we hear, you know, students with exams coming up want to not be on Facebook because they, they want to make sure that they can focus on the exam. Um, so they deactivate their account temporarily, but then want the ability to turn it back on when they're ready. You can also delete your account, which is wiping everything. And if you so, do that, then you can't get it back. You can't get it back. It's gone from your archives. Yes. But is it ever really gone? From our systems, it from, is. From the cloud or wherever it, wherever it is. I mean, it always seems to be able to reappear in investigations and other things. Not necessarily Facebook, but other emails uh, and, and other things of that nature. Um, what about the information going from the past? The information that's already been uh, in the Cam uh, Cambridge Analytica case. You can't really go back and redo that. So I'm going to assume that what we've been talking with and the improvements that you're making now at Facebook are from this point forward. Is that a correct assumption? Senator, I actually do think we can go back in some cases. And that's why one of the things that I announced is that we're going to be investigating every single app that had access to a large amount of information before we locked down the platform in 2014. And if we find any pattern of suspicious activity, then we're going to go do a full audit of their systems. And if we find that anyone's improperly using data, then we'll take action to make sure that they delete the data and we'll inform everyone who, um, who may have had their data misused. Okay, the now, other, I, other suggestion I would make, because we're kind of running out of time here, is you've heard more than a few uh, complaints, and I joined the chorus, of the, the lapse in the time of when you discovered and when you became transparent, and I understand you sent out two messages just today to, to users. So um, I would say you say you regret that decision, that you wish you'd been more tra transparent at the time. So I would imagine if in the course of your investigation you find more um, breaches, so to speak, that you will be reinforming your Facebook uh, uh, customers. 
Yes, that is correct. We have already committed that if we find any improper use, we will inform everyone affected. Okay, thank you. You've said also that um, you want to have an active view on uh, controlling your ecosystem. Uh, last week, the FDA uh, Commissioner Scott Gottlieb addressed a drug summit in Atlanta and spoke on the national opioid epidemic. My state, I'm from West Virginia, and thank you for visiting. And next time you visit, if you would please bring some fiber because we don't have connectivity uh, in, in our rural areas like we really need, and Facebook could really help us with that. So, so Commissioner Gottlieb called up, uh, called upon social media and internet service providers, and he mentioned Facebook when he talked about it to um, try to disrupt the sale, the sale of illegal drugs and particularly powerful opioid fentanyl, which has been advertised and sold online. I know you have policies against this. The uh, commissioner is announcing his intention to convene a meeting of chief executives and senior leaders, and I want to know, can I get a commitment from you today that Facebook will commit to having a representative with Commissioner Gottlieb to finalize with this meeting? Senator, that sounds like an important initiative, and we will send someone. Okay, and let me also say that on your point about connectivity, we do have a, a group at Facebook that is working on trying to spread Internet connectivity in rural areas, and we would be happy to follow up with you on that as well. That's something that I'm very passionate about. That's good. That's good news. Last question I have just on the advertising. If somebody advertises on Facebook and somebody purchases something, does Facebook get a uh, percentage or any kind of um, a fee associated with a successful purchase from an advertiser? Senator, no. The way that the system works is people, advertisers bid uh, how much it's worth it to them to show an ad or when an action happens. So um, it's not that we would get a percent of the sale, but uh, let's, let's just use an example. So let's say you have, you're an app developer and you, your goal is you want to get more people to install your app. You could bid in the ad system and say, I will pay $3 anytime someone installs this app. And then we basically calculate on, on our side um, which ads are going to be relevant for people. And we have an incentive to show people ads that are going to be relevant because we only get paid when it delivers a business result. And, um, and, and that's, that's how the system works. So it, it could be one of, you could be paid for the advertise. I mean, for the sale. So we, we get paid when the action that the advertiser wants to, to happen uh, happens. All right. Thank you. Sen Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Mr. Zuckerberg, thank you been a long afternoon, and I, I appreciate you being here and, and taking the time with every single one of us. Um, I, I'm going to echo a lot of what I've heard my colleagues say today as well. Um, appreciate you being here. Appreciate the apology, but stop apologizing and let's make the change. Um, I, I think it's time to really change the conduct. I appreciate the fact that you talked about your principles um, for Facebook. Notice to users on the use of the data and that users have complete control of their data. But the skepticism that I have, and I'm hoping you can help me with this, is over the last, what, seven years, seven, 14 years, seven years, um, I haven't seen really much change in ensuring that the privacy is there and that individual users have control over their data. So, so let, me, uh, let me ask you this. Um, back in 2009, uh, you made two changes uh, to your privacy policy. Um, and in fact, prior to that, um, most users could either identify only friends or friends of friends as part of their, their privacy, correct? If they wanted to protect their data, they could identify only friends or friends of friends who could see their data. Isn't that correct? Senator, I believe that we've had the option for people to share with friends, friends of friends, a custom audience, or publicly for a long time. Okay. I don't remember exactly when we put that in place, but I believe it was before 2009. So either you can choose only friends or friends of friends to decide how you're going to share that, protect that data, correct? Those are two of the options, yes. Okay. And in 2011, when the FTC started taking a look at this, they um, were concerned that if somebody chose only friends, um, the, the individual user was under the impression they could continue to restrict sharing of data to limited audience, but that wasn't the case. And in fact, um, selecting friends only did not prevent users' information from being shared with their third-party party applications their friend used. Isn't that the case? And that's why the FTC was looking at, at uh, you and making that change, because there was concern that uh, if you had friends on your page, a third party could access that information. Isn't that correct? 
Uh, Senator, I, I don't remember the exact context that the... So let me let me help you here, because David Vladek, who was uh, spent nearly four years as director of the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Consumer Protection, uh, where he worked, uh, including on uh, the FTC's enforcement case against Facebook, basically um, identifies uh, in this article that that was the case, that not only did um, Facebook misrepresent, and that's why there were eight counts of deceptive acts and practices, the actual FTC in November's 2011 um, decree basically stated, required Facebook to give users clear and conspicuous notice and to obtain affirmative, like, jump back here, to do three things. Uh, the decree barred Facebook from making any further deceptive privacy claims, uh, uh, and it required Facebook get consumers approval before changing the way it shares their data. And most importantly, the third thing, it required Facebook to give users clear and conspicuous notice and to obtain affirmative express consent before sharing their data with third parties. That was part of the FTC consent decree, correct? Uh, Senator, that sounds right to me. Okay, so at that time, you were on notice that there were concerns about the sharing of uh, data and information, users' data, including those friends with third parties, correct? <laughs> Senator, my understanding... Well, let me ask you this. Let me do it this way. In response to the FTC consent uh, to make those changes, did you make those changes, and what did you do to ensure individuals' user data was protected and they had notice of that information and that potentially third parties would be accessing that and they had to give express consent? What did you specifically do in response to that? Senator, a number of things. One of the most important parts of the FTC consent decree that we signed was establishing a robust privacy program at the company headed by our chief privacy officer, Aaron Egan. Uh, Can you give me specifics? And, and I know, I, and, and I've heard this over and over again, and I'm running out of time, but he, here's the concern that I have. Um, it can't be a privacy policy because that's what the consent said it couldn't be. It had to be something very specific, something very simple, like you've heard from um, my colleagues, and that did not occur. Had that occurred, we wouldn't be here today talking about Cambridge Analytica. Isn't that really true? It, had you addressed those issues then, had you done an audit, had you looked at um, not only the uh, third-party applications, but their audited their associated data storage as well, you would have known that this type of data information was being shared. And that's our concern, and that's what I'm saying now. The time just to make the change. It's time to really address the privacy issue. It's time to really come and lead the country on this issue and how we can protect individual users' data and information. I know my time is running out, but I appreciate you being here, and I'm just hoping that you're committed to working with us in the future and addressing these concerns. Thank you, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for your patience uh, and testimony today. The end is near, uh, I think, one, two, three or four people. So uh, that's good news uh, to get out uh, of this hearing. Um, a couple questions for you. To clarify one of the comments made about deleting uh, accounts from Facebook, in the user agreement it says, when you delete IP content, if, if it is deleted in a manner similar to, it is deleted in a manner similar to emptying the recycle bin on a computer. However, you understand that removed content may persist in backup copies for a reasonable period of time. How, how long is that? Senator, I don't know sitting here what our current systems are on that, but the intent is to get all the content out of the system as quickly as possible. And does that mean your user data as well? It talks about IP content. Is that the same thing as your user data? It can sit in backup copies? Senator, I think that that is probably right. I, I don't, I'm not sitting here today having full knowledge of, of our current state of the systems around wiping all of the data out of backups. So I can follow up with you on that afterwards. But what I can tell you is but that all backups get wiped. That is certainly the way it's, it, it, it's supposed to work. Has there ever been a failure uh, of that? Senator, I, I don't know. It, uh, this is, if we tell people that we're going to delete their data, we, we need to do that. And you do do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. A couple of other questions. I think that gets to the heart of this expectation gap, as I call it, with, with users. Uh, Facebook, uh, as I understand it, if you're logged into Facebook with a separate browser and you log into another, uh, brow log into another uh, article, uh, open a new tab in the browser, well, you have the Facebook tab open, and that new tab has a Facebook uh, you know, tr button on it, uh, you track the article that you're reading. Is that correct? Senator, I think... I think that there, there is functionality 
like that, yes. Do you think users understand that? Senator, I think that they, that there is a reasonable, I think the answer is probably yes for the following reason. Because when we show a like button on a website, we show social context there. So it says, here are your friends who liked that. So in order to do that, we would have to... Yeah. But, if, but if you've got your Facebook browser open and you open up the article in the Denver Post and it has a Facebook button on it, you think they know, consumers, users know, that Facebook now knows what article you're reading in the Denver Post? Well, we would need to have that in order to serve up that, the, the like button and show you who your friends were who would also like that. So I, I, I think that goes to the heart of this expectation gap, because I don't think consumers, users necessarily understand that. I mean, and going through this user agreement, as others have, uh, you do need a lawyer uh, to understand it. And I hope that you can close that expectation gap by simplifying the user agreement, making sure that people understand their privacy. Has there ever been a violation outside of the, 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 the talk about Cambridge Analytica uh, about uh, the privacy settings? Has a privacy setting violation ever occurred outside of Cambridge Analytica? Um. I'm not aware that we have had systems that have So the privacy shown setting a, a consumer a user uses have always been respected. There's never been an instance where those privacy settings have been violated. That's my understanding. I mean this is the core thing that our company does is you come to Facebook, you say, Hey, I want to share this photo or I wanna understand send this message to these people. Has there ever been a we have to has there ever been a breach uh, of uh, Facebook data? A hack. <sighs> Um, there have been, I don't believe that there has been a breach of data that we are aware of. Has there ever been a hack? Yes. And, and, and have those hacks accessed user data? I don't believe so. I think we had an instance back in 2013 where someone was able to install some malware on a few employees' computers and had access to um, some of the content on their computers but I, I don't believe that they had access the user to data. Page. Never affected the user page. I do not believe so. Okay. Uh, has the government ever asked to remove a page, uh, have a page removed? Uh, Senator, I believe so. Okay. And, and has the government ever, can you get a warrant uh, to join a page, to get to be uh, on a page, pretending you're a separate user to be liked by that, to track what that person's doing? Do you need a warrant for that, or can the government just do that, the FBI, anybody? Senator, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand. You're saying to... We can, we can follow up on that because I do want to have one final question I want to ask you. Um, a couple days ago, I think Facebook talked about uh, that it would label traditional advocacy as political ads. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, if the Sierra Club was to run a climate change ad, that would be labeled political. Uh, a political ad. If the Chamber of Commerce wanted to run an, or place an ad as uh, this would be a, this would have an impact on, the, the, the climate change regulations would have an impact and to talk about that through an ad, that would be labeled as political, which is different than, uh, than current standards of what is political, what is issue advocacy. Um, is it your intent to, to label things political that would be in contradiction to federal law? Senator, the, the intent of what we're trying to get at is the foreign election interference that we've seen has taken more the form of issue ads than direct political electioneering advertising. So because of that, we think it's very important to extend the verification and transparency to issue ads uh, in order to block the kind of um, interference that the Russians attempted to do uh, and, and I think will likely continue to attempt to do. That's why I think that those measures are, are important to do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Garner. Uh, Senator Tesker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for being here today, uh, uh, Mark. I uh, appreciate you coming in. I hope this isn't the last time we see you in front of committee. I know this is we're approaching five hours, so it's uh, been a little tenuous. Some mental gymnastics for all of us, and I just want to thank you for for being here. Facebook is an American company, and with that I believe you've got a responsibility to protect American liberties central to our privacy. Facebook allowed a foreign company to steal private information. They allowed a foreign company to steal private information from tens of millions of Americans, largely without any knowledge of their own. Who and how we choose to share our opinions is a question of personal freedom. 
who we share our likes and dislikes with is a question of personal freedom. Uh, this is a troubling ep uh, episode that uh, completely shatters that liberty so that you understand the magnitude of this. Montanans uh, deeply concerned, they are deeply concerned with this breach of privacy and trust. So you've been at this for nearly five hours today. So besides taking reactive steps, and I want you to be as concise as you possibly can, what are you doing to make sure what Cambridge Analytica did never happens again? Thank you, Senator. There are three important steps that we're taking here. For Cambridge Analytica, first of all, we need to finish resolving this by doing a full audit of their systems to make sure that they delete all the data that, that they have and so we can fully understand what happened. There are two sets of steps that we're taking to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The most important is restricting the amount of access to information that developers will have going forward. The good news here is that back in 2014, we actually had already made a large change to restrict access on the platform that would have prevented this issue with Cambridge Analytica from happening again today. Clearly, we did not do that soon enough. Uh, if we'd done it a couple of years earlier, then we probably wouldn't be sitting here today. But this isn't a change that we had to take now in 2018. It's uh, largely a change that we made back in 2014. Okay. There are other parts of the platform that we also similarly can lock down now to make sure that other issues that might have been exploited in, in the future um, won't be able to. And we've taken a number of those steps, and I've outlined those in, in my written statement as well. I appreciate that, and you feel confident that the actions you've taken thus far, whether it was ones back in 2014, or the one that you just talked about, about locking down the other parts, will uh, adequately protect the folks who use Facebook? Senator, I believe so, okay. although security is never a solved problem. So all I need. You talked about a full audit of, the, of Cambridge Analytica systems. Can you do a full audit if that information is stored somewhere, uh, some other country? Senator, if right now uh, we're waiting on the audit because the UK government is doing a government investigation of them, okay, but and I do believe that the government will have the ability to get into the systems even if we can't. If information what, is stored in the UK, but what if it's stored in some other country? What if the information is stored in some other country? Can, is, is an audit even possible? Well, Senator, we believe a bunch of the information that we, that we will be able to audit. Um, I, I think you raise an important question, and if we have issues, then we, if we are not able to do an audit to our satisfaction, we are going to take legal action to enable us to do that. And if, and, and also I know that the UK and US governments are also involved in working on this yeah, as well. I don't, I don't really, I'm telling you, I, I have faith in the US government. I, I really actually have faith in the UK too. I, uh, there have been claims that this information is being stored in Russia. I don't care. It could be stored anywhere in the world. I don't know how you get access to the, that information. I'm not as smart as you are about tech information. And so the question really becomes, and, and i got to move on, but the question is, it, it, I don't see how you can perform a full audit if they've got stuff stored somewhere else that we can't get access to. That's all. Maybe you have other ideas on how to do that. Well, I think we'll know once we get in there whether we feel like we can fully investigate everything. Just real quickly, uh, Senator Schatz asked a question earlier about, uh, about data and who owns the data. I want to dig into it a little bit more. You said and I think multiple times during this hearing that I own the data on Facebook if it's my data. Yes. And, and I'm going to tell you that I think that that sounds really good to me. But in practice, let's think about this for a second. You're making about 50, 40 billion bucks a year on the data. I'm not making any money on it. It feels like you own the data. And in fact, I would say that the the data that was um, uh, that was breached through Cambridge Analytica, which impacted, and correct me if these numbers are wrong, some 80 million Americans, my guess is that few, if any, knew that that information was being breached. If I own that data, I know it's being breached. So could, could you give me some sort of idea on how you can really honestly say it's, it's my data when, quite frankly, uh, they may have goods on me. I don't I don't want them to have any information on me. Senator, when I if say I it's... I own it, I can stop it. Yes. So, Senator, when I say it's your data, 
what we mean is that you have control over how it's used on Facebook. You clearly need to give Facebook a license to use it within our system, yeah. or else, uh, or else the service doesn't work. Yeah, I, I know. And this license has brought been brought up many times a day, and I'm going to be quiet in just one second, Mr. Chairman. But the fact is, is the license is very thick, maybe intentionally so, so people get tired of reading it and don't want to. Look, Mark, I appreciate you being here. I look forward to having it at another hearing. Thank you, Senator Young. Mr. Zuckerberg, thanks so much for being here and, and uh, enduring uh, the many questions today. I think it's important you're here because uh, social, your social media platform happens to be the ubiquitous social media platform, and uh, there's not a senator that uh, you heard from today that isn't on Facebook, that doesn't communicate with our constituents through Facebook. In a sense, we have to be on it. And um, so I think it's especially important uh, that you're here, not just for Facebook, but uh, really for our country and, and uh, beyond. The threshold question that, that continues to emerge here today is uh, what are the reasonable expectations of privacy that uh, users ought to have? And uh, I'll tell you, my neighbors are unsatisfied by an answer to that question that involves, uh, you know, take a look at the user agreement. And um, I, I, I think there's been a fair amount of discussion here about whether or not people actually read that user agreement. I would encourage you to, uh, uh, you know, survey that, get all the information you can with respect to that, and uh, make sure that uh, uh, make sure that user agreement is is easy to understand and streamlined and, and so forth. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, earlier in today's hearing, uh, you drew a distinction that I thought was um, interesting. It caught my attention. It was a distinction between consumer expectation of privacy, depending upon whether they were on an ISP, or the pipes of the Internet, as you characterized it, or on an edge platform like Facebook. I find this distinction uh, somewhat unsatisfying because uh, most folks who use the internet uh, just think of it as one place, if you will. Uh, they think of it as the internet as opposed to uh, various places requiring uh, different degrees of privacy. Um, could, you, could you speak to this issue and indicate whether you'd support a comprehensive privacy policy that applies in the same manner uh, to all entities across the entire net internet ecosystem? Senator, sure. I think that people's expectations of how they use these different systems are different. Some thing, some apps are very lightweight, and as are, and, and you can fully encrypt the data going across them in a way that the app developer or the the pipes in the ISP case um, you probably shouldn't be able to see any of the content, and I, I think. You, you probably should have a full expectation that no one is going to be introspecting or looking at that content. Give me Other some quick services. examples, if you would, kindly, sir. Sure. Well, when data is going over the Verizon network, I think it would be good for that to be as encrypted as possible and s such that Verizon um, wouldn't look at it. Right? I think that that's what people expect, and I don't know that being able to look at the data is required to, uh, to deliver their service. That's how WhatsApp works, too. So that's an app. Um, it's a very lightweight app. It doesn't require us to know a lot of information about you. Uh, so we can offer that with full encryption, and, and therefore we're not looking, we, we don't see the content. For a service like Facebook or Instagram, where you're sharing photos and then they, people want to access them from lots of different places, people kind of want to store that in a central place so that way they can go access it from, from lots of different devices. In order to do that, uh, we need to have an understanding of what that content is. So I think the, uh, the expectations of, of what Facebook will have knowledge of versus what an ISP will have knowledge of are just different. I think that needs to be clearly communicated uh, to your users, and, and uh, uh, we'll leave it at that, that those, those uh, different uh, levels of privacy that uh, the user um, can ex expect to enjoy when they're on your platform. I'd like to uh, sort of take a different tack to Internet <coughs> privacy policy with you, sir. Um, might we create stronger privacy rights for consumers, either through creating a stronger general property right regime online, uh, say a new law that states unequivocally, something that you said before, that users own their online data, uh, or through stronger affirmative opt-in requirements on platforms like yours. Now, if we were to do that, would you need to retool your model? 
if we were to adopt one of those two approaches. Senator, can you repeat what, what the approaches are again? Yeah, so one is to uh, create a stronger uh, property right uh, for the individual online through a law that states unequivocally users okay. own their data. The other one is a stronger affirmative opt-in requirement uh, to be a user on Facebook. Would you have to fundamentally change the Facebook architecture to accommodate those policies? Senator, those policies and the principles that you articulated are generally how we view our service already. So depending on the details of what, what you, your, the proposal actually ends up being and the details do just matter a huge amount here, um, it's not clear that it would be a fundamental shift. But the details really matter, and if this is something you're considering or working on, uh, we would love to follow up with you on this because this is very important to get right. I'd love to work with you. Um, I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Thune has a closing comment. And, <laughs> yeah, and just a, and I have a process uh, statement for everybody to listen to. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and uh, and thanks to all of our members for their patience. Uh, been a long hearing, particularly long hearing for you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Thank you for for uh, sitting through this, but I think this is important. Uh, I do have a letter here from the Motion Picture Association of America that I want to get uh, into the record uh, without objection. Without objection, so ordered. And then, and just a quick quick sort of uh, wrap-up question, if you will, and maybe one quick comment. But you've answered several questions uh, about today about efforts to keep bad actors, whether that's a terrorist group to a malicious foreign agent, uh, off of your platform. You've also heard concerns about bias at Facebook, particularly bias against conservatives. And I just was a, as a final question, can you assure us that when you are improving tools to stop bad actors, that you will err on the side of protecting speech, especially political speech, from all different corners? Senator, yes, that's our, that's our approach. Uh, if there is an imminent threat of harm, we're going to take a conservative position on that and make sure that we flag that and understand that more broadly. But overall, I want to make sure that we provide people with the most voice possible. I want the widest possible expression, and I don't want anyone at our company to make any decisions based on the, the uh, political ideology of the content. Okay. And just one final observation, uh, Chairman Grassley. I, the, the, Mr. Zuckerberg has answered a lot of questions today, um, but there are also a lot of promises to follow up with some of our members. And um, sometimes on questions about Facebook practices that seem fairly straightforward, but I don't think we have. I think it's going to be hard for us to fashion solutions to, to solve some of this stuff uh, until we have some of those answers. And you had indicated earlier that you're continuing to try and find out who among these other um, analytics companies uh, may have had access to user data that uh, that they were able to use. And hopefully as you get those answers, you will be able to forward those to uh, to us. And uh, it'll help shape our thinking in terms of how, where we go from here. So, but overall, I think a very uh, informative hearing, yeah. and Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm ready to wrap it up. Yeah, I probably wouldn't make this comment, but your response to him in regard to political speech, uh, I won't identify the CEO I had a conversation with yesterday, but uh, one of our platforms, and he ad admitted to being uh, more left than right, or I mean being left, I guess, is what he admitted, and I don't know, I don't, I'm not asking you what you are, but it. Uh, but just so you understand that uh, that probably as liberals have a lot of concerns about uh, you, you know the leaning of uh, of uh, Fox News or uh, conservatives have questions about the leaning of uh, of MSNBC. Let's say uh, it seems to me that when you when we get whether it's from the right or the left, so I'm speaking to you for your platform. Uh, there's a great deal of cynicism in American society about government generally. And then when there is suspicions, legitimate or not, that maybe uh, you're playing it one way unfairly towards the other, it seems to me that everything you can do to lean over backwards to make sure that you are fair in protecting political speech, right or left, that you ought to do it. And I'm not telling you how to do it, and I'm not saying you, you don't do it, but uh, we've... 
we got to do something to reduce this cynicism. Um, at my town meetings in Iowa, I always get this question. How come you guys in D.C. can't get along? You know, meaning Republicans and Democrats. Well, I try to explain to them that they kind of get a uh, obtuse, uh, 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 what would you say, review of what goes on here because controversy makes news. So if people are getting along, you never hear about that. So they get a distorted view of it. And, uh, and, and really, we uh, congressmen get along more than the public thinks. But uh, the, uh, these attitudes of the public, we got to change. And people of your position and your influence, you can do a lot to change this. Whether I, I know you got plenty of time to run your corporation, through your corporation or privately, anything you can do to reduce this cynicism, because we have uh, a perfect constitution. Maybe it's not perfect, but we got a very good constitution, the longest one uh, written constitution in the history of, of ma mankind. And but if people don't have faith in the institutions of government, and then it's uh, it's our responsibility to enhance that faith so they have less cynicism in us. You know, we don't have a very strong democracy just because we got a good constitution. So I hope that everybody will do whatever they can to help enhance respect for government, including speaking to myself, I got to bend over backwards to do what I can uh, so they don't, so I don't add to that cynicism. So, sorry you had to listen to me. Uh, and uh, so this concludes today's hearing. Thanks to all the witnesses for attending. The record will be open for 14 days for the members to submit additional written questions and for the witness, Mr. Zuckerberg, to make any corrections to his testimony. The hearing is adjourned. And that wraps up Mark Zuckerberg's testimony before members of the Senate. A long day ending nearly five hours after it started this afternoon. But it's not over yet. Mark Zuckerberg will be back on Capitol Hill tomorrow, appearing before the House Energy and Commerce Committee. That's at 10 a.m. tomorrow. And we'll be back as well live starting at 945. You can catch us on YouTube at WashingtonPost.com and also on Twitch. We'll bring you live coverage. Let's go to Capitol Hill where our colleague Jordan Frazier has been stationed right outside the hearing room and able to talk to senators as they come and go. Jordan, what are your final thoughts tonight? <coughs> Yeah. Hey, Libby, just a couple of final thoughts from just outside the hearing room here. We talked to probably about half of the senators who uh, who grilled Mark Zuckerberg today, and there was one overarching theme uh, with about the 20 or so senators that we spoke to. No one was satisfied. They each had a varying degree of how dissatisfied they were or where his testimony lacked. No one came out and said, I heard exactly what I wanted to hear. I feel confident about this. Let's move forward. That was not, that was not the case. The second thing every senator said to me as they left as they left the hearing was they wanted more time so it's clear that this is not over this is just the beginning we will see more of this we will probably see this with twitter and google the senators have a lot of questions left and uh this is not the end of facebook on capitol hill that's for sure libby thanks so much jordan frazier reporting live from capitol hill really only one senator gave facebook and mark zuckerberg uh, a praising moment um we did see tom tillis say basically you can set your privacy settings as you can and you know if, it, if there was too much regulation you never would have created this in your dorm room all those years ago but besides that quite critical and a lot of concerns what are your thoughts Karen? yeah I mean this is mostly I think it was a learning experience for a lot of the senators on that bench and I think that this is kind of going to be a, a moment for them to reflect on in a way as well to figure out how to actually approach these tech companies in a more concrete more substantive fashion going forward because they're not done with Facebook they're not done they haven't even had a moment like this with the the chief execs of uh, Google and Twitter and and other other companies as well that they want to address I, I think that um, they're going to be hearing back from a lot of people about what they did know didn't know and how they approach this and they're going to have to kind of fine-tune that to be able to figure out where they go at all from this in a way that's what everybody keeps saying I mean Lindsey Graham put out a statement in that last hour that we were listening saying I learned a lot of things I don't think that the approach is to do this in a everybody look out for themselves sort of a way, but I'm not exactly sure yet about what I want to do legislatively. And that is the big gaping question, and they didn't get any close to, closer to answering that today, this afternoon and evening, but I think that they at least will learn from how they engaged with Zuckerberg, how at least to go forward and probably be talking with their staffs a lot about making the next um, sessions like this a little bit more focused, a bit more 
productive. Picture. And there were a lot of criticisms online about the lack of knowledge some senators had when they were trying to question Zuckerberg. And we can say, well, they may not be familiar with the technology, but it is their responsibility, Jeffrey, as members of the Senate who get this unique opportunity to hold him accountable to be prepared. That's true. For me, the standout moment of today was when Senator Kennedy said, your user agreement sucks. <laughs> uh, not only was it funny, but it cut to the truth of what we learned today about Facebook. Um, it's that there is a wide gulf between uh, the world that Facebook uh, thinks we live in and the world we actually live in with this product and what we understand about its product. And Facebook, uh, he owned up to spending all this energy to studying um, every little aspect of making the ad experience better. But when he was asked, how many people actually read those privacy policies? He's like, oh, I don't know. We don't look into that. He put no effort into trying to actually make us, make, make his customers, or we're not his customers, make his product, that's who we are, um, understand what was happening with our data. And that, that was just the wide goal. So while that was happening, though, on the flip side, today, Facebook stock market um, went up enough, the equivalent of one Twitter. <laughs> that's incredible. That's incredible. And, and the rise started even before Mark Zuckerberg took sure. the hot seat, so to speak. So anticipation of this and even just appearing before the Senate committee seemed to boost uh, share prices. So we are once again uh, left with this dichotomy of we have this, this, this increasingly difficult image of what is Facebook? How do we reconcile that? And like uh, the, the market saying... Give us more data. Right, exactly. And in a way, this is a—it's a, kind of a win, I think, for Zuckerberg. Really, I mean, he—he he, everybody was assuming he was going to, you know, be nervous and jittery. And granted, he could have laughed at a few more senators' jokes, but he was fairly on his game today. He managed to manipulate or control the the, the conversation when he had the language that was accurate and you know the the the, the knowledge that a lot of senators did not have. And the truth is, going forward, I, I didn't see in this particular setup a, an inimical type of relationship. I really did not see senators really hating. Him. Him, even if they were very, very critical and had a lot of complaints to make. And so he's probably, as a result of this, going to be part of the conversation going forward about what changes they make. And that means he'll have a lot of control over that as well, because when push comes to shove, Congress has not been able to pass a law that really is slapping and throwing the government years, and I, I know there's more happening now with all the Russia probe intrigue and, and the election meddling and everything else like that, but it doesn't make that any easier, as we were saying before. So you might see a bit of a partnership coming out of this in the end. Karin Demergen, congressional reporter covering national security. Thank you so much for being with us. Also, Jeffrey Fowler, our technology columnist, all the way here from Silicon Valley. Great to get your perspective. We will be back tomorrow starting at 9.45 a.m. You can catch us on WashingtonPost.com on our homepage. You can also catch us on YouTube and on Twitch, and we'll bring you that hearing before the House Energy and Commerce Committee live and uninterrupted. I'm Libby Casey. Thank you so much for watching.